Book Two, A Rabble in Arms. Fourteen. So a wave of patriotism swept over our new nation and unified it. Isn't that what history say? Oh, brother. My dinkum word, preparing a revolution isn't as much who who as having won it. Here we were in control too soon, nothing ready, and a thousand things to do. Authority in Luna was gone, but lunar authority Earthside and federated nations behind it were very much alive. Had they landed one troop ship, orbited one cruiser, any time next week or two, could have taken Luna back cheap. We were a mob. New catapult had been tested, but canned rock missiles ready to go you could count on fingers of one hand, my left hand. Nor was catapult a weapon that could be used against ships, nor against troops. We had notions for fighting off ships, at the moment were just notions. We had a few hundred cheap laser guns stockpiled in Hong Kong Luna. Chinese engineers are smart, but few men trained to use them. Moreover, authority had useful functions, bought ice and grain, sold air and water and power, held ownership or control at a dozen key points. No matter what was done in future, wheels had to turn. Perhaps wrecking city officers of authority had been hasty, I thought so, as records were destroyed. However, Prof maintained that loonies, all loonies, needed a symbol to hate and destroy, and those officers were least valuable and most public. But Mike controlled communications, and that meant control of most everything. Profit started with control of news to and from Earthside, leaving to Mike censorship and faking of news until we could get around to what to tell Terra, and had added subphase M, which cut off complex from rest of Luna, and with it Richardson Observatory and Associated Laboratories, Pierce Radioscope, Selena Physical Station, and so forth. These were a problem, as Terran scientists were always coming and going and staying as long as six months, stretching time by centrifuge. Most Terrans in Luna, save for a handful of tourists, 34, were scientists. Something had to be done about these Terrans, but meanwhile keeping them from talking to Terra was enough. For time being, Complex was cut off by phone, and Mike did not permit capsules to stop at any station in Complex, even after travel was resumed which it was as soon as Finn Nielsen and squad were through with dirty work. Turned out Warden was not dead, nor had we planned to kill him. Prof figured that a live Warden could always be made dead, whereas a dead one could not be made live if we needed him. So plan was to half kill him, make sure he and his guards could put up no fight, then break in fast while Mike restored oxygen. With fans turning at top speed, Mike computed it would take four minutes, and a bit, to reduce oxygen to effective zero. So, five minutes of increasing hypoxia, five minutes of anoxia, then force lower lock while Mike shot in pure oxygen to restore balance. This should not kill anyone, but would knock out a person as thoroughly as anesthesia. Hazard to attackers would come from some or all of those inside having pea suits. But even that might not matter. Hypoxia is sneaky. You can pass out without realizing you are short on oxygen. Is New Chum's favorite fatal mistake. So Warden lived through it, and three of his women. But Warden, though he lived, was no use. Brain had been oxygen-starved too long. A vegetable. No guard recovered, even though younger than he. Would appear anoxia broke necks. In rest of complex, nobody was hurt. Once lights were on and oxygen restored, they were okay, including six rapist murderers under lock and barracks. Finn decided that shooting was too good for them, so he went judge and used his squad as jury. They were stripped, hamstrung at ankles and wrists, turned over to women in complex. Makes me sick to think about what happened next, but don't suppose they lived through as long an ordeal as Marie Lyons endured. Women are amazing creatures, sweet, soft, gentle, and far more savage than we are. Let me mention those think spies out of order. Wyo had been fiercely ready to eliminate them, but when we got around to them, she had lost stomach. I expected Prof to agree, but he shook head. No, dear Wyo, much as I deplore violence, there are only two things to do with an enemy. Kill him 
or make a friend of him. Anything in between piles up trouble for the future. A man who thinks on his friends once will do it again, and we have a long period ahead in which a think can be dangerous. They must go. And publicly, to cause others to be thoughtful. Wyo said, Professor, you once said that if you condemned a man, you would eliminate him personally. Is that what you are going to do? Yes, dear lady, and no. Their blood shall be on my hands. I accept responsibility. But I have in mind a way more likely to discourage other finks. So, Adam Cellini announced that these persons had been employed by Juan Alvarez, late security chief for former authority, as undercover spies, and gave names and addresses. Adam did not suggest that anything be done. One man remained on Dodge for seven months by changing Warrens and name. Then early in 77, his body was found outside Nobilen's lock. But most of them lasted no more than hours. During first hours after coup d'etat, we were faced with a problem we had never managed to plan. Adam Cellini himself. Who is Adam Cellini? Where is he? This is his revolution. He handled every detail. Every comrade knows his voice. We're out and open now, so where is Adam? We batted it around much of that night in room L of Rathals, argued it between decisions on a hundred things that came up and people wanted to know what to do, while Adam, through other voices, handled other decisions that did not require talk, composed phony news to send Earthside, kept complex isolated, many things. It is no possible doubt. Without Mike, we could not have taken Luna, nor held it. My notion was that Prof should become Adam. Prof was always our planner and theoretician. Everybody knew him. Some key comrades knew that he was Comrade Bill, and all others knew and respected Professor Bernardo de La Paz. My word, he had taught half of leading citizens in Luna City, many from other Warrens, was known to every VIP in Luna. No, said Prof. Why not? asked Wyo. Prof, you're opted. Tell him, Mike. Comment reserved, said Mike. I want to hear what Prof has to say. I say you've analyzed it, Mike, Prof answered. Why, oh, dearest comrade, I would not refuse were it possible. But there is no way to make my voice match that of Adam. And every comrade knows Adam by his voice. Mike made it memorable for that very purpose. We then considered whether Prof could be slipped in anyhow, showing him only on video and letting Mike reshape whatever Prof said into voice expected from Adam. Was turned down. Too many people knew Prof. I had heard him speak. His voice and way of speaking could not be reconciled with Adam. Then they considered same possibility for me. My voice and Mike's were baritone, and not too many people knew what I sounded like over phone, and none over video. I tromped on it. People were going to be surprised enough to find me one of our chairman's lieutenants. They would never believe I was number one. I said, let's combine deals. Adam has been a mystery all along. Keep him that way. He'll be seen only over video, in a mask. Prof, you supply body. Mike, you supply voice. Prof shook head. I can think of no surer way to destroy confidence in our most critical period than by having a leader who wears a mask. No, Manny. We talked about finding an actor to play it. We're no professional actors in Luna then, but we're good amateurs in Luna Civic Players and in Novi Bolshoi Theater Associates. No, said Prof. Aside from finding an actor of requisite character, one who would not decide to be Napoleon, we can't wait. Adam must start handling things not later than tomorrow morning. In that case... I said, you've answered it. Have to use Mike and never put him on video, radio only. Have to figure excuse, but Adam must never be seen. I'm forced to agree, said Prof. Man, my oldest friend, said Mike, why do you say that I can't be seen? Haven't you listened? I said, Mike, we have to show a face and body on video. You have a body, but it's several tons of metal. A face you don't have. Lucky you don't have to shave. But what's to keep me from showing a face, man? 
I'm showing a voice this instant, but there's no sound behind it. I can show a face the same way. I was so taken aback I didn't answer. I stared at video screen installed when we leased that room. A pulse is a pulse is a pulse. Electrons chasing each other. To Mike, whole world was variable series of electrical pulses sent or received or chasing around his innards. I said, no, Mike, why not, man? Because you can't. Voice you handle beautifully involves only a few thousand decisions a second, a slow crawl to you, but to build up video picture would require, uh, say, ten million decisions every second. Mike, you're so fast I can't even think about it, but you aren't that fast. Mike said softly, Want to bet, man? Wyo said indignantly, Of course Mike can, if he says he can. Manny, you shouldn't talk that way. Wyo thinks an electron is something about size and shape of a small pea. Mike, I said slowly, I won't put money on it. Okay, want to try? Shall I switch on video? I can switch it on, he answered. Sure you'll get right one? Wouldn't do to have this show somewhere else. He answered testily, I'm not stupid. Now let me be man, for I admit this is going to take just about all I've got. We waited in silence. Then screen showed a neutral gray with a hint of scan lines. Went black again, then a faint light filled middle and congealed into cloudy areas, light and dark. Ellipsoid, not a face but suggestion of face that one sees in cloud patterns covering terror. It cleared a little, and reminded me of pictures alleged to be ectoplasm, a ghost of a face. Suddenly firmed, and we saw Adam Cellini. Was a still picture of a mature man, no background, just a face as if trimmed out of a print. Yet was to me Adam Cellini. Could not be anybody else. Then he smiled, moving lips and jaw, and touching tongue to lips, a quick gesture, and I was frightened. How do I look? he asked. Adam, said Wyo, your hair isn't that curly, and it should go back on each side above your forehead. You look as if you were wearing a wig, dear. Mike corrected it. Is that better? Not quite so much. And don't you have dimples? I was sure I could hear dimples when you chuckle. Like profs. Mike Adams smiled again. This time he had dimples. How should I be dressed, Wyo? Are you at your office? I'm still at office. Have to be tonight. Background turned gray, then came into focus and color. A wall calendar behind him gave date. Tuesday, 19 May, 2076. A clock showed correct time. Near his elbow was a carton of coffee. On desk was a solid picture, a family group, two men, a woman, four children. Was background noise, muted roar of old dome plaza louder than usual. I heard shouts and in distance some singing, Simon's version of Marseillaise. Off screen, Ginwala's voice said, Gospodine? Adam turned toward it. I'm busy, Albert, he said patiently. No calls from anyone but Selby. You handle everything else. He looked back at us. Well, well, suggestions? Prof? Man, my doubting friend? Will I pass? I rubbed eyes. Mike, can you cook? Certainly. But I don't. I'm married. Adam, said Wyo, how can you look so neat after the day we've had? I don't let little things worry me. He looked at Prof. Professor, if the picture is okay, let's discuss what I'll say tomorrow. I was thinking of preempting the 800 newscast, have it announced all night, and pass the word down the cells. We talked rest of night. I sent up for coffee twice, and Mike Adam had his carton renewed. When I ordered sandwiches, he asked Ginwala to send out for some. I caught a glimpse of Albert Ginwala in profile, a typical babu, polite and faintly scornful. Hadn't known what he looked like. Mike ate while we ate, sometimes mumbling around a mouthful of food. When I asked professional interest, Mike told me that after he had picture built up, he had programmed most of it for automatic and gave his attention just to facial expressions. But soon I forgot it was fake. 
Mike Adam was talking with us by video, was all. Much more convenient than by phone. By 0300, we had policy settled. Then Mike rehearsed speech. Prof found points he wanted to add. Mike made revisions. Then we decided to get some rest. Even Mike Adam was yawning. Although, in fact, Mike held fort all through night, guarding transmissions to Terra, keeping complex walled off, listening at many phones. Prof and I shared big bed, while stretched out on couch. I whistled lights out. For once, we slept without weights. While we had breakfast, Adam Cellini addressed Free Luna. He was gentle, strong, warm, and persuasive. Citizens of Free Luna, friends, comrades, to those of you who do not know me, let me introduce myself. I am Adam Cellini, chairman of the Emergency Committee of Comrades for Free Luna, now of Free Luna. We are free at last. The so-called authority which has long usurped power in this our home has been overthrown. I find myself temporary head of such government as we have, the Emergency Committee. Shortly, as quickly as can be arranged, you will opt your own government. Adam smiled and made a gesture inviting help. In the meantime, with your help, I shall do my best. We will make mistakes. Be tolerant. Comrades, if you have not revealed yourselves to friends and neighbors, it is time you did so. Citizens, requests may reach you through your comrade neighbors. I hope you will comply willingly. It will speed the day when I can bow out and life can get back to normal. A new normal, free of the authority, free of guards, free of troops stationed on us, free of passports and searches and arbitrary arrests. There has to be a transition. To all of you, please go back to work. Resume normal lives. To those who worked for the authority, the need is the same. Go back to work. Wages will go on. Your jobs stay the same. Until we can decide what is needed, what happily no longer is needed now that we are free, and what must be kept but modified. You, new citizens, transportees sweating out sentences pronounced on you earthside, you are free. Your sentences are finished. But in the meantime, I hope that you will go on working. You are not required to. The days of coercion are gone. But you are urged to. You are, of course, free to leave the complex, free to go anywhere. And capsule service to and from the complex will resume at once. But before you use your new freedom to rush into town, let me remind you. There is no such thing as a free lunch. You are better off for the time being where you are. The food may not be fancy, but will continue hot and on time. To take on temporarily those necessary functions of the defunct authority, I have asked the general manager of Lunaho Company to serve. This company will provide temporary supervision and will start analyzing how to do away with the tyrannical parts of the authority and how to transfer the useful parts to private hands. So please help them. To you, citizens of Terran nations among us, scientists and travelers and others, greetings. You are witnessing a rare event, the birth of a nation. Birth means blood and pain. There has been some. We hope it is over. You will not be inconvenienced unnecessarily, and your passage home will be arranged as soon as possible. Conversely, you are welcome to stay, still more welcome to become citizens. But for the present, I urge you to stay out of the corridors. Avoid incidents that might lead to unnecessary blood, unnecessary pain. Be patient with us, and I urge my fellow citizens to be patient with you. Scientists from Terra, at the observatory and elsewhere, go on with your work and ignore us. Then you won't even notice that we are going through the pangs of creating a new nation. One thing. I am sorry to say that we are temporarily interfering with your right to communicate with Earthside. This we do from necessity. Censorship will be lifted as quickly as possible. We hate it as much as you do. Adam added one more request. Don't try to see me, comrades, and phone me only if you must. All others write if you need to. Your letters will receive prompt attention. But I am not twins. I got no sleep last night and can't expect much tonight. I can't address meetings, can't shake hands, can't meet delegations. I must stick to this desk and work so that I can get rid of this job and turn it over to your choice. 
He grinned at them. Expect me to be as hard to see as Simon Jester. It was a fifteen-minute cast, but that was essence. Go back to work, be patient, give us time. Those scientists gave us almost no time. I should have guessed was my sort of pigeon. All communication earthside channeled through Mike, but those brain boys had enough electronic equipment to stock a warehouse. Once they decided to, it took them only hours to breadboard a rig that could reach Terra. The only thing that saved us was a fellow traveler who thought Luna should be free. He tried to phone Adam Cellini, wound up talking to one of a squad of women we had co-opted from C and D level, a system thrown together in self-defense, as despite Mike's request, half of Luna tried to phone Adam Cellini after that video cast. Everything from requests and demands to busybodies who wanted to tell Adam how to do his job. After about a hundred calls got routed to me through too much zeal by a comrade in phone company, we set up this buffer squad. Happily, comrade lady who took this call recognized that soothe them down doctrine did not apply. She phoned me. Minutes later, myself and Finn Nielsen, plus some eager guns headed by capsule for laboratory area. Our informant was scared to give name, but had told me where to find a transmitter. We caught them transmitting, and only fast action on Finn's part kept them breathing. His boys were itchy. But we did not want to make an example. Finn and I had settled that on way out. It's hard to frighten scientists. Their minds don't work that way. Have to get at them from other angles. I kicked that transmitter to pieces and ordered director to have everyone assemble in mess hall and required roll call, where a phone could hear. Then I talked to Mike, got names from him, and said to director, Doctor, you told me they were all here. We're missing so-and-so. Seven names. Get them here. Missing Terrans had been notified, had refused to stop what they were doing, typical scientists. Then I talked. Loonies on one side of room, Terrans on other. To Terrans I said, We tried to treat you as guests, but three of you tried and perhaps succeeded in sending message Earthside. I turned to Director. Doctor, I could search. Warren, surface structures, all labs, every space, and destroy everything that might be used for transmitter. I'm an electron pusher by trade. I know what wide variety of components can be converted into transmitters. Suppose I destroy everything that might be useful for that, and, being stupid, take no chance and smash anything I don't understand. What result? You would have thought I was about to kill his baby. He turned gray. That would stop every research. Destroy priceless data. Waste, oh, I don't know how much. Call it a half billion dollars. So I thought. Could take all that gear instead of smashing and let you go on best you can. That would be almost as bad. You must understand, Gospodine, that when an experiment is interrupted... I know. Easier than moving anything, and maybe missing some, is to take you all to complex and quarter you there. We have what used to be Dragoon Barracks, but that too would ruin experiments. Besides... Where are you from, Doctor? Princeton, New Jersey. So, you've been here five months and no doubt exercising and wearing weights. Doctor, if we did that, you might never see Princeton again. If we move you, we'll keep you locked up. You'll get soft. If emergency goes on very long, you'll be a loony like it or not, and all your brainy help with you. A cocky chum stepped forward, one who had to be sent for twice. You can't do this. It's against the law. What law, Gospodine? Some law back in your hometown? I turned. Finn, show him law. Finn stepped forward and placed emission bell of gun at man's belly button. Thumb started to press down. Safety switched, I could see. I said, don't kill him, Finn. Then went on. I will eliminate this man if that's what it takes to convince you. So watch each other. One more offense will kill all your chances of seeing home again, as well as ruining researchers. Doctor, I warn you to find ways to keep check on your staff. I turned to Looney's. Tavares G, keep them honest. Work up on guard system. Don't take nonsense. Every earthworm is on probation. If you have to eliminate some, don't hesitate. I turned to Director. Doctor, any loony can go anywhere, anytime, even your bedroom. 
Your assistants are now your bosses, so far as security is concerned. If a loony decides to follow you or anybody into a WC, don't argue. He might be jumpy. I turned to loonies. Security first. You each work for some earthworm. Watch him. Split it among you and don't miss anything. Watch them so close they can't build a mousetrap, much less transmitter. If interferes with work for them, don't worry, wages will go on. Could see grins. Lab assistant was best job a loony could find those days, but they worked under earthworms who looked down on us, even ones who pretended and were oh so gracious. I let it go at that. When I had been phoned, I had intended to eliminate offenders. But Prof and Mike set me straight. Plan did not permit violence against Terrans that could be avoided. We set up ears, wide-band sensitive receivers, around lab area, since even most directional rigs spills a little in the neighborhood, and Mike listened on all phones in area. After that, we chewed nails and hoped. Presently, we relaxed, as news up from Earthside showed nothing. They seemed to accept censored transmissions without suspicion, and private and commercial traffic and authorities' transmissions all seemed routine. Meanwhile, we worked, trying in days what should take months. We received one break in timing. No passenger ship was on Luna, and none was due until 7 July. We could have coped, suckered a ship's officers to dine with Warden or something, then mounted guard on its senders or dismantled them. Could not have lifted without our help. In those days, one drain on ice was providing water for reaction mass. Was not much drain compared with grain shipments. One manned ship a month was heavy traffic then, while grain lifted every day. What it did mean was that an incoming ship was not an insuperable hazard. Nevertheless, was lucky break. We were trying so hard to make everything look normal until we could defend ourselves. Grain shipments went on as before. One was catapulted almost as Finn's men were breaking into Warden's residence. And next went out on time, and all others. Neither oversight nor faking for interim, Prof knew what he was doing. Grain shipments were a big operation for a little country like Luna, and couldn't be changed in one semi-lunar. Bread and beer of too many people was involved. If our committee had ordered embargo and quit buying grain, we would have been chucked out, and a new committee with other ideas would have taken over. Prof said that an educational period was necessary. Meanwhile, grain barges catapulted as usual. Luna Hoko kept books and issued receipts using civil service personnel. Dispatches went out in Warden's name, and Mike talked to authority Earthside using Warden's voice. Deputy Administrator proved reasonable, once he understood it upped his life expectancy. Chief Engineer stayed on job, too. McIntyre was a real loony, given chance, rather than Fink by nature. Other department heads and minor stooges were no problem. Life went on as before, and we were too busy to unwind authority system and put useful parts up for sale. Over a dozen people turned up claiming to be Simon Jester. Simon wrote a rude verse disclaiming them and had picture on front page of Lunatic, Pravda, and Gong. Wyo let herself go blonde and made trip to see Greg at New Catapult Site. Then a longer trip, ten days, to Old Home and Hong Kong Luna, taking Anna, who wanted to see it. Wyo needed a vacation, and Prof urged her to take it, pointing on that she was in touch by phone and that closer party contact was needed in Hong Kong. I took over her Stilyagi with Slim and Hazel as my lieutenants, bright sharp kids I could trust. Slim was awed to discover that I was Comrade Bork and saw Adam Cellini every day. His party name started with G. Made a good team for other reasons, too. Hazel suddenly started showing cushiony curves, and not all from Mimi's superb table. She had reached that point in her orbit. Slim was ready to change her name to Stone any time she was willing to opt. In the meantime, he was anxious to do party work he could share with our fierce little redhead. Not everybody was willing. Many comrades turned out to be talk-talk soldiers. Still more thought war was over once we had eliminated peace goons and captured Warden. Others were indignant to learn how far down they were in party structure. They wanted to elect a new structure, themselves at top. Adam received endless calls proposing this or something like it, would listen, agree, assure them that their services must not be wasted by waiting for election, and refer them to Prof or me. 
can't recall any of these ambitious people who amounted to anything when I tried to put them to work. It was endless work, and nobody wanted to do it. Well, a few. Some best volunteers were people party had never located. But in general, loonies in and out of party had no interest in patriotic work unless well paid. One chum, who claimed to be a party member, was not, spragged me in raffles where we set up headquarters and wanted me to contract for 50,000 buttons to be worn by pre-coup veterans of revolution. A small profit for him. I estimate 400% markup. Easy dollars for me. A fine thing for everybody. When I brushed him off, he threatened to denounce me to Adam Cellini, a very good friend of mine, I'll have you know, for sabotage. That was help we got. What we needed was something else, needed steel at New Catapult, and plenty. Prof asked if really necessary to put steel around rock missiles. I had to point out that an induction field won't grab a bare rock. We needed to relocate Mike's ballistic radars at old site and install Doppler radar at new site, both jobs because we could expect attacks from space at old site. We called for volunteers, got only two who could be used, and needed several hundred mechanics who did not mind hard work in peasuits. So we hired, paying what we had to. Luna Hoko went in hock to Bank of Hong Kong Luna. Was no time to steal that much, and most funds had been transferred earthside to stew. A Dinkum comrade, Fu Moses Morris, co-signed much paper to keep us going, and wound up broke and started over with a little tailoring shop in Kongville. That was later. Authority script dropped from three to one to seventeen to one after coup, and civil service people screamed as Mike was still paying in authority checks. We said they could stay on or resign. Then those we needed we rehired with Hong Kong dollars. But created a large group not on our side from then on. They longed for good old days and were ready to stab new regime. Grain farmers and brokers were unhappy because payment at Catapult Head continued to be authority script at same old fixed prices. We won't take it, they cried, and Luna Hoko man would shrug and tell them they didn't have to, but this grain still went to authority earthside, it did, and authority script was all they would get. So take check or load your grain back into roller guns and get it out of here. Most took it. All grumbled, and some threatened to get out of grain and start growing vegetables or fibers or something that brought Hong Kong dollars, and Prof smiled. We needed every drill man in Luna, especially ice miners who owned heavy-duty laser drills. As soldiers, we needed them so badly that despite being shy, one wing, and rusty, I considered joining up, even though it takes muscle to wrestle a big drill, and prosthetic just isn't muscle. Prof told me not to be a fool. Dodge we had in mind would not work well earthside. A laser beam carrying heavy power works best in vacuum, but there it works just dandy for whatever range its collimation is good for. These big drills, which had carved through rocks seeking pockets of ice, were now being mounted as artillery to repel space attacks. Both ships and missiles have electronic nervous systems and does electronic gear no good to blast it with umpteen jewels placed in a tight beam. If target is pressured, as manned ships are and most missiles, all it takes is to burn a hole, depressure it. If not pressured, a heavy laser beam can still kill it, burn eyes, lose guidance, spoil anything depending on electronics, as most everything does. An H-bomb with circuitry ruined is not a bomb, it's just a big tub of lithium deuteride that can't do anything but crash. A ship with eyes gone is a derelict, not a warship. Sounds easy, is not. Those laser drills were never meant for targets a thousand kilometers away, or even one, and was no quick way to rig their cradles for accuracy. Gunner had to have guts to hold fire until last few seconds, on a target heading at him maybe two kilometers per second. But was best we had. So we organized first and second volunteer defense gunners of Free Luna, two regiments, so that first could snub lowly second, and second could be jealous of first. First got older men, second got young and eager. Having called them volunteers, we hired in Hong Kong dollars, and it was no accident that ice was being paid for in controlled market in waste paper authority script. On top of all, we were talking up a war scare. 
Adam Cellini talked of a video, reminding that authority was certain to try to regain its tyranny, and we had only days to prepare. Papers quoted him and published stories of their own. We had made special effort to recruit newsmen before coup. People were urged to keep pea suits always near and to test pressure alarms in homes. A volunteer civil defense corps was organized in each warren. What with moonquakes always with us, each warren's pressure co-op always had sealing crews ready at any hour. Even with silicone stay soft and fiberglass, any warren leaks. In Davis tunnels, our boys did maintenance on seal every day. But now we recruited hundreds of emergency sealing crews, mostly still Yagi, drilled them with fake emergencies, had them stay in pea suits with helmets open when on duty. They did beautifully, but idiots made fun of them. Play soldiers, Adam's little apples, other names. A team was going through a drill showing they could throw a temporary lock around one that had been damaged, and one of these pinheads stood by and rode them loudly. Civil defense team went ahead, completed temporary lock, tested it with helmets closed, it held, came out, grabbed this joker, took him through into temporary lock, and on out into zero pressure. Dumped him. Belittlers kept opinions to selves after that. Prof thought we ought to send out a gentle warning not to eliminate so peremptorily. I opposed it and got my way. Could see no better way to improve breed. Certain types of loudmouthism should be a capital offense among decent people. But our biggest headaches were self-anointed statesmen. Did I say that loonies are non-political? They are, when comes to doing anything. But doubt it was ever a time two loonies over a liter of beer did not swap loud opinions about how things ought to be run. As mentioned, these self-appointed political scientists tried to grab Adam Cellini's ear. But Prof had a place for them. Each was invited to take part in Ad Hoc Congress for Organization of Free Luna, which met in Community Hall in Luna City, then resolved to stay in session until work was done, a week in El City, a week in Novilen, then Hong Kong, and start over. All sessions were in video. Prof presided over first, and Adam Cellini addressed them by video and encouraged them to do a thorough job. History is watching you. I listened to some sessions, then cornered Prof and asked what in Bog's name he was up to. Thought you didn't want any government. Have you heard those nuts since you turned them loose? He smiled most dimply smile. What's troubling you, Manuel? Many things were troubling me. With me breaking heart trying to round up heavy drills and men who could treat them as guns, these idlers had spent an entire afternoon discussing immigration. Some wanted to stop it entirely. Some wanted to tax it, high enough to finance government, when ninety-nine out of a hundred loonies had had to be dragged to the rock. Some wanted to make it selective by ethnic ratios. Wondered how they would count me. Some wanted to limit it to females until we were fifty-fifty. That had produced a Scandinavian shout, Ya, Cobber! Tell them send us whores! Thousands and thousands of whores! I marry you, my betcha! Was most sensible remark all afternoon. Another time they argued time. Sure, Greenwich time bears no relation to lunar, but why should it when we live underground? Show me a loony who can sleep two weeks and work two weeks. Lunars don't fit our metabolism. What was urged was to make a lunar exactly equal to 28 days instead of 29 days, 12 hours, 44 minutes, 2.78 seconds, and do this by making days longer, and hours, minutes, and seconds, thus making each semi-lunar exactly two weeks. Sure, lunar is necessary for many purposes. Controls when we go up on surface, why we go, and how long we stay. But aside from throwing us out of gear with our only neighbor, had that wordy vacuum skull thought what this would do to every critical figure in science and engineering? As an electronics man, I shuddered. Throw away every book, table, instrument, and start over? I know that some of my ancestors did that in switching from old English units to MKS, but they did it to make things easier. Fourteen inches to a foot and some odd number of feet to a mile, ounces and pounds, oh, bog. Made sense to change that. But why go out of your way to create confusion? Somebody wanted a committee to determine exactly what loony language is. 
than fine everybody who talked earthside English or other language. Oh, my people. I read tax proposals in Lunatic, four sorts of single taxers, a cubic tax that would penalize a man if he extended tunnels, a head tax, everybody pays same, income tax, like to see anyone figure income of Davis family or try to get information out of mum, and an air tax, which was not fees we paid then, but something else. Hadn't realized Free Luna was going to have taxes. Hadn't had any before and got along. You paid for what you got. Tanstoffel. How else? Another time some pompous chum proposed that bad breath and body odors be made an elimination offense. Could almost sympathize, having been stuck on occasion in a capsule with such stinks. But doesn't happen often and tends to be self-correcting. Chronic offenders or unfortunates who can't correct aren't likely to reproduce, seeing how choosy women are. One female, most were men, but women made up for it in silliness, had a long list she wanted made permanent laws about private matters, no more plural marriage of any sort, no divorces, no fornication. Had to look that one up. No drink stronger than 4% beer. Church services only on Saturdays, and all else to stop that day. Air and temperature and pressure engineering, lady? Phones and capsules? A long list of drugs to be prohibited, and a shorter list dispensed only by licensed physicians. What is a licensed physician? Healer I go to has a sign reading, Practical Doctor. Makes book on side, which is why I go to him. Look, lady, aren't any medical schools in Luna... Then, I mean. She even wanted to make gambling illegal. If a loony couldn't roll double or nothing, he would go to a shop that would, even if dice were loaded. The thing that got me was not her list of things she hated, since she was obviously crazy as a cyborg, but fact that always somebody agreed with her prohibitions. Must be a yearning deep in human heart to stop other people from doing as they please. Rules, laws, always for other fellow. A murky part of us, something we had before we came down out of trees and failed to shuck when we stood up, because not one of those people said, please pass this so that I won't be able to do something I know I should stop. And yet, Tovarishchi was always something they hated to see neighbors doing. Stop them for their own good, not because Speaker claimed to be harmed by it. Listening to that session, I was almost sorry we got rid of Mort the Wart. He stayed holed up with his women and didn't tell us how to run private lives. But Prof didn't get excited. He went on smiling. Manuel, do you really think that mob of retarded children can pass any laws? You told them to, urged them to. My dear Manuel, I was simply putting all my nuts in one basket. I know those nuts. I've listened to them for years. I was very careful in selecting their committees. They all have built-in confusion. They will quarrel. The chairman I forced on them, while letting them elect him, is a ditherer who could not unravel a piece of string. Thinks every subject needs more study. I almost needn't have bothered. More than six people cannot agree on anything. Three is better. And one is perfect for a job that one can do. This is why parliamentary bodies all through history, when they accomplished anything, owed it to a few strong men who dominated the rest. Never fear, son, this ad hoc Congress will do nothing. Or if they pass something through sheer fatigue, it will be so loaded with contradictions that it will have to be thrown out. In the meantime, they are out of our hair. Besides, there is something we need them for later. Thought you said they could do nothing. They won't do this. One man will write it, a dead man, and late at night, when they are very tired, they'll pass it by acclamation. Who's this dead man? You don't mean Mike? No, no. Mike is far more alive than those yammerheads. The dead man is Thomas Jefferson, first of the rational anarchists, my boy, and one who once almost managed to slip over his non-system through the most beautiful rhetoric ever written but they caught him at it, which I hope to avoid. I cannot improve on his phrasing. I shall merely adapt it to Luna and the twenty-first century. 
heard of him. Freed slaves, and yet well, one might say he tried, but failed. Never mind. How are the defenses progressing? I don't see how we can keep up the pretense past the arrival date of this next ship. Can't be ready then. Mike says we must be. We weren't, but ship never arrived. Those scientists outsmarted me and loonies I had told to watch them. Was a rig at focal point of biggest reflector, and loony assistants believed double talk about astronomical purpose, a new wrinkle in radio telescopes. I suppose it was. It was ultra microwave, and stuff was bounced at reflector by a waveguide, and thus left scope lined up nicely by mirror. Remarkably like early radar, and metal latticework and foil heat shield of barrel stopped stray radiation. Thus, ears I had staked out heard nothing. They put message across their version and in detail. First we heard was demand from authority to warden to deny this hoax, find hoaxer, or put stop to it. So instead we gave them a declaration of independence. In Congress assembled July 4th, 2076. Was beautiful. 15. Signing of Declaration of Independence went as Prof said it would. He sprang it on them at end of long day, announced a special session after dinner at which Adam Cellini would speak. Adam read aloud, discussing each sentence, then read it without stopping, making music of sonorous phrases. People wept. Wyo, seated by me, was one, and I felt like it, even though I had read it earlier. Then Adam looked at them and said, The future is waiting. Mark well what you do, and turned meeting over to Prof rather than usual chairman. Was twenty-two-hundred and fight began. Sure, they were in favor of it. News all day had been jammed with what bad boys we were, how we were to be punished, taught a lesson, so forth. Not necessary to spice it up. Stuff up from Earth's side was nasty. Mike merely left out, on other hand, opinion. If ever was a day when Luna felt unified, it was probably 2nd of July, 2076. So they were going to pass it. Prof knew that before he offered it. But not as written. Honorable Chairman, in second paragraph, that word unalienable is no such word. Should be inalienable. And anyhow, wouldn't it be more dignified to say sacred rights rather than inalienable rights? I'd like to hear discussion on this. That tune was almost sensible, merely a literary critic, which is harmless, like dead yeast left in beer. But, well, take that woman who hated everything. She was there with List, read it aloud, and moved to have it incorporated into Declaration so that the peoples of Terra will know that we are civilized and fit to take our places in the councils of mankind. Prof not only let her get away with it, he encouraged her, letting her talk when other people wanted to, then blandly put her proposal to a vote when hadn't even been seconded. Congress operated by rules they had wrangled over for days. Prof was familiar with rules, but followed them only as suited him. She was voted down in a shout and left. Then somebody stood up and said, of course that long list didn't belong in declaration, but shouldn't we have general principles? Maybe a statement that Lunar Free State guaranteed freedom, equality, and security to all? Nothing elaborate, just those fundamental principles that everybody knew was proper purpose of government. True enough, and let's pass it. But must read freedom, equality, peace, and security. Right, comrade? They wrangled over whether freedom included free air, or was that part of security. Why not be on safe side and list free air by name? Move to amend to make it free air and water, because you didn't have freedom or security unless you had both air and water. Air, water, and food. Air, water, food, and cubic. Air, water, food, cubic, and heat. No, make heat read power. And you had it all covered, everything. Carver, have you lost your mind? That's far from everything, and what you've left out is an affront to all womankind. Step outside and say that. Let me finish. We've got to tell them right from deal that we will permit no more ships to land unless they carry at least as many women as men. At least, I said, and I for one won't chop it unless it sets immigration issues straight. Prof never lost dimples. 
began to see why Prophet slept all day and was not wearing weights. Me, I was tired, having spent all day in pea suit out beyond catapult head, cutting in last of relocated ballistic radars. And everybody was tired. By midnight, crowd began to thin, convinced that nothing would be accomplished that night and bored by any yammer not their own. It was later than midnight when someone asked why this declaration was dated 4th, when today it was 2nd. Prop said mildly that it was July 3rd now, and it seemed unlikely that our declaration could be announced earlier than 4th, and that July 4th carried historical symbolism that might help. Several people walked out at announcement that probably nothing would be settled until 4th of July. But I began to notice something. Hall was filling as fast as was emptying. Finn Nielsen slid into a seat that had just been vacated. Comrade Clayton from Hong Kong showed up, pressed my shoulder, smiled at Wyo, found a seat. My youngest lieutenant, Slim and Hazel, I spotted down front, and was thinking I must alibi Hazel by telling Mum I had kept her out on party business, when was amused to see Mum herself next to them, and Sidrus, and Greg, who was supposed to be at New Catapult. Looked around and picked out a dozen more, night editor of Lunaya Pravda, general manager of Lunahoko, others, and each one a working comrade. Began to see that Prof had stacked deck. That Congress never had a fixed membership. These Dinkum comrades had as much right to show up as those who had been talking a month. Now they sat and voted down amendments. About three hundred, when I was wondering how much more I could take, someone brought a note to Prof. He read it, banged gavel, and said, Adam Cellini begs your indulgence. Do I hear unanimous consent? So screen back of Rostrum lighted up again, and Adam told them that he had been following debate and was warmed by many thoughtful and constructive criticisms. But could he make a suggestion? Why not admit that any piece of writing was imperfect? If this declaration was, in general, what they wanted, why not postpone perfection for another day and pass this as it stands? Honorable Chairman, I shall move. They passed it with a yell. Prof said, Do I hear objection? And waited with gavel raised. A man who had been talking when Adam had asked to be heard said, Well, I still say that's a dangling participle, but okay, leave it in. Prof banged gavel. So ordered. Then we filed up and put our chops on a big scroll that had been sent over from Adam's office, and I noticed Adam's chop on it. I signed right under Hazel. Child now could write, although it was still short on book learning. Her chop was shaky, but she wrote it large and proud. Comrade Clayton signed his party name, real name in letters, and Japanese chop. Three little pictures, one above another. Two comrades chopped with X's and had them witnessed. All party leaders were there that night, morning, all chopped it, and not more than a dozen yammerers stuck. But those who did put their chops down for history to read, and thereby committed their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honors. While Q was moving slowly past and people were talking, Prof banged for attention. I ask for volunteers for a dangerous mission. This declaration will go on the news channels, but must be presented in person to the Federated Nations on Terra. That put stop to noise. Prof was looking at me. I swallowed and said, I volunteer. Why, I echoed, So do I. And little Hazel Mead said, Me too. In moments were a dozen, from Finn Nielsen to Gospodine Dangling Participle. Turned out to be a good cobber, aside from his fetish. Prof took names, remembered something about getting in touch as transportation became available. I got Prof aside and said, Look, Prof, you too tired to track? You know ship for 7th was cancelled. Now they're talking about slapping embargo on us. Next ship they lift for Luna will be a warship. How are you planning to travel? As prisoner? Oh, we won't use their ships. So, going to build one? Any idea how long that takes? If could build one at all, which I doubt. Manual, Mike says it's necessary, and has it all worked out? I did know Mike said was necessary. He had rerun problems soon as we learned that bright laddies at Richardson had snuck one home. He now gave us only one chance in 53, with imperative need for Prof to go earthside. But I'm not one to worry about impossibilities. 
I had spent a day working to make that one chance in 53 turn up. Mike will provide the ship, Prof went on. He has completed its design, and it is being worked on. He has? It is? Since when is Mike engineer? Isn't he? asked Prof. I started to answer, shut up. Mike had no degrees. Simply knew more engineering than any man alive, or about Shakespeare's plays, or riddles, or history, name it. Tell me more. Manuel, we'll go to Terra as a load of grain. What? Who's we? You and myself. The other volunteers are merely decorative. I said, look, Prof, I've stuck. Worked hard when the whole thing seemed silly. Worn these weights, got them on now. On chance I might have to go to that dreadful place. But contracted to go in a ship with at least a cyborg pilot to help me get down safely, did not agree to go as meteorite. He said, very well, Manuel. I believe in free choice, always your alternate will go. My... Who? Oh, comrade Wyoming. So far as I know, she is the only other person in training for the trip, other than a few Terrans. So I went, but talked to Mike first. He said patiently, Man, my first friend, there isn't a thing to worry about. You are scheduled to load KM-187 Series 76, and you'll arrive in Bombay with no trouble. But to be sure, to reassure you, I selected that barge because it will be taken out of parking orbit and landed when India is faced toward me. And I've added an override so that I can take you away from ground control if I don't like the way they handle you. Trust me, man, it has all been thought through. Even the decision to continue shipments when security was broken was part of this plan. You might have told me. There was no need to worry you. Professor had to know, and I've kept in touch with him. But you are going simply to take care of him and back him up. Do his job if he dies, a factor on which I can give you no reassurance. I sighed. Okay. But, Mike, surely you don't think you can pilot a barge into a soft landing at this distance? Speed of light alone would trip you. Man, don't you think I understand ballistics? For the orbital position, then, from query through reply and then to command received is under four seconds, and you can rely on me not to waste microseconds. Your maximum parking orbit travel in four seconds is only 32 kilometers, diminishing asymptotically to zero at landing. My reflex time will be effectively less than that of a pilot in a manual landing because I don't waste time grasping a situation and deciding on correct action. So my maximum is four seconds. But my effective reflex time is much less, as I project and predict constantly, see ahead, program it out. In effect, I'll stay four seconds ahead of you in your trajectory and respond instantly. That steel can doesn't even have an altimeter. It does now. Man, please believe me, I've thought of everything. The only reason I've ordered this extra equipment is to reassure you. Puna ground control hasn't made a bobble in the last 5,000 loads. For a computer, it's fairly bright. Okay. Uh, Mike, how hard do they splash those bleeding barges? What G? Not high, man. Ten gravities at injection, then that programs down to a steady, soft four Gs. Then you'll be nudged again between six and five Gs just before splash. The splash itself is gentle, equal to a fall of fifty meters, and you enter ogive first with no sudden shock, less than three Gs. Then you surface and splash again lightly and simply float at one G. Man, those barge shells are built as lightly as possible for economy's sake. We can't afford to toss them around or they would split their seams. How sweet! Mike, what would six to five G's do to you? Split your seams? I conjecture that I was subjected to about six gravities when they shipped me up here. Six gravities in my present condition would shear many of my essential connections. However, I am more interested in the extremely high transient accelerations I am going to experience from shock waves when Terra starts bombing us. Data are insufficient for prediction but I may lose control of my outlying functions, man. 
This could be a major factor in any tactical situation. Mike, you really think they're going to bomb us? Count on it, man. That is why this trip is so important. Left it at that and went out to see this coffin. Should have stayed home. Ever looked at one of those silly barges? Just a steel cylinder with retro and guidance rockets and radar transponder. Resembles a spaceship way a pair of pliers resembles my number three arm. They had this one cut open and were outfitting our living quarters. No galley, no WC, no nothing. Why bother? We were going to be in it only fifty hours. Start empty so that you won't need a honey sack in your suit. Dispense with lounge and bar. You'll never be out of your suit. You'll be drugged and not caring. At least Prof would be drugged almost whole time. I had to be alert at landing to try to get us out of this death trap if something went wrong and nobody came along with a tin opener. They were building a shaped cradle in which backs of our pea suits would fit. We would be strapped into these holes and stay there, clear to Terra. They seemed more concerned about making total mass equal to displaced wheat in the same center of gravity and all moment arms adding up correctly than they did about our comfort. Engineer in charge told me that even padding to be added inside our pea suits was figured in. Was glad to learn we were going to have padding. Those holes did not look soft. Returned home in thoughtful condition. Wyo was not at dinner. Unusual. Greg was more unusual. Nobody said anything about my being scheduled to imitate a falling rock next day, although all knew, but did not realize anything special was on until all next generation left table without being told. Then knew why Greg had not gone back to Mare Undaram site after Congress adjourned that morning. Somebody had asked for a family talk. Mum looked around and said, We're all here. Ali, shut that door. That's a dear. Grandpa, will you start us? Our senior husband stopped nodding over coffee and firmed up. He looked down table and said strongly, I see that we are all here. I see that children have been put to bed. I see that there is no stranger, no guest. I say that we are met in accordance with customs created by Black Jack Davis, our first husband, and Tilly, our first wife. If there is any matter that concerns safety and happiness of our marriage, haul it out in the light now. Don't let it fester. This is our custom. Grandpa turned to Mum and said softly, Take it, Mimi, and slumped back into gentle apathy. But for a minute he had been strong, handsome, virile, dynamic man of days of my opting and I thought with sudden tears how lucky I had been. Then didn't know whether I felt lucky or not. Only excuse I could see for a family talk-talk was fact that I was due to be shipped earthside next day, labeled as grain. Could Mom be thinking of trying to set family against it? Nobody had to abide by results of a talk-talk, but one always did. That was strength of our marriage. When came down to issues, we stood together. Mimi was saying, Does anyone have anything that needs to be discussed? Speak up, dears. Greg said, I have. We'll listen to Greg. Greg is a good speaker, can stand up in front of a congregation and speak with confidence about matters I don't feel confident about even when alone. But that night he seemed anything but sure of himself. Well, uh, we've always tried to keep this marriage in balance, some old, some young, a regular alternation, well-spaced, just as it was handed down to us. But we've varied sometimes, for good reason. He looked at Ludmilla, and adjusted it later. He looked again at far end of table, at Frank and Ali, on each side of Ludmilla. Over years, as you can see from records, average age of husbands has been about forty, wives about thirty-five, and that age spread was just what our marriage started with nearly a hundred years gone by, for Tilly was fifteen when she opted blackjack, and he had just turned twenty. Right now I find that average age of husbands is almost exactly forty, while average, Mum said firmly, never mind arithmetic, Greg dear, simply state it. I was trying to think who Greg could possibly mean. 
True, I had been much away during past year, and if did get home was often after everybody was asleep. But he was clearly talking about marriage, and nobody ever proposes another wedding in our marriage without first giving everybody a long, careful chance to look prospect over. You just didn't do it any other way. So I'm stupid. Greg stuttered and said, I propose Wyoming not. I said I was stupid. I understand machinery, and machinery understands me, but didn't claim to know anything about people. When I get to be senior husband, if live that long, I'm going to do exactly what Grandpa does with Mum. Let Sidris run it. Just same. Well, look, Y.O. joined Greg's church. I like Greg, love Greg, and admire him. But you could never feed theology of his church through a computer and get anything but no. Y.O. surely knew this, and she encountered it in adult years. Truthfully, I had suspected that Y.O.'s conversion was proof that she would do anything for our cause. But Y.O. had recruited Greg even earlier, and had made most of trips out to New Sight easier for her to get away than me or Prof. Oh, well, was taken by surprise. Should not have been. Mimi said, Greg, do you have reason to think that Wyoming would accept an opting from us? Yes. Very well. We all know Wyoming. I'm sure we formed our opinions of her. I see no reason to discuss it. Unless someone has something to say, speak up. It was no surprise to Mum. What well, wouldn't be? Nor to anyone else either, since Mum never let a talk talk take place until she was sure of outcome but wondered why Mum was sure of my opinion, so certain that she had not felt me out ahead of time, and sat there in a soggy quandary, knowing I should speak up, knowing I knew something terribly pertinent, which nobody else knew, or matter would never have gone this far. Something that didn't matter to me, but would matter to Mum and all our women. Sat there, miserable coward, and said nothing. Mum said, very well. Let's call the roll. Ludmilla. Me? Why, I love Wyo. Everybody knows that, sure. Lenora, dear. Well, I may try to talk her into going back to being a brownie again. I think we set each other off. But that's her only fault, being blonder than I am. Da. Sidras. Thumbs up. Wyo is our kind of people. Anna. I've something to say before I express my opinion, Mimi. I don't think it's necessary, dear. Nevertheless, I'm going to haul it out in the open, just as Tilly always did according to our traditions. In this marriage, every wife has carried her load, given children to the family. It may come as a surprise to some of you to learn that Wyo has had eight children. Certainly surprised Ali. His head jerked and jaw dropped. I stared at Plate. Oh, Wyo, Wyo, how could I let this happen? I was going to have to speak up and realized Anna was still speaking. So now she can have children of her own. The operation was successful, but she worries about the possibility of another defective baby, unlikely as that is according to the head of the clinic in Hong Kong. So we'll just have to love her enough to make her quit fretting. We will love her, Mum said serenely. We do love her. Anna, are you ready to express opinion? Hardly necessary, is it? I went to Hong Kong with her, held her hand while our tubes were restored. I opt Wyo. In this family, Mum went on, we have always felt that our husbands should be allowed a veto. Odd of us, perhaps, but Tilly started it, and it has always worked well. Well, Grandpa? Eh? What were you saying, my dear? We are opting Wyoming, Gospodine Grandpa. Do you give consent? What? Why, of course, of course. Very nice little girl. Say, whatever became of that pretty little afro named something like that? She'd get mad at us? Greg? I proposed it. Manuel, do you forbid this? Me? Well, you know me, Mum. I do. I sometimes wonder if you know you. Hans? What would happen if I said no? You'd lose some teeth, that's what, Lenora said promptly. Hans votes yes. Stop it, darlings, Mum said with soft reproof. Opting is a serious matter. Hans, speak up. Da! 
Yes, yeah, we oui, see. Si. High time we had a pretty blonde in this. Ouch! Stop it, Lenora. Frank? Yes, Mum. Ali, dear? Is it unanimous? Lad blushed bright pink and couldn't talk, nodded vigorously. Instead of appointing a husband and a wife to seek out selectee and propose opting for us, Mum sent Ludmilla and Anna to fetch Wyo at once, and turned out she was only as far away as Bonton. Nor was that only irregularity. Instead of setting a date and arranging a wedding party, our children were called in, and twenty minutes later Greg had his book open, and we did be taking vows. And I finally got it through my confused head. That was being done with breakneck speed because of my date to break my neck next day. Not that it could matter, save a symbol of my family's love for me, since a bride spent her first night with her senior husband, and second night and third I was going to spend out in space. But did matter anyhow, and when women started to cry during ceremony, I found self dripping tears right with them. Then I went to bed, alone in workshop, once Wyo had kissed us and left on Grandpa's arm. Was terribly tired, and last two days had been hard. Thought about exercises, and decided was too late to matter. Thought about calling Mike and asking him for news from Terra. Went to bed. Don't know how long had been asleep when realized was no longer asleep, and somebody was in room. Manual? came soft whisper and dark. Huh? Why, oh, you aren't supposed to be here, dear. I am indeed supposed to be here, my husband. Mum knows I'm here, so does Greg. And Grandpa went right to sleep. Oh. What time is? About four hundred. Please, dear, may I come to bed? What? Oh, certainly. Something I should remember. Oh, yes. Mike! Yes, man, he answered. Switch off. Don't listen. If you want me, call me on family phone. So Wyatt told me, man. Congratulations. Then her head was pillowed on my stump, and I put a right arm around her. What are you crying about, Wyatt? I'm not crying. I'm just frightened silly that you won't come back. Sixteen. Woke up scared silly in pitch darkness. Manuel! Didn't know which end was up. Manuel! He called again. Wake up! That brought me out some, for signal intended to trigger me. Recalling being stretched on a table in infirmary at Complex, staring up at a light and listening to a voice while a drug dipped into my veins. But was a hundred years ago. Endless time of nightmares, unendurable pressure, pain. Knew now what no end is up feeling was, had experienced before, free fall, was in space. What had gone wrong? Had Mike dropped a decimal point? Or had he given in to childish nature and played a joke not realizing would kill? Then why, after all years of pain, was I alive? Or was I? Was this normal way for ghost to feel, just lonely, lost, nowhere? Wake up, Manuel! Wake up, Manuel! Oh, shut up! I snarled. Button your filthy king and ace! Recording went on. I pay no attention. Where was that reeking light switch? Now it doesn't take a century of pain to accelerate to Luna's escape speed at three gravities. Merely feels so. Eighty-two seconds, but is one time when human nervous system feels every microsecond. Three Gs is eight Teen grim times as much as a loony ought to weigh. Then discovered those vacuum skulls had not put arm back on. For some silly reason, they had taken it off when they stripped me to prepare me, and I was loaded with enough don't worry and let sleep pills not to protest. No hoo hoo had they put it on again. But that Drecklich switch was on my left, and sleeve of pea suit was empty. Spent next ten years getting unstrapped with one hand, then a twenty-year sentence floating around in dark before I managed to find my cradle again, figure out which was head-end, and from that hint locate switch by touch. That compartment was not over two meters in any dimension. This turns out to be larger than old dome and freefall and total darkness. Found it. We had light. And don't ask why that coffin did not have at least three lighting systems all working all time. Habit, probably. 
A lighting system implies a switch to control it, and yet the thing was built in two days. Should be thankful switch worked. Once I had light, cubic shrank to true claustrophobic dimensions and ten percent smaller, and I took a look at Prof. Dead, apparently. Well, he had every excuse. Envied him, but was now supposed to check his pulse and breathing and such like in case he had been unlucky and still had such troubles. And was again hampered, and not just by being one-armed. Grain load had been dried and depressured as usual before loading, but that cell was supposed to be pressured. Oh, nothing fancy. It's to tank with air in it. Our pea suits were supposed to handle needs such as life's breath for those two days. But even best pea suit is more comfortable in pressure than in vacuum. And anyhow, I was supposed to be able to get at my patient. Could not. Didn't need to open helmet to know this steel can had not stayed gas tight. Knew at once, naturally, from way pea suit felt. Oh, drugs I had for Prof, heart stimulants and so forth, were in field ampules. Could jab them through his suit. But how to check heart and breathing? His suit was cheapest sort, sold for loony who rarely leaves Warren. Had no readouts. His mouth hung open and eyes stared. A debtor, I decided. No need to ex-prof beyond that old Lyman. Had eliminated himself. Tried to see pulse on throat. His helmet was in way. They had provided a program clock, which was mighty kind of them. Showed I had been out forty-four plus hours, all to plan, and in three hours we should receive horrible booting to place us in parking orbit around Terra. Then after two circums, call it three more hours, we should start injection into landing program if Puna ground control didn't change its feeble mind and leave us in orbit. Remind itself that was unlikely. Grain is not left in vacuum longer than necessary. Has tendency to become puffed wheat or popped corn, which not only lowers value, but can split those thin canisters like a melon. Wouldn't that be sweet? Why had they packed us in with grain? Why not just a load of rock that doesn't mind vacuum? Had time to think about that, and to become very thirsty. Took nipple for half a mouthful, no more, because certainly did not want to take six G's with a full bladder. Need not have worried, was equipped with catheter, but did not know. When time got short, I decided couldn't hurt Prof to give him a jolt of drug that was supposed to take him through heavy acceleration. Then, after, in parking orbit, give him heart stimulant, since didn't seem as if anything could hurt him. Gave him first drug, then spent rest of minutes struggling back into straps one-handed. Was well, sorry I didn't know name of my helpful friend. Could have cursed him better. Ten G's get you into parking orbit around Terra in a mere 3.26 times 10 to the seventh power microseconds. Merely seems longer. Ten gravities being sixty times what a fragile sack of protoplasm should be asked to endure. Call it thirty-three seconds. My truthful word, I suspect my ancestress in Salem spent a worse half-minute day they made her dance. Gave Prof heart stimulant, then spent three hours trying to decide whether to drug self as well as Prof for landing sequence. Decided against. All drug had done for me at catapulting had been to swap a minute and a half of misery and two days of boredom for a century of terrible dreams. And besides, if those last minutes were going to be my very last, I decided to experience them. Bad as they would be, they were my very own, and I would not give them up. They were bad. Six G's did not feel better than ten. Felt worse. Four G's, no relief. Then we were kicked harder. Then suddenly, just four seconds, in free fall again. Then came splash, which was not gentle, and which we took on straps, not pads, as we went in head first. Also, don't think Mike realized that, after diving in hard, we would then surface and splash hard again, before we damped down into floating. Earthworms call it floating, but there's nothing like floating in free fall. You do it at one G, six times what is decent, and odd side motions tacked on. Very odd motions. Mike had assured us that solar weather was good, no radiation danger inside that Iron Maiden. But he had not been so interested in Earthside Indian Ocean weather. Prediction was acceptable for landing barges, and suppose he felt that was good enough. And I would have thought so, too. 
Stomach was supposed to be empty, but I filled helmet with sourest, nastiest fluid you would ever go a long way to avoid. Then we turned completely over, and I got it in hair and eyes and some in nose. This is thing earthworms call seasickness, and is one of many horrors they take for granted. Won't go into long period during which we were towed into port. Let it stand that, in addition to seasickness, my air bottles were playing out. They were rated for twelve hours, plenty for a fifty-hour orbit, most of which I was unconscious and none involving heavy exercise, but not quite enough with some hours of towing at it. By time barge finally held still, I was almost too dopey to care about trying to break out. Except for one fact. We were picked up, I think, and tumbled a bit, then brought to rest with me upside down. This is a no-good position at best under one gravity. Simply impossible when supposed to A. Unstrap self, B. Get out of suit-shaped cavity, C. Get loose a sledgehammer fastened with butterfly nuts to bulkhead, D. Smash same against breakaways guarding escape hatch, E. Batter way out, and F. Finally, drag an old man in a pea suit out after you. Didn't finish step A. Passed out head downwards. Lucky this was the emergency last resort routine. Stu Lejoie had been notified before we left. News services had been warned shortly before we landed. I woke up with people leaning over me, passed out again, woke up second time in hospital bed, flat on back with heavy feeling in chest. Was heavy and weak all over, but not ill, just tired, bruised, hungry, thirsty, languid. Was a transparent plastic tent over bed, which accounted for fact I was having no trouble breathing. At once was closed in on from both sides, a tiny Hindu nurse with big eyes on one side, Stuart Lejoie on other. He grinned at me. Hi, Cobber. How do you feel? Uh, I'm right. But, oh, bloody, what a way to travel. Prof says it's the only way. What a tough old boy he is. Hold it. Prof said? Prof is dead. Not at all. Not in good shape. We've got him in a pneumatic bed with a round-the-clock watch and more instruments wired into him than you would believe. But he's alive and will be able to do his job. But truly he didn't mind the trip. He never knew about it, so he says. Went to sleep in one hospital, woke up in another. I thought he was wrong when he refused to let me wangle it to send a ship. But he was not. The publicity has been tremendous. I said slowly, You say, Prof? refused to let you send a ship? I shall say, Chairman Cellini refused. Didn't you see the dispatches, Manny? No. Too late to fight over it. But last few days have been busy. A dinkum word. Here, too, don't recall when last I dosed. You sound like a loony. I am a loony, Manny. Don't ever doubt it. But the sister is looking daggers at me. Stu picked her up, turned her around. I decided he wasn't all loony yet. But nurse didn't resent. Go play somewhere else, dear, and I'll give your patient back to you, still warm, in a few minutes. He shut a door on her and came back to bed. But Adam was right. This way was not only wonderful publicity, but safer. Publicity, I suppose, but safer. Let's not talk about. Safer, my old. You weren't shot at. Yet they had two hours in which they knew right where you were. A big, fat target. They couldn't make up their minds what to do. They haven't formed a policy yet. They didn't even dare not bring you down on schedule. The news was full of it. I had stories slanted and waiting. Now they don't dare touch you, your popular heroes. Whereas if I had waited to charter a ship and fetch you, well, I don't know, we probably would have been ordered into parking orbit. Then you two, and myself, perhaps, would have been taken off under arrest. No skipper is going to risk missiles, no matter how much he's paid. The proof of the pudding gobber. But, let me brief you. You are both citizens of the People's Directorate of Chad. Best I could do on short notice. Also, Chad has recognized Luna. I had to buy one prime minister, two generals, some tribal chiefs, and a minister of finance. Cheap for such a hurry-up job. I haven't been able to get you diplomatic immunity, but I hope to. Before you leave hospital... At present, they haven't even dared arrest you. They can't figure out what you've done. They have guards outside, but simply for your protection. 
and a good thing, or you would have reporters nine deep shoving microphones into your face. Just what have we done? That they know about, I mean. Illegal immigration? Not even that many. You never were a consignee, and you have derivative Pan-African citizenship through one of your grandfathers. No hoo-hoo. In Professor de la Passa's case, we dug up proof that he had been granted naturalized Chad citizenship forty years back, waited for the ink to dry, and used it. You're not even illegally entered here in India. Not only did they bring you down themselves, knowing that you are in that barge, but also a control officer very kindly and fairly cheaply stamped your virgin passports. In addition to that, Prof's exile has no legal existence, as the government that proscribed him no longer exists, and a competent court has taken notice. That was more expensive. Nurse came back and indignant as a mother cat. Lord Stewart, you must let my patient rest. Earth wants, ma chère. Your Lord Stewart? Should be Comte. Or I can lay a dubious claim to being the McGregor. The blue blood bit helps. These people haven't been happy since they took their royalty away from them. As he left, he patted a rump. Instead of screaming, she wiggled it, was smiling as she came over to me. Stu was going to have to watch that stuff when he went back to Luna. If did. She asked how I felt, told her I was right, just hungry. Sister, did you see some prosthetic arms in our luggage? She had, and I felt better with number six in place. Had selected it and number two and social arm as enough for trip. Number two was presumably still in complex. I hoped somebody was taking care of it. But number six is most all-around useful arm. With it and social one, I'd be okay. Two days later, we left for Agra to present credentials to Federated Nations. I was in bad shape, and not just high G could do well enough in a wheelchair, and could even walk a little, although did not in public. What I had was a sore throat that missed pneumonia only through drugs, travelers' trots, skin disease on hands, and spreading defeat, just like my other trips to that disease-ridden hole, Terra. We loonies don't know how lucky we are, living in a place that has tightest of quarantines, almost no vermin, and what we have, controlled by vacuum any time necessary. Or unlucky since we have almost no immunities, if turns out we need them. Still wouldn't swap. Never heard word venereal until first went earthside and had thought common cold was state of ice miner's feet. And wasn't cheerful for other reason. Stu had fetched us a message from Adam Cellini. Buried in it, concealed even from Stu, was news that chances had dropped to worse than one in a hundred. Wondered what point in risking crazy trip if made odds worse. Did Mike really know what chances were? Couldn't see any way he could compute them, no matter how many facts he had. But Prof didn't seem worried. He talked to platoons of reporters, smiled at endless pictures, gave out statements, telling world he placed great confidence in Federated Nations, and was sure our just claims would be recognized, and that he wanted to thank... Friends of Free Luna, for wonderful help in bringing true story of our small but sturdy nation before good people of Terra. F of FL being Stu, a professional public opinion firm, several thousand chronic petition signers, and a great stack of Hong Kong dollars. I had picture taken, too, and tried to smile, but dodged questions by pointing to throat and croaking. In Agra, we were lodged in a lavish suite in a hotel that had once been palace of a Maharaja, and still belonged to him, even though India is supposed to be socialist, and interviews and picture-taking went on, hardly dared get out of wheelchair even to visit W.C., as was under orders from Prof. never to be photographed vertically. He was always either in bed or in a stretcher, bed baths, bed pans, everything, not only because safer, considering age, and easier for any loony, but also for pictures. His dimples and wonderful, gentle, persuasive personality were displayed in hundreds of millions of video screens, endless news pictures. But his personality did not get us anywhere in Agra. 
Prof was carried to office of President of Grand Assembly, me being pushed alongside, and there he attempted to present his credentials as ambassador to FN and prospective senator for Luna. Was referred to Secretary General, and at his offices we were granted ten minutes with Assistant Secretary who sucked teeth and said he could accept our credentials without prejudice and without implied commitment. They were referred to a Credentials Committee, who sat on them. I got fidgety. Prof read Keats. Grain barges continued to arrive at Bombay. In a way, was not sorry about latter. When we flew from Bombay to Agra, we got up before dawn and were taken out to field as city was waking. Every loony has his hole, whether luxury of a long-established home like Davis Tunnels, or rocks still raw from drill. Cubic is no problem, and can't be for centuries. Bombay was bee swarms of people. Our over a million, was told, who have no home but some piece of pavement. A family might claim right, and hand down by will, generation after generation, to sleep on a piece two meters long and one wide at a described location in front of a shop. Entire family sleeps on that space, meaning mother, father, kids, maybe a grandmother. Would not have believed if had not seen. At dawn in Bombay, roadways, side pavements, even bridges are covered with tight carpet of human bodies. What do they do? Where do they work? How do they eat? Did not look as if they did. Could count ribs. If I hadn't believed simple arithmetic that you can't ship stuff downhill forever without shipping replacement back, would have tossed in cards. But, Tan Stuffle, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch, in Bombay or in Luna. At last we were given appointment with an investigating committee. Not what Prof had asked for. He had requested public hearing before Senate, complete with video cameras, only camera at this session was its in-camera nature, was closed. Not too closed, I had little recorder, but no video, and took Prof two minutes to discover that committee was actually VIPs of Lunar Authority or their tame dogs. Nevertheless, was chance to talk, and Prof treated them as if they had power to recognize Luna's independence and willingness to do so while they treated us as a cross between naughty children and criminals up for sentencing. Prof was allowed to make opening statement. With decorations trimmed away was assertion that Luna was de facto a sovereign state, with an unopposed government in being, a civil condition of peace and order, a provisional president and cabinet carrying on necessary functions, but anxious to return to private life as soon as Congress completed writing a constitution and that we were here to ask that these facts be recognized de jure, and that Luna be allowed to take a rightful place in councils of mankind as a member of federated nations. What Prof told them bore a speaking acquaintance with truth, and they were not where they could spot discrepancies. Our provisional president was a computer, and cabinet was Weil, Finn, Conrad Clayton, and Terence Sheehan, editor of Pravda plus Wolfgang Korsakoff, board chairman of Luna Hoko and a director of Bank of Hong Kong in Luna. But Wyo was only person now in Luna who knew that Adam Cellini was false face for a computer. She had been terribly nervous at being left to hold Fort alone. As it was, Adam's oddity in never being seen save over video was always an embarrassment. We had done our best to turn it into a security necessity by opening offices for him in Cubic of Authority's Luna City office and then exploding a small bomb. After this assassination attempt, comrades who had been most fretful about Adam's failure to stir around became loudest in demands that Adam must not take any chances, this being helped by editorials. But I wondered, while Prof was talking, what these pompous chums would think if they knew that our president was a collection of hardware owned by authority. But they just sat staring with chill disapproval, unmoved by Prof's rhetoric, probably best performance of his life, considering he delivered it flat on back, speaking into a microphone without notes, and hardly able to see his audience. Then they started in on us. Gentlemen member from Argentina, never given their names. We weren't socially acceptable. 
This Argentino objected to phrase former warden in Prof's speech. That designation had been obsolete half a century. He insisted that it be struck out and proper title inserted. Protector of the lunar colonies by appointment of the lunar authority. Any other wording offended dignity of lunar authority. Prof asked to comment. Honorable Chairman permitted it. Prof said mildly that he accepted change since authority was free to designate its servants in any fashion it pleased and was no intention to offend dignity of any agency of federated nations. But in view of functions of this office, former functions of this former office, citizens of Luna Free State would probably go on thinking of it by traditional name. That made about six of them try to talk at once. Somebody objected to use of word Luna and still more to Luna Free State. It was the moon, Earth's moon, a satellite of Earth and property of Federated Nations, just as Antarctica was, and these proceedings were a farce. I was inclined to agree with the last point. Chairman asked a gentleman member from North America to please be in order and to address his remarks through chair. Did Chair understand from witnesses' last remark that this alleged de facto regime intended to interfere with consignee system? Prof fielded that and tossed it back. Honorable Chairman, I myself was a consignee. Now Luna is my beloved home. My colleague, the Honorable, the Undersecretary for Foreign Affairs, Colonel O'Kelly Davis, myself, is Luna-born and proud of his descent from four transported grandparents. Luna has grown strong on your outcasts. Give us your poor, your wretched. We welcome them. Luna has room for them, nearly forty million square kilometers, an area greater than all Africa, and almost totally empty. More than that, since by our method of living we occupy not area, but cubic, the mind cannot imagine the day when Luna would refuse another shipload of weary homeless. Chairman said, The witness is admonished to refrain from making speeches. The chair takes it that your oratory means that the group you represent agrees to accept prisoners as before. No, sir. What? Explain yourself. Once an immigrant sets foot on Luna today, he is a free man, no matter what his previous condition, free to go where he listeth. Sir, then what's to keep a consignee from walking across the field, climbing into another ship, and returning here? I admit that I am puzzled at your apparent willingness to accept them. But we do not want them. It is our humane way of getting rid of incorrigibles who would otherwise have to be executed. Could have told him several things that would stop what he pictured. He had obviously never been to Luna. As for incorrigibles, if really are, Luna eliminates such faster than Terra ever did. Back when I was very young, they sent us a gangster lord from Los Angeles, I believe. He arrived with squad of stooges, his bodyguards, and was cockily ready to take over Luna, as was rumored to have taken over a prison somewhere earthside. None lasted two weeks. Gangster boss didn't make it to barracks, hadn't listened when told how to wear a peasuit. There is nothing to keep him from going home so far as we are concerned, sir, Prof answered, although your police here on Terra might cause him to think. But I've never heard of a consignee arriving with funds enough to buy a ticket home. Is this truly an issue? The ships are yours. Luna has no ships. And let me add that we are sorry that the ship scheduled for Luna this month was cancelled. I am not complaining that it forced on my colleague and myself, Prof stopped to smile, a most informal method of travel. I simply hope that this does not represent policy. Luna has no quarrel with you. Your ships are welcome. Your trade is welcome. We are at peace and wish to stay so. Please note that all scheduled grain shipments have come through on time. Prof did always have gift for changing subject. They fiddled with minor matters then. Nosy from North America wanted to know what had really happened to the ward. He stopped himself. The protector. Senator Hobart. The prop answered that he had suffered a stroke. A coup is a stroke, and was no longer able to carry out his duties, but was in good health otherwise and receiving constant medical care. 
Prof added thoughtfully that he suspected that the old gentleman had been failing for some time in view of his indiscretions this past year, especially his many invasions of rights of free citizens, including ones who were not and never had been consignees. The story was not hard to swallow. When those busy scientists managed to break news of our coup, they had reported Warden as dead, whereas Mike had kept him alive and on job by impersonating him. When Authority Earthside demanded a report from Warden on this wild rumor, Mike had consulted Prof, then had accepted call and given a convincing imitation of senility, managing to deny, confirm, and confuse every detail. Our announcements followed, and thereafter Warden was no longer available, even in his computer alter ego. Three days later, we declared independence. This North American wanted to know what reason they had to believe that one word of this was true. Prof smiled, most saintly smile, and made effort to spread thin hands before letting them fall to cover it. The gentleman member from North America is urged to go to Luna, visit Senator Hobart's sickbed, and see for himself. Indeed, all Terran citizens are invited to visit Luna at any time, see anything. We wish to be friends. We are at peace. We have nothing to hide. My only regret is that my country is unable to furnish transportation. For that we must turn to you. Chinese member looked at Prof thoughtfully. He had not said a word, but missed nothing. Chairman recessed hearing until 1500. They gave us a retiring room and sent in lunch. I wanted to talk, but Prof shook head, glanced around room, tapped ear. So I shut up. Prof napped then, and I leveled out my wheelchair and joined him. On Terra, we both slept all we could. Helped. Not enough. They didn't wheel us back in until 1600. Committee was already sitting. Chairman then broke own rule against speeches and made a long one, more in sorrow than anger. Started by reminding us that Luna Authority was a non-political trusteeship charged with solemn duty of ensuring that Earth satellite, the moon, Luna as some called it, was never used for military purposes. He told us that Authority had guarded this sacred trust more than a century, our governments fell and new governments rose. Alliances shifted and shifted again. Indeed, authority was older than federated nations, deriving original charter from an older international body, and so well had it kept that trust that it had lasted through wars and turmoils and realignments. This is news? But you see what he was building towards. The lunar authority cannot surrender its trust, he told us solemnly. However, there appears to be no insuperable obstacle to the lunar colonists, if they show political maturity, enjoying a degree of autonomy. This can be taken under advisement. Much depends on your behavior. The behavior, I should say, of all you colonists. There have been riots and destruction of property. This must not be. I waited for him to mention ninety dead goons. He never did. I will never make a statesman. I don't have high-level approach. Destroyed property must be paid for, he went on. Commitments must be met. If this body you call a Congress can guarantee such things, it appears to this committee that this so-called Congress could in time be considered an agency of the authority for many internal matters. Indeed, it is conceivable that a stable local government might in time assume many duties now falling on the protector, and even be allowed a delegate non-voting in the Grand Assembly. But such recognition would have to be earned. But one thing must be made clear. Earth's major satellite, the Moon, is by nature's law forever the joint property of all the peoples of Earth. It does not belong to that handful who by accident of history happen to live there. The sacred trust laid upon the lunar authority is and forever must be the supreme law of Earth's moon. Accident of history, huh? I expected Prof to shove it down his throat. I thought he would say... I never did know what Prof would say. Here's what he did say. Prof waited through several seconds of silence, then said, Honorable Chairman, 
Who is to be exiled this time? What did you say? Have you decided which one of you is to go into exile? Your deputy warden won't take the job. This was true. He preferred to stay alive. He is functioning now only because we have asked him to. If you persist in believing that we are not independent, then you must be planning to send up a new warden. Protector! Warden, let us not mince words. Though if we knew who he is to be, we might be happy to call him ambassador. We might be able to work with him. It might not be necessary to send with him armed hoodlums to rape and murder our women. Order! Order! The witness will come to order. It is not I who was not in order, Honorable Chairman. Rape it was, and murder most foul. But that is history, and now we must look to the future. Whom are you going to exile? Prof struggled to raise self on elbow, and I was suddenly alert. Was a cue. For you all know, sir, that it is a one-way trip. I was born here. You can see what effort it is for me to return, even temporarily, to the planet which has disinherited me. We are outcasts of Earth who... He collapsed, was up out of my chair, and collapsed myself, trying to reach him. Was not all play-acting, even though I answered a cue. His terrible strain on heart to get up suddenly on terror. Thick field grabbed and smashed me to floor. Seventeen. Neither of us was hurt, and it made juicy news breaks, for I put recording in Stu's hands, and he turned it over to his hired men. Nor were all headlines against us. Stu had recording cut and edited and slanted. Authority to play odd man out. Lunar ambassador collapses under grilling. Outcasts, he cries. Prof Poss points finger of shame. Story, page eight. Not all were good. Nearest to a favorable story in India was editorial in New India Times, inquiring whether authority was risking bread of masses and failing to come to terms with lunar insurgents, was suggesting that concessions could be made if would ensure increased grain deliveries. It was filled with inflated statistics. Luna did not feed a hundred million Hindus, unless you chose to think of our grain as making difference between malnutrition and starvation. On other hand, biggest New York paper opined that authority had made mistake in treating with us at all, since only thing convicts understood was taste of lash. Troops should land, set us in order, hang guilty, leave forces to keep order. Was a quick mutiny, quickly subdued, in Peace Dragoon's regiment from which our late oppressors had come, once started by rumor that they were to be shipped to Moon. Mutiny not hushed up perfectly. Stu hired good men. Next morning a message reached us inquiring if Professor de la Paz was well enough to resume discussions. We went, and committee supplied doctor and nurse to watch over Prof. But this time we were searched, and the recorder removed from my pouch. I surrendered it without much fuss. It was Japanese job supplied by Stu to be surrendered. Number six arm has recess intended for a power pack, but near enough size of my mini recorder. Didn't need power that day, and most people, even hardened police officers, dislike to touch a prosthetic. Everything discussed the day before was ignored, except that chairman started session by scolding us for breaking security of a closed meeting. Prof replied that it had not been closed so far as we were concerned, and that we would welcome newsmen, video cameras, a gallery, anyone, as Luna Free State had nothing to hide. Chairman replied stiffly that so-called free state did not control these hearings. These sessions were closed, not to be discussed outside this room, and that it was so ordered. Prof looked at me. Will you help me, Colonel? I touched controls of chair, scooted around, was shoving his stretcher wagon with my chair toward door before Chairman realized bluff had been called. Prof allowed himself to be persuaded to stay without promising anything. Hard to coerce a man who faints if he gets overexcited. 
Chairman said that there had been many irrelevancies yesterday and matters discussed best left undiscussed, and that he would permit no digressions today. He looked at Argentino, then at North American. He went on. Sovereignty is an abstract concept, one that has been redefined many times as mankind has learned to live in peace. We need not discuss it. The real question, Professor, or even Ambassador de facto, if you like, we shan't quibble. The real question is this. Are you prepared to guarantee that the lunar colonies will keep their commitments? What commitments, sir? All commitments. But I have in mind specifically your commitments concerning grain shipments. I know of no such commitments, sir, Prof answered with bland innocence. Chairman's hand tightened on gavel, but he answered quietly, Come, sir, there is no need to spar over words. I refer to the quota of grain shipments and to the increased quota, a matter of thirteen per cent for this new fiscal year. Do we have your assurance that you will honor those commitments? This is a minimum basis for discussion, else these talks can go no further. Then I am sorry to say, sir, that it would appear that our talks must cease. You are not being serious. Quite serious, sir. The sovereignty of Free Luna is not the abstract matter you seem to feel it is. These commitments you speak of were the authority contracting with itself. My country is not bound by such. Any commitments from the sovereign nation I have the honor to represent are still to be negotiated. Rattle, growled North American. I told you you were being too soft on them. Jailbirds, thieves, and whores. They don't understand decent treatment. Order. Just remember I told you. If I had them in Colorado, we would teach them a thing or two. We know how to handle their sort. A gentleman member will please be in order. I am afraid, said Hindu member. Parsi, in fact, but committee man from India. I am afraid I must agree in essence with the gentleman member from the North American Directorate. India cannot accept the concept that the grain commitments are mere scraps of paper. Decent people do not play politics with hunger. And besides, the Argentino put in, they breed like animals, pigs. Prof made me take a tranquilizing drug before that session, had insisted on seeing me take it. Prof said quietly, Honorable Chairman, may I have consent to amplify my meaning before we conclude, perhaps too hastily, that these talks must be abandoned? Proceed. Unanimous consent? Free of interruption. Chairman looked around. Consent is unanimous, he stated, and the gentlemen members are placed on notice that I will invoke special rule 14 at the next outburst. The sergeant at arms is directed to note this and act. The witness will proceed. I will be brief, honorable chairman. Prof said something in Spanish. All I caught was senor. Argentino turned dark but did not answer. Prof went on. I must first answer the gentleman member from North America on a matter of personal privilege since he has impugned my fellow countrymen. I, for one, have seen the inside of more than one jail. I accept the title. Nay, I glory in the title of jailbird. We citizens of Luna are jailbirds and descendants of jailbirds, but Luna herself is a stern schoolmistress. Those who have lived through her harsh lessons have no cause to feel ashamed. In Luna City, a man may leave purse unguarded, or home unlocked, and feel no fear. I wonder if this is true in Denver. As may be, I have no wish to visit Colorado, to learn a thing or two. I am satisfied with what Mother Luna has taught me. And rabble we may be. But we are now a rabble in arms. To the gentleman member from India, let me say that we do not play politics with hunger. What we ask is an open discussion of facts of nature unbound by political assumptions false to fact. 
if we can hold this discussion, I can promise to show a way in which Luna can continue grain shipments and expand them enormously, to the great benefit of India. Both Chinese and Indian looked alert. Indian started to speak, checked himself, then said, Honorable Chairman, will the Chair ask the witness to explain what he means? The witness is invited to amplify. Honorable Chairman, gentlemen members, there is indeed a way for Luna to expand by tenfold or even a hundred her shipments to our hungry millions. The fact that grain barges continue to arrive on schedule during our time of trouble and are still arriving today is proof that our intentions are friendly. But you do not get milk by beating the cow. Discussions of how to augment our shipments must be based on the facts of nature, not on the false assumption that we are slaves, bound by a work quota we never made. So which shall it be? Will you persist in believing that we are slaves, indentured to an authority other than ourselves? Or will you acknowledge that we are free, negotiate with us, and learn how we can help you. Chairman said, In other words, you ask us to buy a pig in a poke. You demand that we legalize your outlaw status. Then you will talk about fantastic claims that you can increase grain shipments ten or a hundredfold. What you claim is impossible. I am expert in lunar economics. And what you ask is impossible. It takes the Grand Assembly to admit a new nation. Then place it before the Grand Assembly. Once seated as sovereign equals, we will discuss how to increase shipments and negotiate terms. Honorable Chairman, we grow the grain. We own it. We can grow far more, but not as slaves. Luna's sovereign freedom must first be recognized. Impossible, and you know it. The Lunar Authority cannot abdicate its sacred responsibility. Prof sighed. It appears to be an impasse. I can only suggest that these hearings be recessed while we all take thought. Today our barges are arriving, but the moment that I am forced to notify my government that I have failed, they will stop. Prof's head sank back on pillow, as if it had been too much for him, as may have been. I was doing well enough, but was young, and had had practice in how to visit Terra and stay alive. A loony his age should not risk it. After minor foo which Prof ignored, they loaded us into a lorry and scooted us back to hotel. Once underway, I said, Prof, what was it you said to Senor Jelly Belly that raised blood pressure? He chuckled. Comrade Stewart's investigations of these gentlemen turn up remarkable facts. I asked who owned a certain brothel off Calle Florida and B.A. these days, and did it now have a star redhead? Why? You used to patronize it? Tried to imagine Prof in such? Never. It has been forty years since I was last in Buenos Aires. He owns that establishment, Manuel, through a dummy, and his wife, a beauty with Titian hair, once worked in it. Masari had asked, Wasn't that a foul blow and undiplomatic? The prof closed eyes and did not answer. He was recovered enough to spend an hour at a reception for newsmen that night, with white hair framed against a purple pillow and thin body decked out in embroidered pajamas. Looked like VIP corpse at an important funeral, except for eyes and dimples. I looked mighty VIP, too, in black and gold uniform, which Stu claimed was lunar diplomatic uniform of my rank. Could have been, if Luna had had such things. Did not, or I would have known. I prefer a pea suit. Carter was tight. Nor did I ever find out what decorations on it meant. A reporter asked me about one, based on Luna at Crescent, as seen from Terra. Told him it was a prize for spelling. Stu was a near shot, and said, The colonel is modest. That decoration is of the same rank as the Victoria Cross, and in his case was awarded for an act of gallantry on the glorious tragic day of— He led him away, still talking. 
I still could lie standing up almost as well as Prof. Me, I have to think out a lie ahead of time. India newspapers and castes were rough that night. Threat to stop grain shipments made them froth. Gentlest proposal was to clean out Luna, exterminate us criminal troglodytes, and replace us with honest Hindu peasants who understood sacredness of life and would ship grain and more grain. Prof picked that night to talk and give handouts about Luna's inability to continue shipments, and why, and Stu's organization spread release throughout Terra. Some reporters took time to dig out sense of figures and tackled Prof on glaring discrepancy. Professor de la Paz, here you say that grain shipments will dwindle away through failure of natural resources and that by 2082 Luna won't even be able to feed its own people. Yet earlier today you told the Lunar Authority that you could increase shipments a dozen times or more. Prof said sweetly, That committee is the Lunar Authority? Well, it's an open secret. So it is, sir. But they have maintained the fiction of being an impartial investigating committee of the Grand Assembly. Don't you think they should disqualify themselves, so that we could receive a fair hearing? Uh, it's not my place to say, Professor. Let's get back to my question. How do you reconcile the two? I'm interested in why it's not your place to say, sir. Isn't it the concern of every citizen of Terra to help avoid a situation which will produce war between Terra and her neighbor? War? What in the world makes you speak of war, Professor? Where else can it end, sir? If the Lunar Authority persists in its intransigence, we cannot accede to their demands. Those figures show why. If they will not see this, then they will attempt to subdue us by force, and we will fight back. Like cornered rats, for cornered we are, unable to retreat, unable to surrender. We do not choose war. We wish to live in peace with our neighbor planet, in peace and peacefully trade. But the choice is not ours. We are small, you are gigantic. I predict that the next move will be for the Lunar Authority to attempt to subdue Luna by force. This peacekeeping agency will start the first interplanetary war. Journalist frowned. Aren't you overstating it? Let's assume that the Authority, or the Grand Assembly, as the Authority hasn't any warships of its own, let's suppose the nations of Earth decide to displace your uh, government. You might fight on Luna, I suppose you would, but that hardly constitutes interplanetary war. As you pointed out, Luna has no ships. To put it bluntly, you can't reach us. I had chair close by Prof Stretcher, listening. He turned to me. Tell them, Colonel. I parroted it. Prof and Mike had worked out stock situations. I had memorized and was ready with answers. I said, do you gentlemen remember the Pathfinder? How she came plunging in out of control? They remembered. Nobody forgets greatest disaster of early days of space flight when unlucky Pathfinder hit a Belgian village. We have no ships, I went on, but would be possible to throw those barge loads of grain instead of delivering them into parking orbit. Next day, this evoked a headline. Loonies threatened to throw rice. At moment, it produced awkward silence. Finally, a journalist said, Nevertheless, I would like to know how you reconcile your two statements. No more grain after 2082, and ten or a hundred times as much. There is no conflict, Prof answered. They are based on different sets of circumstances. The figures you have been looking at show the present circumstances and the disaster they will produce in only a few years through drainage of Luna's natural resources, disaster which these authority bureaucrats, or should I say authoritarian bureaucrats, would avert by telling us to stand in the corner like naughty children. Prof paused for labored breathing, went on. The circumstances under which we can continue or greatly increase our grain shipments are the obvious corollary of the first. As an old teacher, I can hardly refrain from classroom habits. The corollary 
should be left as an exercise for the student, will someone attempt it? There was uncomfortable silence. Then a little man with strange accent said slowly, It sounds to me as if you talk about way to replenish natural resource. Capital! Excellent! Prof flashed dimples. You, sir, will have a gold star on your term report. To make grain requires water and plant foods, phosphates, other things, asks the experts. Send these things to us, we'll send them back as wholesome grain. Put down a hose in the limitless Indian Ocean. Line up those millions of cattle here in India. Collect their end product and ship it to us. Collect your own night soil. Don't bother to sterilize it. We've learned to do such things cheaply and easily. Send us briny seawater, rotten fish, dead animals, city sewage, cow manure, awful of any sort, and we will send it back, ton for ton, as golden grain. Send ten times as much, we'll send back ten times as much grain. Send us your poor, your dispossessed. Send them by thousands and hundreds of thousands. We'll teach them swift, efficient lunar methods of tunnel farming and ship you back unbelievable tonnage. Gentlemen, Luna is one enormous fallow farm, four thousand million hectares waiting to be ploughed. That startled them. Then someone said slowly, But what do you get out of it? Luna, I mean. Prof shrugged. Money in the form of trade goods. There are many things you make cheaply which are dear in Luna. Drugs, tools, book films, gods for our lovely ladies. Buy our grain, and you can sell to us at a happy profit. A Hindu journalist looked thoughtful, started to write. Next to him was a European type who seemed unimpressed. He said, Professor, have you any idea of the cost of shipping that much tonnage to the moon? Prof waved it aside. A technicality. Sir, there was a time when it was not simply expensive to ship goods across oceans, but impossible. Then it was expensive, difficult, dangerous. Today you sell goods half around your planet almost as cheaply as next door. Long-distance shipping is the least important factor in cost. Gentlemen, I am not an engineer, but I have learned this about engineers. When something must be done, engineers can find a way that is economically feasible. If you want the grain that we can grow, turn your engineers loose. Prof gasped and labored, signaled for help, and nurses wheeled him away. I declined to be questioned on it, telling them that they must talk to Prof when he was well enough to see them. So they pecked at me on other lines. One man demanded to know why, since we paid no taxes, we colonists thought we had a right to run things our own way. After all, these colonies had been established by federated nations, by some of them. It had been terribly expensive. Earth had paid all bills, and now you colonists enjoy benefits and pay not one dime of taxes. Was that fair? I wanted to tell him to blow it, but Prof had again made me take a tranquilizer and had required me to swat that endless list of answers to trick questions. Let's take that one at a time, I said. First, what is it you want us to pay taxes for? Tell me what I get, and perhaps I'll buy it. Now, put it this way. Do you pay taxes? Certainly I do, and so should you. And what do you get for your taxes? Huh? Taxes pay for government. I said, excuse me, I'm ignorant. I've lived my whole life in Luna. I don't know much about your government. Can you feed it to me in small pieces? What do you get for your money? They all got interested, and anything this aggressive little chum missed, others supplied. I kept a list. When they stopped, they read it back. Free hospitals. Aren't any in Luna. Medical insurance. We have that, but apparently not what you mean by it. If a person wants insurance, he goes to a bookie and works out a bet. You can hedge anything for a price. I don't hedge my health. I'm healthy. Or was till I came here. We have a public library. One Carnegie Foundation started with a few book films. 
and it gets along by charging fees. Public roads. I suppose that would be our tubes. But they are no more free than air is free. Sorry, you have free air here, don't you? I mean, our tubes were built by companies who put up money and are downright nasty about expecting it back and then some. Public schools. There are schools in all Warrens, and I never heard of them turning away pupils, so I guess they are public. But they pay well, too, because anyone in Luna who knows something useful and is willing to teach it charges all the traffic will bear. I went on. Let's see what else. Social Security. I'm not sure what that is, but whatever it is, we don't have it. Pensions. You can buy a pension. Most people don't. Most families are large, and old people, say a hundred and up, either fiddle along at something they like, or sit and watch video, or sleep. They sleep a lot, after, say, a hundred and twenty. Sir, excuse me. Do people really live as long on the moon as they say? I looked surprised, but wasn't. This was a stimulated question, for which an answer had been taped. Nobody knows how long a person will live in Luna. We haven't been there long enough. Our oldest citizens were born Earthside. It's no test. So far, no one born in Luna died of old age, but that's still no test. They haven't had time to grow old yet, less than a century. But, well, take me, madam. How old would you say I am? I'm authentic Looney, third generation. Oh, uh, truthfully, Colonel Davis, I was surprised at your youthfulness. For this mission, I mean. You appear to be about twenty-two. Are you older? Not much, I fancy. Madam, I regret that your local gravitation makes it impossible for me to bow. Thank you. I've been married longer than that. What? Oh, you're jesting. Madam, I would never venture to guess a lady's age, but if you will emigrate to Luna, you will keep your present youthful loveliness much longer and add at least twenty years to your life. I looked at List. I lump the rest of this together by saying we don't have any of it in Luna, so I can't see any reason to pay taxes for it. On that other point, sir, surely you know that the initial cost of the colonies has long since been repaid several times over, through grain shipments alone? We are being bled white of our most essential resources, and not even being paid an open market price. That's why the Lunar Authority is being stubborn. They intend to go on bleeding us. The idea that Luna has been an expense to Terra, and the investment must be recovered, is a lie invented by the Authority to excuse their treating us as slaves. The truth is that Luna has not cost Terra one dime this century, and the original investment has long since been paid back. He tried to rally. Oh, surely you're not claiming that the lunar colonies have paid all the billions of dollars it took to develop space flight? I could present a good case. However, there is no excuse to charge that against us. You have space flight. You people of Terra, we do not. Luna has not one ship. So why should we pay for what we never received? It's like the rest of this list. We don't get it. Why should we pay for it? I'd been stalling, waiting for a claim that Prof had told me I was sure to hear, and got it at last. Just a moment, please, came a confident voice. You ignored the two most important items on that list, police protection and armed forces. You boasted that you were willing to pay for what you get. So how about paying almost a century of back taxes for those two? It should be quite a bill, quite a bill, he smiled smugly. I wanted to thank him thought Prof was going to chide me for failing to yank him out. People looked at each other and nodded, pleased I had been scored on. Did best to look innocent. Please? Don't understand. Luna has neither police nor armed forces. You know what I mean. You enjoy the protection of the peace forces of the Federated Nations. And you do have police, paid for by the Lunar Authority. I know, to my certain knowledge, that two phalanges were sent to the moon less than a year ago to serve as policemen. Oh, I sighed. Can you tell me how FN Peace Forces protect Luna? I did not know that any of your nations wanted to attack us. We are far away and have nothing anyone envies. Or did you mean we should pay them to leave us alone? If so, there is an old saying that once you pay Danegelt, 
You never get rid of the Dane. Sir, we will fight FN armed forces if we must. We shall never pay them. Now about those so-called policemen. They were not sent to protect us. Our Declaration of Independence told the true story about those hoodlums. Did your newspapers print it? Some had, some hadn't. Depended on country. They went mad and started raping and murdering. And now they are dead. So don't send us any more troops. I was suddenly tired and had to leave. Really was tired. Not much of an actor, and making that talk talk come out way Prof thought it should was strain. Eighteen. Was not told till later that I had received an assist in that interview. Lead about police and armed forces had been fed by a stooge. Stoulejoie took no chances. But by the time I knew, I had had experience in handling interviews. We had them endlessly. Despite being tired, was not through that night. In addition to press, some Agra diplomatic corps had risked showing up. Few, and none officially, even from Chad. But we were curiosities, and they wanted to look at us. Only one was important, a Chinese. Was startled to see him. He was Chinese member of committee. I met him simply as Dr. John, and we pretended to be meeting first time. He was that Dr. John who was then senator from Great China, and also Great China's long-time number one boy in lunar authority, and much later vice chairman and premier, shortly before his assassin. After getting out point I was supposed to make with bonus through others that could have waited, I guided chair to bedroom and was at once summoned to profs. Manuel, I'm sure you noticed our distinguished visitor from the Middle Kingdom. All Chinese from committee? Try to curb the loony talk, son. Please don't use it at all here, even with me. Yes, he wants to know what we meant by tenfold or a hundredfold, so tell him. Straight or swindle? The straight. This man is no fool. Can you handle the technical details? Done my homework. Unless he's expert in ballistics. He's not. But don't pretend to know anything you don't know. And don't assume that he's friendly. But he could be enormously helpful if he concludes that our interests and his coincide. But don't try to persuade him. He's in my study. Good luck. And remember, speak standard English. Dr. John stood up as I came in. I apologized for not standing. He said that he understood difficulties that a gentleman from Luna labored under here, and for me not to exert myself, shook hands with himself, and sat down. I'll skip some formalities. Did we or did we not have some specific solution when we claimed there was a cheap way to ship massive tonnage to Luna? Told him was a method, expensive in investment, but cheap in running expenses. It's the one we use on Luna, sir. A catapult. An escape speed induction catapult. His expression changed not at all. Colonel, are you aware that such has been proposed many times and always rejected for what seemed good reasons? Something to do with air pressure. Yes, Doctor. But we believe, based on extensive analyses by computer and on our experience with catapulting, that today the problem can be solved. Two of our larger firms, the Lunaho Company and the Bank of Hong Kong and Luna, are ready to head a syndicate to do it as a private venture. They would need help here on Earth and might share voting stock, though they would prefer to sell bonds and retain control. Primarily what they need is a concession from some government, a permanent easement on which to build the catapult. Probably India. Above was set speech. Luna Hoko was bankrupt if anybody examined books, and Hong Kong Bank was strained, was acting as central bank for country undergoing upheaval. Purpose was to get in last word, India. Prof had coached me that this word must come last. Dr. John answered, Never mind financial aspects. Anything which is physically possible can always be made financially possible. Money is a bugaboo of small minds. Why do you select India? 
Well, sir, India now consumes, I believe, over 90% of our grain shipments. 93.1%. Yes, sir. India is deeply interested in our grain, so it seemed likely that she would cooperate. She could grant us land, make labor and materials available, and so forth. But I mentioned India because she holds a wide choice of possible sites, very high mountains, not too far from Terra's equator. The latter is not essential, just helpful. But the site must be a high mountain. It's that air pressure you spoke of, or air density. The catapult head should be at as high altitude as feasible, but the ejection end, where the load travels over 11 kilometers per second, must be in air so thin that it approaches vacuum. Which calls for a very high mountain. Take the peak Nanda Devi, around 400 kilometers from here. It has a railhead 60 kilometers from it, and a road almost to its base. It is 8,000 meters high. I don't know that Nanda Devi is ideal. It is simply a possible site with good logistics. The ideal site would have to be selected by Terran engineers. A higher mountain would be better? Oh, yes, sir, I assured him. A higher mountain would be preferred over one nearer the equator. The catapult can be designed to make up for loss in free ride from Earth's rotation. The difficult thing is to avoid, so far as possible, this pesky thick atmosphere. Excuse me, Doctor, I did not mean to criticize your planet. There are higher mountains. Colonel, tell me about this proposed catapult. I started to. The length of an escape speed catapult is determined by the acceleration. We think, or the computer calculates, that an acceleration of 20 gravities is about optimum. For Earth's escape speed, this requires a catapult 323 kilometers in length. Therefore, stop, please. Colonel, are you seriously proposing to bore a hole over 300 kilometers deep? Oh, no. Construction has to be above ground to permit shock waves to expand. The stator would stretch nearly horizontally, rising perhaps four kilometers and 300, and in a straight line, almost straight, as Coriolis acceleration and other minor variables make it a gentle curve. The lunar catapult is straight so far as the eye can see, and so nearly horizontal that the barges just miss some peaks beyond it. Oh, I thought that you were overestimating the capacity of present-day engineering. We drill deeply today, not that deeply. Go on. Doctor, it may be that common misconception which caused you to check me is why such a catapult has not been constructed before this. I've seen those earlier studies. Most assumed that a catapult would be vertical, or that it would have to tilt up at the end to toss the spacecraft into the sky, and neither is feasible nor necessary. I suppose the assumption arose from the fact that your spaceships do boost straight up or nearly. I went on. But they do that to get above atmosphere, not to get into orbit. Escape speed is not a vector quantity. It is scalar. A load bursting from a catapult at escape speed will not return to Earth no matter what its direction. Uh, two corrections. It must not be headed toward the Earth itself, but at some part of the sky hemisphere, and it must have enough added velocity to punch through whatever atmosphere it still traverses. If it is headed in the right direction, it will wind up at Luna. Ah, yes. Then this catapult could be used but once each lunar month? No, sir. On the basis on which you were thinking, it would be once every day, picking the time to fit where Luna will be in her orbit. But, in fact, or so the computer says, I'm not an astronautics expert, in fact, this catapult could be used almost any time, simply by varying ejection speed, and the orbits could still wind up at Luna. I don't visualize that. Neither do I, Doctor, but... Excuse me, but isn't there an exceptionally fine computer at Peiping University? And if there is, did I detect an increase in bland inscrutability? A cyborg computer, pickled brains, or live ones, aware? Horrible, either way. Why not ask a top-notch computer for all possible ejection times for such a catapult as I have described? Some orbits go far outside Luna's orbit before returning to where they can be captured by Luna, taking a fantastically long time. 
Others hook around Terra and then go quite directly. Some are as simple as the ones we use from Luna. There are periods each day when short orbits may be selected, but a load is in the catapult less than one minute. The limitation is how fast the loads can be made ready. It is even possible to have more than one load going up the catapult at a time if the power is sufficient and computer control is versatile. The only thing that worries me is... These high mountains, they are covered with snow. Usually, he answered. Ice and snow and bare rock. Well, sir, being born in Luna, I don't know anything about snow. The stator would not only have to be rigid under the heavy gravity of this planet, but would have to withstand dynamic thrusts at twenty gravities. I don't suppose it could be anchored to ice or snow. Or could it be? I'm not an engineer, Colonel, but it seems unlikely. Snow and ice would have to be removed, and kept clear. Weather would be a problem, too. Weather I know nothing about, Doctor, and all I know about ice is that it has a heat of crystallization of 335 million joules per ton. I have no idea how many tons would have to be melted to clear the site, or how much energy would be required to keep it clear, but it seems to me that it might take as large a reactor to keep it free of ice as to power the catapult. We can build reactors, we can melt ice, or engineers can be sent north for re-education until they do understand ice. Dr. John smiled, and I shivered. However, the engineering of ice and snow was solved in Antarctica years ago. Don't worry about it. A clear, solid rock site about 350 kilometers long at a high altitude. Anything else I should know? Not much, sir. Melted ice could be collected near the catapult head and must be the most massy part of what will be shipped to Luna. Quite a saving. Also, the steel canisters would be reused to ship grain to Earth, thus stopping another drain that Luna can't take. No reason why a canister should not make the trip hundreds of times. At Luna, it would be much the way barges are now landed off Bombay, solid-charge retro rockets programmed by ground control, except that it would be much cheaper, two and a half kilometer seconds change of motion versus 11 plus, a squared factor of about 20. But actually even more favorable, as retros are parasitic weight, and the payload improves accordingly. There is even a way to improve that. How? Doctor, this is outside my specialty, but everybody knows that your best ships use hydrogen as reaction mass, heated by a fusion reactor. But hydrogen is expensive in Luna, and any mass could be reaction mass. It just would not be as efficient. Can you visualize an enormous brute force space tug designed to fit lunar conditions? It would use raw rock, vaporized, as reaction mass, and would be designed to go up into parking orbit, pick up those shipments from Terra, bring them down to Luna's surface. It would be ugly, all the fancy stripped away. Might not be manned even by a cyborg. It can be piloted from the ground by computer. Yes, I suppose such a ship could be designed. But let's not complicate things. Have you covered the essentials about this catapult? I believe so, Doctor. The site is the crucial thing. Take that peak Nunda Davy. By the maps I have seen, it appears to have a long, very high ridge sloping to the west for about the length of our catapult. If that is true, it would be ideal. Less to cut away, less to bridge. I don't mean that it is the ideal site, but that is the sort to look for. A very high peak with a long, long ridge west of it. I understand, Dr. John said abruptly. Next few weeks I repeated that in a dozen countries, always in private and with implication that it was secret. All that changed was name of mountain. In Ecuador I pointed out that Chimborazo was almost on equator, ideal. But in Argentina, I emphasized that their Aconcagua was highest peak in Western Hemisphere. In Bolivia, I noted that Alto Plano was as high as Tibetan Plateau, almost true, much nearer equator, and offered a wide choice of sites for easy construction leading up to peaks comparable to any on Terra. I talked to a North American who was a political opponent of that chum who had called us rabble. I pointed out that while Mount McKinley was comparable to anything in Asia or South America, there was much to be said for Mauna Loa, extreme ease of construction, doubling G's to make it short enough to fit, and Hawaii would be spaceport of world, whole world, 
So we talked about a day when Mars would be exploited and freight for three, possibly four planets would channel through their big island. Never mentioned Mauna Loa's volcanic nature. Instead, I noted that location permitted an aborted load to splash harmlessly in Pacific Ocean. In Sov Union was only one peak discussed, Lenin, over 7,000 meters, and rather too close to their big neighbor. Kilimanjaro, Popocatapetl, Logan, El Libertado. My favorite peak changed by country. All that we required was that it be highest mountain in hearts of locals. I found something good to say about modest mountains of Chad when we were entertained there and rationalized so well I almost believed it. Other times, with help of leading questions from Stu Lejoie's stooges, I talked about chemical engineering, of which I know nothing but had memorized facts, on surface of Luna, where endless free vacuum and sun power and limitless raw materials and predictable conditions permitted ways of processing expensive or impossible Earthside. When day arrived, that cheap shipping both ways made it profitable to exploit Luna's virgin resources. It was always a suggestion that entrenched bureaucracy of lunar authority had failed to see great potential of Luna. True. Plus answer to a question always asked, which answer asserted that Luna could accept any number of colonists. This also was true, although never mentioned that Luna, yes, and sometimes Luna's loonies, killed about half of new chums. But people we talked to rarely thought of emigrating themselves. They thought of forcing or persuading others to emigrate to relieve crowding and to reduce their own taxes. Kept mouths shut about fact that half-fed swarms we saw everywhere did breed faster than even catapulting could offset. We could not house, feed, and train even a million new chums each year, and a million wasn't a drop on Terra. More babies than that were conceived every night. We could accept far more than would emigrate voluntarily, but if they used forced emigration and flooded us, Luna has only one way to deal with a new chum. Either he makes not one fatal mistake in personal behavior or in coping with environment that will bite without warning, or he winds up as fertilizer in a tunnel farm. All that immigration in huge numbers could mean would be that a larger percentage of immigrants would die too few of us to help them pass to natural hazards. However, Prof did most talking about Luna's great future. I talked about catapults. During weeks we waited for committee to recall us, we covered much ground. Stu's men had things set up, and only question was how much we could take. We'd guess that every week on Terra chopped a year off our lives, maybe more for Prof. But he never complained, and was always ready to be charming at one more reception. We spent extra time in North America, date of our Declaration of Independence, exactly 300 years after that of North American British colonies, turned out to be wizard propaganda, and Stu's manipulators made most of it. North Americans are sentimental about the United States, even though it ceased to mean anything once their continent had been rationalized by FN. They elect a president every eight years. Why, could not say. Why do British still have Queen? and boast of being sovereign. Sovereign, like love, means anything you want it to mean. It's a word in dictionary between sober and sozzled. Sovereignty meant much in North America, and Fourth of July was a magic date. Fourth of July League handled our appearances, and Stu told us that it had not cost much to get it moving, and nothing to keep going. League even raised money used elsewhere. North Americans enjoy giving, no matter who gets it. Farther south, Stu used another date. His people planted idea that coup d'etat had been 5 May instead of two weeks later. We were greeted with, Cinco de Mayo, Libertad, Cinco de Mayo. I thought they were saying thank you. Prof did all talking. But in Fourth of July country, I did better. Stu had me quit wearing a left arm in public. Sleeves of my costumes were sewed up so that stump could not be missed, and word was passed that I had lost it fighting for freedom. Whenever I was asked about it, all I did was smile and say, see what comes of biting nails, then change subject. I never liked North America, even first trip. It is not most crowded part of Terra, has a mere billion people. 
In Bombay, they sprawl on pavements. In Great New York, they pack them vertically. Not sure anyone sleeps. Was glad to be an invalid's chair. Is mixed up place another way. They care about skin color. By making point of how they don't care. First trip, I was always too light or too dark. And somehow blamed either way. Or was always being expected to take stand on things I have no opinions on. Bog knows I don't know what genes I have. One grandmother came from a part of Asia where invaders passed through as regularly as locusts, raping as they went. Why not ask her? Learned to handle it by my second Mickey Lerney, but it left a sour taste. Think I prefer a place as openly racist as India, where if you aren't Hindu, you're nobody, except that Parsis look down on Hindus and vice versa. However, I never really had to cope with North America's reverse racism when being Colonel O'Kelly Davis, hero of lunar freedom. We had swarms of bleeding hearts around us, anxious to help. I let them do two things for me, things I had never had time, money, or energy for as a student. I saw Yankees play and visited Salem. Should have kept my illusions. Baseball is better over video. You can really see it and aren't pushed in by 200,000 other people. Besides, somebody should have shot that outfield. I spent most of that game dreading moment when they would have to get my chair out through crowd, that an assuring host that I was having a wonderful time. Salem was just a place, no worse and no better than rest of Boston. After seeing it, I suspected they had hanged wrong witches. But day wasn't wasted. I was filmed laying a wreath on a place where a bridge had been in another part of Boston, conquered, and made a memorized speech. Bridge is still there, actually. You can see it down through glass. Not much of a bridge. Prof enjoyed it all, rough as it was on him. Prof had great capacity for enjoying. He always had something new to tell about great future of Luna. In New York, he gave managing director of a hotel chain, one with rabbit trademark, a sketch of what could be done with resorts in Luna. Once excursion rates were within reach of more people, visits too short to hurt anyone, escort service included, exotic side trips, gambling, no taxes. Last point grabbed attention, so Prof expanded it into longer old age theme, a chain of retirement hostels where an earthworm could live on Terran old age pension and go on living twenty, thirty, forty years longer than on Terra. As an exile, but which was better, a live old age in Luna or a funeral crypt on Terra? His descendants could pay visits and fill those resort hotels. Prof embellished with pictures of nightclubs with acts impossible in Terra's horrible gravity, sports to fit our decent level of gravitation, even talked about swimming pools and ice skating and possibility of flying, thought he had tripped his safeties. He finished by hinting that Swiss cartel had tied it up. Next day he was telling Foreign Divisions Manager of Chase International Panagra that a Luna City branch should be staffed with paraplegics, paralytics, heart cases, amputees, others who found high gravity a handicap. Manager was a fat man who wheezed. He may have been thinking of it personally, but his ears pricked up at no taxes. We didn't have it all our own way. News was often against us, and were always hecklers. Whenever I had to take them on without Prof's help, I was likely to get tripped. One man tackled me on Prof's statement to committee that we owned grain grown in Luna. He seemed to take it for granted that we did not. Told him I did not understand question. He answered, Isn't it true, Colonel, that your provisional government has asked for membership in Federated Nations? Should have answered no comment, but fell for it and agreed. Very well, he said. The impediment seems to be the counterclaim that the moon belongs to the Federated Nations, as it always has, under supervision of the Lunar Authority. Either way, by your own admission, that grain belongs to the Federated Nations in trust. I asked how he reached that conclusion. He answered, Colonel, you style yourself Undersecretary of Foreign Affairs. Surely you are familiar with the Charter of the Federated Nations. I had skimmed it. Reasonably familiar, I said. Cautiously, I thought. Then you know the first freedom guaranteed by the Charter 
and its current application through FNA Control Board Administrative Order Number 1176, dated 3 March of this year. You concede, therefore, that all grain grown on the moon in excess of the local ration is ab initio and beyond contest the property of all, title held in trust by the Federated Nations through its agencies for distribution as needed. He was writing as he talked. Have you anything to add to that concession? I said, what in Boggs' name are you talking about? Then, come back, haven't conceded anything. So, Great New York Times printed, Lunar Undersecretary says, Food belongs to Hungary. New York Today. O'Kelly Davis, Swadisant, Colonel of the Armed Forces of Free Luna, here on a junket to stir up support for the insurgents in the FN lunar colonies, said in a voluntary statement to this paper that the Freedom from Hunger clause in the Grand Charter applied to the lunar grain shipments. I asked Prof how should have handled. Always answer an unfriendly question with another question, he told me. Never ask him to clarify. He'll put words in your mouth. This reporter, was he skinny, ribs showing? No, heavy set. Not living on 1,800 calories a day, I take it which is the subject of that order he cited. Had you known, you could have asked him how long he had conformed to the ration and why he quit, or asked him what he had for breakfast, and then looked unbelieving no matter what he answered. Or, when you don't know what a man is getting at, let your counter-question shift the subject to something you do want to talk about. Then, no matter what he answers, make your point and call on someone else. Logic does not enter into it. Just tactics. Prof, nobody here is living on 1,800 calories a day. Bombay, maybe, not here. Less than that in Bombay. Manuel, that equal ration is a fiction. Half the food on this planet is in the black market, or is not reckoned through one ruling or another. Or they keep two sets of books and figures submitted to the FN having nothing to do with the economy. Do you think that grain from Thailand and Burma and Australia is correctly reported to the control board by Great China? I'm sure that the India representative on that food board doesn't. But India keeps quiet because she gets the lion's share from Luna, and then plays politics with hunger, a phrase you may remember, by using our grain to control her elections. Kerala had a planned famine last year. Did you see it in the news? No, because it wasn't in the news. A managed democracy is a wonderful thing, Manuel, for the managers. And its greatest strength is a free press, when free is defined as responsible, and the managers define what is irresponsible. Do you know what Luna needs most? More ice. A news system that does not bottleneck through one channel. Our friend Mike is our greatest danger. Huh? Don't you trust Mike? Manuel, on some subjects I don't trust even myself. Limiting the freedom of news just a little bit is in the same category with the classic example, a little bit pregnant. We are not yet free, nor will we be, as long as anyone, even our ally Mike, controls our news. Some day I hope to own a newspaper independent of any source or channel. I would happily set print by hand like Benjamin Franklin. I gave up. Prof, suppose these talks fail and grain shipments stop. What happens? People back home will be vexed with us, and many here on Terra would die. Have you read Malthus? Don't think so. Many would die. Then a new stability would be reached with somewhat more people, more efficient people, and better fed. This planet isn't crowded, it is just mismanaged, and the unkindest thing you can do for a hungry man is to give him food. Give. Read Malthus. It is never safe to laugh at Dr. Malthus. He always has the last laugh. A depressing man. I'm glad he's dead. But don't read him until this is over. Too many facts hamper a diplomat, especially an honest one. I'm not especially honest. But you have no talent for dishonesty, so your refuge must be ignorance and stubbornness. 
You have the latter. Try to preserve the former for the nonce. That Uncle Bernardo was terribly tired. I said, sorry, and wheeled out of his room. Prof was hitting too hard a pace. I would have been willing to quit if would ensure his getting into a ship and out of that gravity. But traffic stayed one way, grain barges, naught else. But Prof had fun. As I left and waved lights out, noticed again a toy he had bought, one that delighted him like a kid on Christmas, a brass cannon, a real one from sailing ship days, was small, barrel about half a meter long, and massing with wooden carriage only kilos fifteen. A signal gun, Miss Papers said, reeked of ancient history, pirates, men, walking plank. A pretty thing, but I asked Prof why. If we ever managed to leave, price to lift that mast to Luna would hurt. I was resigned to abandoning a pea suit with years more wear in it, abandon everything but two left arms and a pair of shorts. If pressed, might give up social arm. If very pressed, would skip shorts. He reached out and stroked shiny barrel. Manuel, once there was a man who held a political make-work job like so many here in this directorate, shining brass cannon around a courthouse. Why would courthouse have cannon? Never mind. He did this for years. It fed him and let him save a bit. But he was not getting ahead in the world, so one day he quit his job, drew out his savings, bought a brass cannon, and went into business for himself. Sounds like idiot. No doubt. And so were we, when we tossed out the warden. Manuel, you'll outlive me. When Luna adopts a flag, I would like it to be a cannon oar, on field sable, crossed by bar-sinister gules of our proudly ignoble lineage. Do you think it could be managed? Suppose so, if you'll sketch. But why a flag? Not a flagpole in all Luna. It can fly in our hearts. A symbol for all fools so ridiculously impractical as to think they can fight City Hall. Will you remember, Manuel? Sure. That is, we'll remind you when time comes. Didn't like such talk. He had started using oxygen tent in private and would not use in public. Guess I'm ignorant and stubborn. Was both in place called Lexington, Kentucky, in central managerial area. One thing no doctrine about, no memorized answers, was life in Luna. The prof said to tell truth and emphasize homely, warm, friendly things, especially anything different. Remember, Manuel, the thousands of Terrans who have made short visits Luna are only a tiny fraction of one percent. To most people, we will be as weirdly interesting as strange animals in a zoo. Do you remember that turtle on exhibition in Old Dome? That's us. Certainly did. They wore that insect out, staring at... So when this male-female team started quizzing about family life in Luna, was happy to answer. I printed it only by what I left out. Things that aren't family life, but poor substitutes in a community overloaded with males. Luna City is homes and families mainly, dull by terror standards, but I like it. And other Warrens, much same. People who work and raise kids and gossip and find most of their fun around dinner table. Not much to tell, so I discussed anything they found interesting. Every Luna custom comes from Terra since that's where we all came from, but Terra is such a big place that a custom from Micronesia, say, may be strange in North America. This woman, can't call her lady, wanted to know about various sorts of marriage. First, was it true that one could get married without a license on Luna? I asked what a marriage license was. Her companion said, Skip it, Mildred. Pioneer societies never have marriage licenses. But don't you keep records? She persisted. Certainly, I agreed. My family keeps a family book that goes back almost to first landing at Johnson City. Every marriage, birth, death, every event of importance, not only in direct line, but all branches so far as we can keep track. And besides, is a man, a schoolteacher, going around copying old family records all over our warren, writing a history of Luna City, 
Harvey. But don't you have official records? Here in Kentucky, we have records that go back hundreds of years. Madam, we haven't lived there that long. Yes, but, well, Luna City must have a city clerk. Perhaps you call him county recorder. The official who keeps track of such things, deeds and so forth. I said, don't think so, madam. Some bookies do notary work, witnessing chops on contracts, keeping records of them. Is for people who don't read and write and can't keep own records. But never heard of one asked to keep record of marriage. Not saying couldn't happen, but haven't heard. How delightfully informal. Then this other rumor about how simple it is to get a divorce on the moon, I dare say that's true, too. No, madam. Wouldn't say divorce is simple. Too much to untangle. Mm. Take a simple example. One lady and say she has two husbands. Two? Might have more. Might have just one. Or might be complex marriage. But let's take one lady and two men is typical. She decides to divorce one. Say it's friendly, with other husband agreeing, and one she is getting rid of not making fuss. Not that it would do him any good. Okay, she divorces him. He leaves. Still leaves endless things. Men might be business partners. Co-husbands often are. Divorce may break up partnership. Money matters to settle. This three may own cubic together. And while we'll be in her name, ex-husband probably has cash coming or rent. And almost always our children to consider support and so forth. Many things. No, madam, divorce is never simple. Can divorce him in ten seconds, but may take ten years to straighten out loose ends. Isn't it much that way here? Uh, just forget I ever asked the question, Colonel. It may be simpler here. She did talk that way, but was understandable once I got programmed. Won't spell it again. But if that is a simple marriage, what is a complex one? Found self-explaining polyandries, clans, groups, lines, and less common patterns considered vulgar by conservative people such as my own family. Deal my mother set up, say, after she ticked off my old man, though didn't describe that one. Mother was always too extreme. Woman said, You have me confused. What is the difference between a line and a clan? Are quite different. Take on case. I have honor to be member of one of oldest line marriages in Luna, and in my prejudiced opinion, best. You asked about divorce. Our family has never had one, and would bet long odds never will. A line marriage increases in stability year after year, gains practice and art of getting along together, until notion of anybody leaving is unthinkable. Besides, takes unanimous decision of all wives to divorce a husband could never happen. Senior wife would never let it get that far. When on describing advantages, financial security, fine home life it gives children, fact that death of a spouse, while tragic, could never be tragedy, it was in a temporary family. Especially for children. Children simply could not be orphaned. Suppose I waxed too enthusiastic, but my family is most important thing in my life. Without them, I'm just one-armed mechanic who could be eliminated without causing a draft. Here's why it's stable, I said. Take my youngest wife, sixteen. Likely be in her eighties before a senior wife. Doesn't mean all wives senior to her will die by then. Unlikely, Anuna. Females seem to be immortal. But may all opt out of family management by then. By our family traditions, they usually do, without younger wives putting pressure on them. So Ludmilla... Ludmilla? Rusky name. From fairy tale. Miller will have over fifty years of good example before has to carry burden. She's sensible to start with, not likely to make mistakes, and if did, has other wives to steady her. Self-correcting, like a machine with proper negative feedback. A good line marriage is immortal. Expect mine to outlast me at least a thousand years, and is why shan't mind dying when time comes. Best part of me will go on living. Prof was being wheeled out. He had them stop stretcher cart and listened. I turned to him. Professor, I said, you know my family. Would mind telling this lady why it's a happy family, if you think so? It is, agreed Prof. However, I would rather make a more general remark. Dear madam, I gather that you find our lunar marriage customs somewhat exotic. Oh, I wouldn't go that far, she said hastily. Just somewhat unusual. 
They arise, as marriage customs always do, from economic necessities of the circumstances. And our circumstances are very different from those here on earth. Take the line type of marriage which my colleague has been praising, and justifiably, I assure you, despite his personal bias. I am a bachelor and have no bias. Line marriage is the strongest possible device for conserving capital and ensuring the welfare of children, the two basic societal functions for marriage everywhere, in an environment in which there is no security, neither for capital nor for children, other than that devised by individuals. Somehow human beings always cope with their environments. Line marriage is a remarkably successful invention to that end. All other lunar forms of marriage serve that same purpose, though not as well. He said good night and left. I had with me, always, a picture of my family, newest one, our wedding with Wyoming. Brides are at their prettiest, and Wyo was radiant, and the rest of us looked handsome and happy, with Grandpa tall and proud and not showing failing faculties. But was disappointed. They looked at it oddly. But man, Matthew's name was, said, Can you spare this picture, Colonel? Winced, only copy I have, and a long way from home. For a moment, I mean. Let me have it photographed. Right here, it need never leave your hands. Oh, huh. oh, certainly. Not a good picture of me, but his face I have, and did wild justice, and they just don't come prettier than Lenora. So he photographed it, and next morning they did come right into our hotel suite and woke me before time and did arrest me and take me away, wheelchair and all, and did lock me in a cell with bars for bigamy, for polygamy, for open immorality and publicly inciting others to sin. Was glad Mum couldn't see. Nineteen. Took Stu all day to get case transferred to an F.N. court and dismissed. His lawyers asked to have it tossed out on diplomatic immunity, but F.N. judges did not fall into trap, merely noted that alleged offenses had taken place outside jurisdiction of lower court, except alleged inciting, concerning which they found insufficient evidence. Aren't any F.N. laws covering marriage? Can't be. Just a rule about each nation required to give full faith and credence to marriage customs of other member nations. Out of those eleven billion people, perhaps seven billion lived where polygamy is legal, and Stu's opinion manipulators played up persecution. It gained us sympathy from people who otherwise would never have heard of us, even gained it in North America and other places where polygamy is not legal, from people who believe in live and let live. All good, because always problem was to be noticed. To most of those bee-swarm billions, Luna was nothing. Our rebellion hadn't been noticed. Stu's operators had gone to much thought to plan set up to get me arrested. Was not told until weeks later after time to cool off and see benefits. Took a stupid judge, a dishonest sheriff, and barbaric local prejudice, which I triggered with that sweet picture, for Stu admitted later that range of color in Davis' family was what got Judge angry enough to be foolish even beyond native talent for nonsense. My one consolation that Mum could not see my disgrace turned out mistaken. Pictures taken through bars and showing grim face were in every Luna paper, and write-ups used nastiest earthside stories, not larger number that deplored injustice. But should have had more faith in Mimi. She wasn't ashamed, simply wanted to go earthside and rip some people to pieces. While helped earthside, greatest good was in Luna. Loonies become more unified over the silly hoo-hoo than had ever been before. They took it personally, and Adam Cellini and Simon Jester pushed it. Loonies are easy going except on one subject, women. Every lady felt insulted by Terran news stories, so male loonies who had ignored politics suddenly discovered I was their boy. Spin ox. Old lags feel superior to those not transported. Later found self greeted by ex-cons with, Hi, jailbird. A large greeting. I was accepted but saw nothing good about it then. Pushed around, treated like cattle, fingerprinted, photographed, given food we wouldn't offer hogs, exposed to endless indignity, and only that heavy field kept me from trying to kill somebody. Had I been wearing number six arm when grabbed, might have tried. But steadied down once I was freed. An hour later, we were on way to Agra. 
had at last been summoned by committee. It felt good to be back in suite in Maharaja's palace, but eleven hours' own change in less than three did not permit rest. We went to hearing bleary-eyed and held together by drugs. Hearing was one-sided. We listened while chairman talked. Talked an hour. I'll summarize. Our preposterous claims were rejected. Lunar Authority's sacred trust could not be abandoned. Disorders on Earth's moon could not be tolerated. Moreover, recent disorders showed that authority had been too lenient. Omission was now to be corrected by an activist program, a five-year plan in which all phases of life and authority's trusteeship would be overhauled. A code of laws was being drafted. Civil and criminal courts would be instituted for benefit of client employees, which meant all persons in trust area, not just consignees with uncompleted sentences. Public schools would be established plus in doctrinal adult schools for client employees in need of same. An economic, engineering, and agricultural planning board would be created to provide fullest and most efficient use of Moon's resources and labor of client employees. An interim goal of quadrupling grain shipments in five years had been adopted as a figure easily obtainable once scientific planning of resources and labor was in effect. First phase would be to withdraw client employees from occupations found not to be productive and put them to drilling a vast new system of farm tunnels in order that hydroponics would commence in them not later than March 2078. These new giant farms would be operated by Lunar Authority, scientifically, and not left to whims of private owners. It was contemplated that this system would, by end of five-year plan, produce entire new grain quota. In meantime, client employees producing grain privately would be allowed to continue, but they would be absorbed into new system as their less efficient methods were no longer needed. The chairman looked up from papers. In short, the lunar colonies are going to be civilized and brought into managerial coordination with the rest of civilization. Distasteful as this task has been, I feel, speaking as a citizen rather than as chairman of this committee, I feel that we owe you thanks for bringing to our attention a situation so badly in need of correction. I was ready to burn his ears off. Client employees. What a fancy way to say slaves. But Prof said tranquilly, I find the proposed plans most interesting. Is one permitted to ask questions? Purely for information? For information, yes. North American member leaned forward. But don't assume that we are going to take any back talk from you cavemen, so mind your manners. You aren't in the clear on this, you know. Order, Chairman said. Proceed, Professor. This term, client employee, I find intriguing. Can it be stipulated that the majority of inhabitants of Earth's major satellite are not undischarged consignees but free individuals? Certainly, Chairman agreed blandly. All legal aspects of a new policy have been studied. With minor exceptions, some 91% of the colonists have citizenship, original or derived, in various member nations of the Federated Nations. Those who wish to return to their home countries have a right to do so. You will be pleased to learn that the authority is considering a plan under which loans for transportation can be arranged, probably under supervision of International Red Cross and Crescent. I might add that I myself am heartily backing this plan, as it renders nonsensical any talk about slave labor. He smiled smugly. I see, agreed Prof. Most humane. Has the committee or the authority pondered the fact that most, effectively all, I should say, considered the fact that inhabitants of Luna are physically unable to live on this planet? that they have undergone involuntary permanent exile through irreversible physiological changes and can never again live in comfort and health in a gravitational field six times greater than that to which their bodies have become adjusted? Scoundrel pursed lips, as if considering totally new idea. Speaking again for myself, I would not be prepared to stipulate that what you say is necessarily true. It might be true of some, might not be of others. People vary widely. Your presence here proves that it is not impossible for a lunar inhabitant to return to Earth. In any case, we have no intention of forcing anyone to return. We hope that they will choose to stay, and we hope to encourage others to emigrate to the moon. 
But these are individual choices under the freedoms guaranteed by the Great Charter. But as to this alleged physiological phenomenon, it is not a legal matter. If anyone deems it prudent, or thinks he would be happier to stay on the moon, that's his privilege. I see, sir. We are free. Free to remain in Luna and work at tasks and for wages set by you, or free to return to Earth to die. Chairman shrugged. You assume that we are villains? We're not. Why, if I were a young man, I would emigrate to the moon myself. Great opportunities. In any case, I am not troubled by your distortions. History will justify us. We're surprised at Prof. He was not fighting. Worried about him? Weeks of strain and a bad night on top? All he said was, Honorable Chairman, I assume that shipping to Luna will soon be resumed. Can passage be arranged for my colleague and myself in the first ship? For I must admit, sir, that this gravitational weakness of which I spoke is, in our cases, very real. Our mission is completed. We need to go home. Not a word about grain barges, nor about throwing rocks, nor even futility of beating a cow. Prof just sounded tired. Chairman leaned forward and spoke with grim satisfaction. Professor, that presents difficulties. To put it bluntly, you appear to be guilty of treason against the Great Charter, indeed against all humanity, and an indictment is being considered. I doubt if anything more than a suspended sentence would be invoked against a man of your age and physical condition, however. Do you think it would be prudent of us to give you passage back to the place where you committed these acts, there to stir up more mischief? Prof sighed. I understand your point. Then, sir, may I be excused? I am weary. Certainly. Hold yourself at the disposal of this committee. The hearing stands adjourned. Colonel Davis? Sir? I was directing wheelchair around to get Prof out at once. Our attendants had been sent outside. A word with you, please, in my office. Uh, looked at Prof. Eyes were closed and seemed unconscious, but he moved one finger, motioning me to him. Honorable Chairman, I'm more nurse than diplomat. I have to look after him. He's an old man. He's ill. The attendants will take care of him. Well, got as close to Prof as I could from chair, leaned over him. Prof, are you right? He barely whispered. See what he wants. Agree with him. But stall. Moments later, was alone with Chairman, soundproof door locked, meant nothing. Room could have a dozen years, plus one in my left arm. He said, a drink? Coffee? I answered, no, thank you, sir. Have to watch my diet here. I suppose so. Are you really limited to that chair? You look healthy. I said, I could, if had to, get up and walk across room. Might faint, or worse. Prefer not to risk. Weigh six times what I should. Heart's not used to it. I suppose so. Colonel, I hear you had some silly trouble in North America. I'm sorry. I truly am. Barbaric place. Always hate to have to go there. I suppose you're wondering why I wanted to see you. No, sir. Assume you'll tell when suits you. Instead, was wondering why you still call me Colonel. He gave a barking laugh. Habit, I suppose. A lifetime of protocol. Yet it might be well for you to continue with that title. Tell me, what do you think of our five-year plan? Thought it stunk. Seems to have been carefully thought out. Much thought went into it. Colonel, you seem to be a sensible man. I know you are. I know not only your background, but practically every word you've spoken, almost your thoughts ever since you set foot on Earth. You were born on the moon. Do you regard yourself as a patriot of the moon? Suppose so, though tend to think of what we did just as something that had to be done. Between ourselves, yes, that old fool Hobart. Colonel, that is a good plan, but lacks an executive. If you are really a patriot, or let's say a practical man with your country's best interests at heart, you might be the man to carry it out. He held up a hand. Don't be hasty. 
I'm not asking you to sell out, turn traitor, or any nonsense like that. This is your chance to be a real patriot, not some phony hero who gets himself killed in a lost cause. Put it this way. Do you think it is possible for the lunar colonies to hold out against all the force that the federated nations of Earth can bring to bear? You're not really a military man, I know, and I'm glad you're not. But you are a technical man, and I know that too. In your honest estimation, how many ships and bombs do you think it would take to destroy the lunar colonies? I answered, one ship, six bombs. Correct. My God, it's good to talk to a sensible man. Two of them would have to be awfully big, perhaps specially built. A few people would stay alive for a while in smaller warren beyond the blast areas. But one ship would do it in ten minutes. I said, conceded, sir, but Professor de la Paz pointed out that you don't get milk by beating a cow, and certainly can't by shooting it. Why do you think we've held back? done nothing for over a month. That idiot colleague of mine, I won't name him, spoke of back-talk. Back-talk doesn't fret me. It's just talk, and I'm interested in results. No, my dear Colonel, we won't shoot the cow. But we would, if forced to, let the cow know that it could be shot. H-missiles are expensive toys, but we could afford to expend some as warning shots, wasted on bare rock to let the cow know what could happen. But that is more force than one likes to use. It might frighten the cow and sour its milk. He gave another barking laugh. Better to persuade old Bossy to give down willingly. I waited. Don't you want to know how? He asked. How? I agreed. Through you. Don't say a word and let me explain. He took me up on that high mountain and offered me kingdoms of Earth, or of Luna. Take job of protector pro tem, with understanding was mine permanently if I could deliver. Convince loonies they could not win. Convince them that this new setup was to their advantage. Emphasize benefits, free schools, free hospitals, free this and that. Details later, but an everywhere government, just like on Terra. Taxes starting low and handled painlessly by automatic check-off and through kickback revenues from grain shipments. But most important, this time authority would not send a boy to do a man's job. Two regiments of police at once. Those damned peace dragoons were a mistake, he said. One we won't make again. Between ourselves, the reason it has taken us a month to work this out is that we had to convince the Peace Control Commission that a handful of men cannot police three million people spread through six largish warrens and fifty and more small ones. So you'll start with enough police, not combat troops, but military police used to quelling civilians with a minimum of fuss. Besides that, this time they'll have female auxiliaries, the standard ten percent. No more rape complaints. Well, sir, think you can swing it? Knowing it's best in the long run for your own people? I said I ought to study it in detail, particularly plans and quotas for five-year plan, rather than make snap decision. Certainly, certainly, he agreed. I'll give you a copy of the white paper we've made up. Take it home, study it, sleep on it. Tomorrow we'll talk again. Just give me your word as a gentleman to keep it under your hair. No secret, really. But these things are best settled before they are publicized. Speaking of publicity, you'll need help, and you'll get it. We'll go to the expense of sending up top-notch men, pay them what it's worth, have them centrifuge the way those scientists do. You know, this time we're doing it right. That fool Hobart. He's actually dead, isn't he? No, sir. Senile, however. Should have killed him. Here's your copy of the plan. Sir, speaking of old men, Professor de la Paz can't stay here. Wouldn't live six months. That's best, isn't it? I tried to answer levelly. You don't understand. He is greatly loved and respected. Best thing would be for me to convince him that you mean business with those H-missiles, and that it is his patriotic duty to salvage what we can. But either way, if I return without him... Well, not only could not swing it, wouldn't live long enough to try. Hmm. 
Sleep on it. We'll talk tomorrow, say fourteen o'clock. I left, and as soon as was loaded into lorry, gave way to shakes. Just don't have high-level approach. Stu was waiting with Prof. Well, said Prof. I glanced around, tapped ear. We huddled, heads over Prof's head and two blankets over us all. Stretcher wagon was clean, and so was my chair. I checked them each morning, but for room itself seemed safer to whisper under blankets. I started in. Prof stopped me. Discuss his ancestry and habits later. The facts. He offered me a job of warden. I trust you accepted. Ninety percent. I'm to study this garbage and give answer tomorrow. Stu, how fast can we execute Plan Scoot? Started. We were waiting for you to return, if they let you return. Next fifty minutes were busy. Stu produced a gaunt Hindu and a doti. In thirty minutes, he was a twin of Prof, and Stu lifted Prof off wagon onto a divan. Duplicating me was easier. Our doubles were wheeled into Sweet's living room just at dusk, and dinner was brought in. Several people came and went. Among them, elderly Hindu woman in sari, on arm of Stuart Lejoie, a plump babu followed them. Getting Prof up steps to roof was worst. He had never worn powered walkers, had no chance to practice, and had been flat on back for more than a month. But Stu's arm kept him steady. I gritted teeth and climbed those thirteen terrible steps by myself. By the time I reached roof, heart was ready to burst. Was put to it not to black out. A silent little flitter craft came out of gloom right on schedule, and ten minutes later we were in chartered ship we had used past month. Two minutes after that we jetted for Australia. Don't know what it cost to prepare this dance and keep it ready against need, but was no hitch. Stretched out by Prof and caught breath, and said, "How you feel, Prof? Okay, a bit tired, frustrated. Yeah, da, frustrated." Over not seeing the Taj Mahal, I mean. I never had opportunity as a young man, and here I've been within a kilometer of it twice, once for several days, now for another day, and still I haven't seen it, and never shall. Just a tomb, and Helen of Troy was just a woman. Sleep, lad. We landed in Chinese half of Australia, a place called Darwin, and were carried straight into a ship. Placed in acceleration couches and dosed. Prof was already out, and I was beginning to feel dopey when Stu came in, grinned, and strapped down by us. I looked at him. Here too. Who's minding shop? The same people who have been doing the real work all along. It's a good setup and doesn't need me any longer. Many old copper. I did not want to be marooned a long way from home. Luna, I mean, in case you have doubts. This looks like the last train from Shanghai. What Shanghai got to do with it? Forget I mentioned it. Manny, I'm flat broke, concave. I owe money in all directions. Debts that will be paid only if certain stocks move the way Adam Serini convinced me they would move. Shortly after this point in history, and I'm wanted or will be for offences against the public peace and dignity. Put it this way: I'm saving them the trouble of transporting me. Do you think I can learn to be a drill man at my age? Was feeling foggy, drug taking hold. Still, and Luna yard old, barely started anyway. Eat our table forever. Mimi likes you. Thanks, Cobber. I might. Morning light. Deep breath. Suddenly was kicked by ten G. Twenty. Our craft was ground to orbit ferry type, used for manned satellites for supplying FN ships and patrol orbit. And for passengers to and from pleasure and gambling satellites, she was carrying three passengers instead of forty. No cargo except three pea suits and a brass cannon. Yes,、yeah, silly toy was along. Pea suits and profs bang bang were in Australia a week before we were, and good ship Lark had been stripped. Total crew was skipper and a cyborg pilot. She was heavily overfueled. We made, was told, normal approach on Elysium satellite. Then suddenly scooted from orbital speed to escape speed, a change even more violent than liftoff. This was scanned by FN Skytrack. We were commanded to stop and explain. 
I got this second hand from Stu, self still recovering and enjoying luxury of no G with one strap to anchor. Prof was still out. So they want to know who we are and what we think we are doing, Stu told me. We told them that we were Chinese registry Skywagon opening Lotus, bound on an errand of mercy to wit, rescuing those scientists marooned on the moon, and gave our identification as opening Lotus. How about transponder? Manny, if I got what I paid for, our transponder identified us as the Lark up to ten minutes ago, and now has ID'd us as the Lotus. Soon we will know. Just one ship is in position to get a missile off, and it must blast us in... He stopped to look. Another twenty-seven minutes, according to the wired-up gentleman booting this bucket, or its chances of getting us are poor to zero. So if it worries you, if you have prayers to say, or messages to send, or whatever it is one does at such times, now is the time. Think we ought to rouse Prof? Let him sleep? Can you think of a better way to make the jump than from peaceful sleep instantaneously into a cloud of radiant gas? Unless you know that he has religious necessities to attend to. He never struck me as a religious man, author doctrinally speaking. He's not. But if you have such duties, don't let me keep you. Thank you. I took care of what seemed necessary before we left the ground. How about yourself, Manny? I am not much of a padre, but I'll do my best if I can help. Any sins on your mind, old Gava? If you need to confess, I know quite a little about sin. Told him my needs do not run that way. Then did recall sins, some I cherished, and gave him a version more or less true. That reminded him of some of his own, which reminded me. Zero time came and went before we ran out of sins. Stu Lejoie is a good person to spend last minutes with, even if don't turn out to be last. We had two days with naught to do but undergo drastic routines to keep us from carrying umpteen plagues to Luna, but didn't mind shaking from induced chills and burning with fever. Free fall was such a relief and was so happy to be going home. Or almost happy. Prof asked what was troubling me. Nothing, I said. Can't wait to be home. But truth is, ashamed to show face after we failed. Prof, what did we do wrong? Failed, my boy? Don't see what else can call it. Ask to be recognized. Not what we got. Manuel, I owe you an apology. You will recall Adam Cellini's projection of our chances just before we left home. Stu was not an earshot, but Mike was word we never used. It was always Adam Cellini for security. Certainly do. One in fifty-three. Then when we reached Earthside, dropped to reeking one in a hundred. What you guess it is now, why in thousand? I've had new projections every few days, which is why I owe you an apology. The last, received just before we left, included the then untested assumption that we would escape, get clear of terror, and home safely. Or that at least one of us three would make it, which is why Comrade Stu was summoned home, he having a Terran's tolerance of high acceleration, Eight projections, in fact, ranging from three of us dead, through various combinations up to three surviving. Would you care to stake a few dollars on what that last projection is, setting a bracket and naming your own odds? I'll give a hint. You are far too pessimistic. The... No, damn it, just tell. The odds against us are now only seventeen to one. And they've been shortening all month, which I couldn't tell you was amazed, delighted, overjoyed, hurt. What do you mean, couldn't tell me? Look, Prof, if not trusted, deal me out and put Stu in executive cell. Please, son, that's where he will go if anything happens to any of us, you, me, or dear Wyoming. I could not tell you, Earthside, and can tell you now, not because you aren't trusted, but because you are no actor. You could carry out your role more effectively if you believed that our purpose was to achieve recognition of independence. Now, he tells. Manual, manual. We had to fight hard every instant. And lose. So? A big enough boy to be told? Please, Manuel. Keeping you temporarily in the dark greatly enhanced our chances. You can check this with Adam. 
May I add that Stuart accepted his summons to Luna blithely, without asking why? Comrade, that committee was too small, its chairman too intelligent. There was always the hazard that they might offer an acceptable compromise. That first day there was grave danger of it. Had we been able to force our case before the Grand Assembly there would have been no danger of intelligent action. But we were balked. The best I could do was to antagonize the committee, even stooping to personal insult to make certain of at least one holdout against common sense. Guess I never will understand high-level approach. Possibly not. But your talents and mine complement each other. Manuel, you wish to see Luna free. You know I do. You also know that Terra can defeat us. Sure, no projection ever gave anything close to even money. So don't see why you set out to antagonize. Please, since they can inflict their will on us, our only chance lies in weakening their will. That was why we had to go to Terra, to be divisive, to create many opinions. The shrewdest of the great generals in China's history once said that perfection in war lay in so sapping the opponent's will that he surrenders without fighting. In that maxim lies both our ultimate purpose and our most pressing danger. Suppose, as seemed possible that first day, we had been offered an inviting compromise, a governor in place of a warden, possibly from our own number, local autonomy, a delegate in the Grand Assembly, a higher price for grain at the catapult head, plus a bonus for increased shipments. A disavowal of Hobart's policies, combined with an expression of regret over the rape and the killings, with handsome cash settlements to the victim survivors. Would it have been accepted back home? They did not offer that. The chairman was ready to offer something like it that first afternoon, and at that time he had his committee in hand. He offered us an asking price close enough to permit such a dicker. Assume that we reached in substance what I outlined. Would it have been acceptable at home? Hmm, maybe. More than a maybe, but a bleak projection made just before we left home. It was the thing to be avoided at any cost. A settlement which would quiet things down, destroy our will to resist without changing any essential in the longer-range prediction of disaster. So I switched the subject, and squelched possibility by being difficult about irrelevancies and politely offensive. Manuel, you and I know, and Adam knows, that there must be an end to food shipments. Nothing less will save Luna from disaster. But can you imagine a wheat farmer fighting to end those shipments? No. Wonder if can pick up news from home on how they're taking stoppage. There won't be any. Here is how Adam has timed it, Manuel. No announcement is to be made on either planet until after we get home. We are still buying wheat. Barges are still arriving at Bombay. You told them shipments would stop at once. That was a threat, not a moral commitment. A few more loads won't matter, and we need time. We don't have everyone on our side. We have only a minority. There is a majority who don't carry the way, but can be swayed temporarily. We have another minority against us, especially grain farmers whose interest is never politics but the price of wheat. They are grumbling but accepting scrip, hoping it will be worth face value later. But the instant we announce that shipments have stopped, they will be actively against us. Adam plans to have the majority committed to us at the time the announcement is made. How long? One year, two? Two days. Three days. Perhaps four. Carefully edited excerpts from that five-year plan, excerpts from the recordings you've made, especially that yellow dog offer, exploitation of your arrest in Kentucky. Hey, I'd rather forget that. Prof smiled and cocked an eyebrow. Uh, I said uncomfortably. Okay, if we'll help. It will help more than any statistics about natural resources. Wired up ex-human piloting us went in as one maneuver without bothering to orbit and gave us even heavier beating. Ship was light and lively. But change in motion is under two and a half kilometers, was over in 19 seconds, and we were down at Johnson City. 
I took it right, just a terrible constriction in chest and a feeling as if giant was squeezing heart. Then was over, and I was gasping back to normal and glad to be proper weight. But did almost kill poor old Prof. Mike told me later that pilot refused to surrender control. Mike would have brought ship down in a low G, no break a egg, knowing Prof was aboard. But perhaps that cyborg knew what he was doing. A low G landing wastes mass, and Lotus Lark grounded almost a dry. None of which we cared about, as looked as if that garrison landing had wasted Prof. Stu saw it while I was still gasping. Then we were both at him, heart stimulant, manual respiration, massage. At last he fluttered eyelids, looked at us, smiled. Home, he whispered. We made him rest twenty minutes before we let him suit up to leave ship. Had been as near dead as can be and not hear angels. Skipper was filling tanks, anxious to get rid of us and take on passengers. That Dutchman never spoke to us whole trip. Think he regretted letting money talk him into a trip that could ruin or kill him. By then, Wire was inside ship, pea-suited, to come eat us. Don't think Stu had ever seen her in a pea-suit, and certain he had never seen her as a blonde. Did not recognize. I was hugging her in spite of pea-suit. He was standing by, waiting to be introduced. Then strange man in pea-suit hugged him. He was surprised. Heard Wiles' muffled voice. Oh, heavens! Manny, my helmet! I unclamped it, lifted off. She shook curls and grinned. Stu, aren't you glad to see me? Don't you know me? A grin spread over his face, slowly as dawn across Maria. Strasvutje, Gospaja. I am most happy to see you. Gospaja, indeed. I'm wio to you, dear, always. Didn't Manny tell you I'd gone back to Blonde? Yes, he did. But knowing it and seeing it are not the same. You'll get used to it. She stopped to bend over Prof, kiss him, giggle at him, then straightened up and gave me a no-helmet welcome home that left us both with tears despite pesky suit. Then turned again to Stu, started to kiss him. He held back a little. She stopped. Stu, am I going to have to put on brown makeup to welcome you? Stu glanced at me, then kissed her. Wyo put in as much time and thought as she had to welcoming me. Was later I figured out his odd behavior. Stu, despite commitment, was still not a loony. And in meantime, Wyo had married. What's that got to do with it? Well, Earth's side, it makes a difference. And Stu did not know deep down in bones that a loony lady is own mistress. Poor chum thought I might take offense. We got Prof into suit, ourselves same, and left me with cannon under arm. Once underground and locked through, we unsuited, and I was flattered to see that Wyo was wearing crushed under pea suit that red dress I bought her ages ago. She brushed it and skirt flared out. Immigration room was empty, save for about forty men lined up along wall like new transportees, wearing pea suits and carrying helmets. Terrans going home, stranded tourists and some scientists. Their pea suits would not go, would be unloaded before lift. I looked at them and thought about cyborg pilot. When Lark had been stripped, all but three couches had been removed. These people were going to take acceleration lying on floor plates. If Skipper was not careful, he was going to have mashed Terrans al blut. Mentioned to Stu. Forget it. He said, Captain Lewis has foam pads aboard. He won't let them be hurt. They're his life insurance. 21. My family, all thirty-odd, from grandpa to babies, was waiting beyond next lock on level below, and we got cried on and slobbered on and hugged, and this time Stu did not hold back. Little Hazel made ceremony of kissing us. She had liberty caps, set one on each, then kissed us, and at that signal whole family put on liberty caps, and I got sudden tears. Perhaps is what patriotism feels like, choked up and so happy it hurts, or maybe it was just being with my beloveds again. Where's Slim? I asked Hazel. Wasn't he invited? Couldn't come. He's junior marshal of your reception. Reception? This is all we want. You'll see. Did. Good thing family came out to meet us. That and ride to L City 
filled a capsule, were all I saw of them for some time. Tube Station West was a howling mob, all in liberty caps. We three were carried on shoulders all way to Old Dome, surrounded by a Stilyagi bodyguard, elbows locked to force through cheering, singing crowds. Boys were wearing red caps and white shirts, and their girls wore white jumpers and red shorts, color of caps. At station, and again, when they put us down in Old Dome, I got kissed by femmes I have never seen before or since. Remember hoping that measures we had taken in lieu of quarantine were effective, or half of El City would be down with colds or worse. Apparently we were clean, was no epidemic. But I remember time was quite small, when measles got loose and thousands died. Worried about Prof, too. Reception was too rough for a man good as dead an hour earlier. But he not only enjoyed it, he made a wonderful speech in Old Dome, one short on logic, loaded with ringing phrases. Love was in it, and home, and Luna, and comrades, and neighbors, and even shoulder to shoulder, and all sounded good. They had erected a platform under Big News Video on South Face. Adam Cellini greeted us from video screen, and now Prof's face and voice were projected from it, much magnified, over his head, did not have to shout but did have to pause after every sentence. Crowd roars drowned out even bull voice from screen, and no doubt pauses helped as rest. But Prof no longer seemed old, tired, ill. Being back inside the rock seemed to be tonic he needed. And me too. Was wonderful to be right weight, feel strong, breathe pure, replenished air of own city. No mean city. Impossible to get all of El City inside Old Dome, but looked as if they tried. I estimated an area ten meters square, tried to count heads, got over two hundred, not half through, and gave up. Lunatic placed crowd at thirty thousand. Seems impossible. Prof's words reached more nearly three million. Video carried scene to those who could not crowd into Old Dome. Cable and relay flashed it across lonely Maria to all Warrens. He grabbed a chance to tell of slave future authority planned for them waved that white paper. Here it is, he cried. Your fetters, your leg irons. Will you wear them? No. They say you must. They say they will H-bomb. Then survivors will surrender and put on these chains. Will you? No, never. Never, agreed Prof. They threatened to send troops. More and more troops to rape and murder. We shall fight them. Da! Ah! We shall fight them on the surface. We shall fight them in the tubes. We shall fight them in the corridors. If die, we must. We shall die free. Yes. Ya. Yeah. Da! Tell them. Tell them. And if we die, let history write. This was Luna's finest hour. Give us liberty, or give us death. Some of that sounded familiar, but his words came out fresh and new. I joined in roars. Look, I knew we couldn't whip Terra. I'm tech by trade and know that an H-missile doesn't care how brave you are. But was ready, too. If they wanted a fight, let's have it. Prof let them roar, then led them in Battle Hymn of the Republic, Simon's version. Adam appeared on screen again, took over leading it, and sang with him, and we tried to slip away off back of platform, with help of Stilyagi, led by Slim. But women didn't want to let us go, and lads aren't at their best in trying to stop ladies. They broke through. Was 2200 before we four, Wyo, Prof, Stu, Self, were locked in room L of Raffles, where Adam Mike joined us by video. I was starved by then, all were. So I ordered dinner, and Prof insisted that we eat before reviewing plans. Then we got down to business. Adam started by asking me to read aloud white paper, for his benefit and for Comrade Wyoming. But first, Comrade Manuel, if you have the recordings you made Earthside, could you transmit them by phone at high speed to my office? I'll have them transcribed for study. All I have so far are the coded summaries Comrade Stewart sent up. I did, sir, knowing Mike would study them at once. Phrasing was part of 
Adam Cellini myth, and decided to talk to Prof about letting Stu in on facts. If Stu was to be an executive cell, pretending was too clumsy. Feeding recordings into Mike at overspeed took five minutes, reading aloud another thirty. That done, Adam said, Professor, the reception was more successful than I had counted on, due to your speech. I think we should push the embargo through Congress at once. I can send out a call tonight for a session at noon tomorrow. Comments? I said, Look, those yammerheads will kick it around for weeks. If you must put it up to them, can't see why. Do as you did with declaration. Start late, jam it through after midnight, using own people. Adam said, Sorry, Emmanuel. I'm getting caught up on events Earthside, and you have catching up to do here. It's no longer the same group. Comrade Wyoming? Manny, dear, it's an elected Congress now. They must pass it. Congress is what government we have. I said slowly, You held election and turned things over to them? Everything? Then what are we doing? Looked at Prof, expecting explosion. My objections would not be on his grounds, but couldn't see any use in swapping one talk-talk for another. At least the first group had been so loose we could pack it. This new group would be glued to seats. Prof was undisturbed, fitted fingertips together and looked relaxed. Manuel, I don't think the situation is as bad as you seem to feel that it is. In each age, it is necessary to adapt to the popular mythology. At one time, kings were anointed by deity, so the problem was to see to it that deity anointed the right candidate. In this age, the myth is the will of the people. But the problem changes only superficially. Comrade Adam and I have had long discussions about how to determine the will of the people. I venture to suggest that this solution is one we can work with. Well, okay, but why weren't we told? Stu, did you know? No, Manny. There was no reason to tell me. He shrugged. I'm a monarchist. I wouldn't have been interested. But I go along with Prof that in this day and age... Elections are a necessary ritual. Prof said, Manuel, it wasn't necessary to tell us till we got back. You and I had other work to do. Comrade Adam and dear Comrade Wyoming handled it in our absence. So let's find out what they did before we judge what they've done. Sorry. Well, Wyo? Manny, we didn't leave everything to chance. Adam and I decided that a Congress of 300 would be about right. Then we spent hours going over the party lists, plus prominent people not in the party. At last, we had a list of candidates, a list that included some from the ad hoc Congress. Not all were yammerheads. We included as many as we could. Then Adam phoned each one and asked him or her if he would serve, binding him to secrecy in the meantime. Some we had to replace. When we were ready, Adam spoke on video, announced that it was time to carry out the party's pledge of free elections, set a date, said that everybody over sixteen could vote, and that all anyone had to do to be a candidate was to get a hundred chops on a nominating petition and post it in Old Dome, or the public notice place for his warren. Oh, yes, thirty temporary election districts, ten congressmen from each district. That let all but the smallest warrens be at least one district. So you had it lined up, and party ticket went through? Oh, no, dear. There wasn't any party ticket, officially. But we were ready with our candidates. And I must say, my Stilyagi did a smart job getting chops on nominations. Our optings were posted the first day. Many other people posted. There were over 2,000 candidates. But there was only 10 days from announcement to election, and we knew what we wanted, whereas the opposition was split up. It wasn't necessary for Adam to come out publicly and endorse candidates. It worked out. You won by 7,000 votes, dear, while your nearest rival got less than a 1,000. I won, you won, I won, Professor won, Conrad Clayton won, and just about everybody we thought should be in the Congress. It wasn't hard. Although Adam never endorsed anyone, I didn't hesitate to let our comrades know who was favored. Simon poked his finger in, too, and we do have good connections with newspapers. 
I wish you had been here election night watching the results. Exciting. How did you go about nose counting? Never known how election works. Write names on a piece of paper? Oh, no, we used a better system. Because, after all, some of our best people can't write. We used banks for voting places, with bank clerks identifying customers and customers identifying members of their families and neighbors who don't have bank accounts. And people voted orally, and the clerks punched the votes into the bank's computers with the voter watching. And results were all tallied at once in Luna City Clearinghouse. We voted everybody in less than three hours, and results were printed out just minutes after voting stopped. Suddenly a light came on in my skull, and I decided to question Wyo privately. No, not Wyo. Mike. Get past his Adam Cellini dignity and hammer truth out of his neuristers. He recalled a check ten million dollars too large and wondered how many had voted for me. Seven thousand? Seven hundred? Or just my family and friends? But no longer worried about new Congress. Prof had not slipped them a cold deck, but one that was frozen solid. Then ducked Earthside while crime was committed. No use asking why, oh. She didn't even need to know what Mike had done, and could do her part better if did not suspect. Nor would anybody suspect. It was one thing all people took for granted, was conviction that if you feed honest figures into a computer, honest figures come out. Never doubted it myself till I met a computer with sense of humor. Changed mind about suggesting that Stu be let in on Mike's self-awareness. Three was too too many. Or perhaps three. My, I started to say, and changed to, My word, sounds efficient. How big did we win? Adam answered without expression, Eighty-six percent of our candidates were successful, approximately what I had expected. Approximately my false left arm. Exactly what expected, Mike old ironmongery. Withdraw objection to a noon session. I'll be there. It seems to me, said Stu, assuming that the embargo starts at once, we will need something to maintain the enthusiasm we witnessed tonight, or there will be a long, quiet period of increasing economic depression, from the embargo, I mean, and growing disillusionment. Adam, you first impressed me through your ability to make shrewd guesses as to future events. Do my misgivings make sense? They do. Well? Adam looked at us in turn, and was almost impossible to believe that this was a false image, and Mike was simply placing us through binaural receptors. Comrades, it must be turned into open war as quickly as possible. Nobody said anything. One thing to talk about war, another to face up to it. At last I sighed and said, when do we start throwing rocks? We do not start, Adam answered. They must throw the first one. How do we antagonize them into doing so? I will reserve my thoughts to the last. Comrade Manuel. Uh, don't look at me. Why, I feel would start with a nice big rock smack on Agra. A bloke there who is a waste of space. But is not what you are after. No, it is not, Adam answered seriously. You would not only anger the entire Hindu nation, a people intensely opposed to destruction of life, but you would also anger and shock people throughout Earth by destroying the Taj Mahal. Including me, said Prof. Don't talk dirty, Manuel. Look, I said, didn't say to do it. Anyhow, could miss Taj. Manuel, said Prof, as Adam pointed out, our strategy must be to antagonize them into striking the first blow, the classic Pearl Harbor maneuver of game theory, a great advantage in Weltpolitik. The question is how? Adam, I suggest that what is needed is to plant the idea that we are weak and divided, and that all it takes is a show of force to bring us back into line. Stu, your people Earthside should be useful. Suppose the Congress repudiated myself and Manuel. The effect? Oh, no, said Wyo. Oh, yes, dear Wyo. Not necessary to do it, but simply to put it over news channels to Earth. 
perhaps still better to put it over a clandestine beam attributed to the Terran scientists still with us, while our official channels display the classic stigmata of tight censorship. Adam? I'm noting it as a tactic which probably will be included in the strategy. But it will not be sufficient alone. We must be bombed. Adam, said Wyo, why do you say so? Even if Luna City can stand up under their biggest bombs, something I hope never to find out. We know that Luna can't win an all-out war. You've said so many times. Isn't there some way to work it so that they will just plain leave us alone? Adam pulled at right cheek, and I thought, Mike, if you don't knock off play-acting, you'll have me believing in you myself. I was annoyed at him and looked forward to a talk, one in which I would not have to defer to Chairman Cellini. Comrade Wyoming, he said soberly, it's a matter of game theory in a complex non-zero-sum game. We have certain resources or pieces in the game and many possible moves. Our opponents have much larger resources and a far larger spectrum of responses. Our problem is to manipulate the game so that our strength is utilized toward an Optimax solution, while inducing them to waste their superior strength and to refrain from using it at maximum. Timing is of the essence, and a gambit is necessary to start a chain of events favorable to our strategy. I realize this is not clear. I could put the factors through a computer and show you, or you can accept the conclusion or you can use your own judgment. He was reminding Wyo, under Stu's nose, that he was not Adam Cellini, but Mike, our dinkum thinkum, who could handle so complex a problem because he was a computer, and smartest one anyway. Wyo backtracked. No, no, she said. I wouldn't understand the maths. Okay, it has to be done. How do we do it? was 400 before we had a plan that suited Prof and Stu as well as Adam, or it took that long for Mike to sell his plan while appearing to pull ideas out of the rest of us. Or was it Prof's plan with Adam Cellini as salesman? In any case, we had a plan and calendar, one that grew out of master strategy of Tuesday, 14 May, 2075, and varied from it only to match events as they actually had occurred. In essence, it called for us to behave as nastily as possible, while strengthening impression that we would be awfully easy to spank. I was at Community Hall at noon, after too little sleep, and found I could have slept two hours longer. Congressmen from Hong Kong could not make it that early, despite tube or way. Wyo did not bang gavel until 14.30. Yes, my bride wife was chairman pro tem in a body not yet organized. Parliamentary rulings seemed to come naturally to her, and she was not a bad choice. A mob of loonies behaves better when a lady bangs gavel. Not going to detail what new Congress did and said that session and later. Minutes are available. I showed up only when necessary and never bothered to learn talk-talk rules. Seemed to be equal parts, common politeness, and ways in which chairman could invoke magic to do it his, her, way. No sooner had Wyo banged them to order, but a copper jumped up and said, Gospasha, chairman, move we suspend rules and hear from Comrade Professor de la Paz, which brought a whoop of approval. Wyo banged again. Motion is out of order, and member from Lower Churchill will be seated. This House recessed without adjourning, and Chairman of Committee on Permanent Organization, Resolutions, and Government Structure still has the floor. Turned out to be Wolfgang Korsakoff, member from Taika Wonder, and a member of Prof. Cell, and our number one finagler of Luna Hoko. And he not only had floor, he had it all day, yielding time as he saw fit, that is, picking out whom he wanted to speak, rather than letting just anyone talk. But nobody was too irked. Miss Mob seemed satisfied with leadership. We're noisy, but not unruly. By dinner time, Luna had a government to replace co-opted provisional government. That is, dummy government we had opted ourselves, which sent Prof and me to Earth. Congress confirmed all acts of provisional government, thus putting face on what we had done. 
thanked outgoing government for services and instructed Wolfgang's committee to continue work on permanent government structure. Prof was elected President of Congress and ex officio Prime Minister of Interim Government until we acquired a constitution. He protested age and health, then said would serve if could have certain things to help him. Too old and too exhausted from trip earthside to have responsibility of presiding, except on occasions of state. So he wanted Congress to elect a speaker and speaker pro tem. And besides that, he felt that Congress should augment its numbers by not more than 10%, by itself electing members at large, so that Prime Minister, whoever he might be, could opt cabinet members or ministers of state who might not now be members of Congress, especially ministers without portfolio, to take load off his shoulders. They balked. Most were proud of being congressmen and already jealous of status. But Prof just sat looking tired and waited, and somebody pointed out that it still left control in hands of Congress. So they gave him what he asked for. Then somebody squeezed in a speech by making it a question to chair. Everybody knew, he said, that Adam Cellini had refrained from standing for Congress on grounds that chairman of emergency committees should not take advantage of position to elbow way into new government. But could Honorable Chairlady tell member whether there was any reason not to elect Adam Cellini a member at large, as gesture of appreciation for great services? To let all Luna, yes, and all those earthworms, especially ex-Lunar ex-authority, know that we are not repudiating Adam Cellini. On contrary, he was our beloved elder statesman, and was not president simply because he chose not to be. More whoops that went on and on. You can find in minutes who made that speech, but one gets you ten. Prof wrote it, and Wyo planted it. Here is how it wound up over a course of days. Prime Minister and Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, Professor Bernardo de la Paz. Speaker, Finn Nielsen. Speaker pro tem, Wyoming Davis. Under Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs and Minister of Defense, General O'Kelly Davis. Minister of Information, Terence Sheehan. Sheeney turned Pravda over to managing editor to work with Adam and Stu. Special Minister without Portfolio in Ministry of Information, Stuart René Lejoie. Congressman at Large, Secretary of State for Economics and Finance, and Custodian of Enemy Property, Wolfgang Korsakoff. Minister of Interior Affairs and Safety, Comrade Clayton Watanabe. Minister without portfolio and special advisor to Prime Minister, Adam Cellini, plus a dozen ministers and ministers without portfolio from Warren's other than Luna City. See where that left things? Brush away fancy titles, and B-Cell was still running things as advised by Mike, backed by a Congress in which we could not lose a test vote, but did lose others we did not want to win or did not care about. But at time, could not see sense in all that talk-talk. During evening session, Prof reported on trip and then yielded to me, Committee Chairman Kosakoff, consenting, so that I could report what five-year plan meant and how authority had tried to bribe me. I'll never make a speaker, but had time during dinner break to swat speech Mike had written. He had slanted it so nastily that I got angry all over again, and was angry when I spoke and managed to make it catching. Congress was ready to riot by the time I sat down. Prof stepped forward, thin and pale, and said quietly, Comrade members, what shall we do? I suggest, Chairman Kosakoff consenting, that we discuss informally how to treat this latest insolence to our nation. One member from Nobilan wanted to declare war, and they would have done so right then if Prof had not pointed out that they were still hearing committee reports. More talk, all bitter. At last, Comrade Member Jung Jones spoke. Fellow Congressman, sorry, Gospodin Chairman Kosakov, I'm a rice and wheat farmer. Mean I used to be because back in May I got a bank loan, and sons and I are converting to variety farming. We're broke. Had to borrow tube fare to get here. But family is eating, and some day we might pull square with bank. At least I'm no longer raising grain. But others are. 
Catapult has never reduced headway by one barge all time we've been free. We're still shipping, hoping their checks will be worth something some day. But now we know. They've told us what they mean to do with us. To us! I say only way to make those scoundrels know we mean business is stop shipments right now. Not another ton, not a kilo. Until they come here and dicker honestly for honest price. Around midnight they passed embargo, then adjourned subject to call, standing committees to continue. Wyo and I went home, and I got reacquainted with my family. It was nothing to do. Mike Adam and Stu had been working on how to hit them with an earthside, and Mike had shut catapult down. Technical difficulties with ballistic computer. Twenty-four hours earlier. Last barge in trajectory would be taken by Puna ground control in slightly over one day and Earth would be told, nastily, that was last they would ever get. 22. Shock to farmers was eased by continuing to buy grain at Catapult, but checks now carried printed warning that Luna Free State did not stand behind them, did not warrant that Lunar Authority would ever redeem them even in scrip, etc., etc. Some farmers left grain anyhow, some did not. All screamed. Thought was nothing they could do. Catapult was shut down. Loading belts not moving. Depression was not immediately felt in rest of economy. Defense regiments had depleted ranks of ice miners so much that selling ice on free market was profitable. The Nahoko Steel subsidiary was hiring every able-bodied man he could find, and Wolfgang Kosakoff was ready with paper money. National dollars, printed to resemble Hong Kong dollar, and in theory pegged to it. Luna had plenty of food, plenty of work, plenty of money. People were not hurting. Beer, bedding, women, and work went on as usual. Nationals, as they were called, were inflation money, war money, fiat money, and were discounted a fraction of a percent on day of first issue, concealed as exchange service charge. They were spendable money and never did drop to zero, but were inflationary, and exchange reflected it increasingly. New government was spending money it did not have. But that was later. Challenge to Earth, to authority, and federated nations was made intentionally nasty. FN vessels were ordered to stay clear of Luna by ten diameters and not orbit at any distance, under pain of being destroyed without warning. No mention of how, since we could not. Vessels of private registry would be permitted to land if A. Permission was requested ahead of time with ballistic plan. B. A vessel thus cleared placed itself under lunar ground control, Mike, at a distance of 100,000 kilometers while following approved trajectory, and C. Was unarmed save for three handguns permitted three officers. Last was to be confirmed by inspection on landing before anybody was allowed to leave ship and before ship was serviced with fuel and or reaction mass. Violation would mean confiscation of ship. No person allowed to land at Luna other than ship's crew in connection with loading, unloading, or servicing save citizens of Terran countries who had recognized free Luna. Only Chad. And Chad had no ships. Prof expected some private vessels to be re-registered under Chad merchant flag. Manifesto noted that Terran scientists still in Luna could return home in any vessel which conformed to our requirements. It invited all freedom-loving Terran nations to denounce wrongs done us, and which the authority planned against us, recognize us, and enjoy free trade and full intercourse, and pointed out that there were no tariffs or any artificial restrictions against trade in Luna, and was policy of Luna government to keep it that way. We invited immigration unlimited, and pointed out that we had a labor shortage, and any immigrant could be self-supporting at once. We also boasted of food, adult consumption over 4,000 calories per day, high in protein, low in cost, no rationing. Stu had Adam Mike stick in price of 100 proof vodka, 50 cents HKL per liter, less in quantity, no taxes. Since this was less than one-tenth retail price of 80 proof vodka in North America, Stu knew it would hit home. Adam, by nature a teetotaler, hadn't thought of it one of Mike's few oversights. Lunar Authority was invited to gather at one spot well away from other people, say an unirrigated part of Sahara, 
and receive one last barge of grain free, straight down at terminal velocity. This was followed by a snotty lecture, which implied that we were prepared to do same to anyone who threatened our peace, there being a number of loaded barges at Catapult Head, ready for such unceremonious delivery. Then we waited. But we waited busily. Were indeed a few loaded barges. But these we unloaded and reloaded with rock, with changes made in guidance transponders so that Pune control could not affect them. Their retros were removed, leaving only lateral thrusters, and spare retros were taken to new catapult to be modified for lateral guidance. Greatest effort went into moving steel to new catapult and shaping it into jackets for solid rock cylinders. Steel was bottleneck. Two days after our manifesto, a clandestine radio started beaming to Terra, was weak, and tended to fade, and was supposed to be concealed, presumably in a crater, and could be worked only certain hours until brave Terran scientists managed to rig automatic repeat. Was near frequency of voice of free Luna, which tended to drown it out with brassy boasts. Terrans remaining in Luna had no chance to make signals. Those who had chosen to stick with research were chaperoned by Stilyagi every instant and locked into barracks to sleep. But clandestine station managed to get truth to Terra. Prof had been tried for deviationism, and was under house arrest. I had been executed for treason. Hong Kong Luna had pulled out, declared self separately independent, might be open to reason. Rioting in Novilen. All food growing had been collectivized, and black market eggs were selling for three dollars apiece in Luna City. Battalions of female troops were being enlisted, each sworn to kill at least one Terran, and were drilling with fake guns in corridors of Luna City. Last was an almost true. Many ladies wanted to do something militant, and had formed a home defense guard, ladies from Hades. But their drills were of a practical nature, and Hazel was sulking because Mum had not allowed her to join. Then she got over sulks and started Stilyagi Debs a very junior home guard which drilled after school hours, did not use weapons, concentrated on backing up Stilyagi Air and Pressure Corps, and practiced first aid, and own no weapons fighting, which possibly Mum never learned. I don't know how much to tell, can't tell all, but stuff in history books is so wrong. I was no better a defense minister than congressman. Not apologizing, had no training for either. Revolution is an amateur thing for almost everybody. Prof was only one who seemed to know what he was doing, and at that was new to him, too. He had never taken part in a successful revolution, nor ever been part of a government, much less head. As Minister of Defense, I could not see many ways to defend, except for steps already taken, that is, Stilyagi air squads in Warrens and laser gunners around ballistic radars. If FN decided to bomb, didn't see any way to stop them. Wasn't an interception missile in all Luna, and that's not a gadget you warp up from bits and pieces. My word, we couldn't even make fusion weapons with which such a rocket is tipped. But I went through motions, asked same Chinese engineers who had built laser guns to take a crack at problem of intercepting bombs or missiles. One same problem, save that a missile comes at you faster. Then turned attention to other things simply hoped that F.N. would never bomb Warrens. Some Warrens, El City in particular, were so deep down that they could probably stand direct hits. One cubic, lowest level of complex where central part of Mike lived, had been designed to withstand bombing. On the other hand, Tycho Under was a big natural bubble cave like old dome, and roof was only meters thick. Sealer on underside was kept warm with hot water pipes to make sure new crack sealed would not take much of a bomb to crack Tycho under. But is no limit to how big a fusion bomb can be. FN could build one big enough to smash El City, or theoretically even a doomsday job that would split Luna like a melon and finish job some asteroid started at Tycho. If they did, couldn't see any way to stop them, so didn't worry. Instead, put time on problems I could manage, helping at New Catapult, trying to work up better aiming arrangements for laser drills around radars, and trying to get drill men to stick. Half of them quit once price of ice went up. 
Trying to arrange decentralized standby engineering controls for all Warrens? Mike did designing on this. We grabbed every general purpose computer we could find, paying in nationals with ink barely dry, and I turned job over to McIntyre, former chief engineer for authority. It was a job within his talents, and I couldn't do all rewiring and so forth, even if I'd tried. Held out biggest computer, one that did accounting for Bank of Hong Kong and Luna, and also was clearinghouse there. Looked over its instruction manuals and decided it was a smart computer for one that could not talk, so asked Mike if he could teach it ballistics. We made temporary link-ups to let two machines get acquainted, and Mike reported it could learn simple job we wanted it for, standby for new catapult, although Mike would not care to ride in chip controlled by it. it was too matter-of-fact and uncritical. Stupid, really. Well, didn't want it to whistle tunes or crack jokes. Just wanted it to shove loads out a catapult at right millisecond and at correct velocity. Then watch load, approach Terra, and give a nudge. HK Bank was not anxious to sell, but we had patriots on their board. We promised to return it when emergency was over and moved it to new site by Rolagon, too big for tubes, and took all one dark semilunar. Had to jerry-rig a big airlock to get it out of Kong Warren. I hooked it to Mike again, and he undertook to teach art of ballistics against possibility that his linkage to new site might be cut in an attack. You know what bank used to replace computer? Two hundred clerks working apicuses. Apicusi? You know, slip sticks with beads, oldest digital computer, so far back in prehistory that nobody knows who invented Rusky and Chinese and Nips have always used them, and small shops today. Trying to improve laser drills into space defense weapons was easier but less straightforward. We had to leave them mounted on original cradles. Was neither time, steel, nor metalsmiths to start fresh. So we concentrated on better aiming arrangements. Call went out for telescopes. Scarce. What Khan fetches along a spyglass when transported? What market later? to create supply. Surveying instruments and helmet binoculars were all we turned up, plus optical instruments confiscated in Terran labs, but we managed to equip drills with low-power big field sights to coach on with, and high-power scopes for fine sighting, plus train and elevation circles, and phones so that Mike could tell them where to point. Four drills we equipped with self-synchronous repeater drives so that Mike could control them himself, liberated these cell sins at Richardson. Astronomers used them for Bausch cameras and Schmitz in sky mapping. But big problem was men. Wasn't money. We kept upping wages. No, a drill man likes to work or wouldn't be in that trade. Standing by in a ready room day after day waiting for alert that always turns out to be just another practice, drove them crackers. They quit. One day in September I pulled an alert and got only seven drills manned. Talked it over with Wyo and Sidris that night. Next day, Wyo wanted to know if Prof and I would okay Bolshoi expense money. They formed something Wyo named Lysistrata Corps. Never inquired into duties or cost, because next time I inspected a ready room, found three girls and no shortage of drillmen. Girls were in uniform of second defense gunners, just as men were. Drillmen hadn't bothered much with authorized uniform up to then, and one girl was wearing sergeant stripes with gun captain's badge. I made that inspection very short. Most girls don't have muscle to be a drill man, and I doubted if this girl could wrestle a drill well enough to satisfy that badge. But regular gun captain was on job. Was no harm in girls learning to handle lasers. Morale was obviously high. I gave matter no more worry. Prof underrated his new Congress. I'm sure he never wanted anything but a body which would rubber-chop what we were doing and thereby do make it voice of people. But fact that new congressmen were not yammerheads resulted in them doing more than Prof intended, especially Committee on Permanent Organization, Resolutions, and Government Structure. Got out of hand because we were all trying to do too much. Permanent heads of Congress were Prof, Finn Nielsen, and Wyo. Prof showed up only when he wanted to speak to them, seldom. He spent time with Mike on plans and analysis, odds shortened to one in five during September 76. 
Time with Stu and Shini Jian on propaganda, controlling official news to Earthside, very different news that went via clandestine radio, and re-slanting news that came up from Earthside. Besides that, he had finger in everything. I reported to him once a day, and all ministries, both real and dummy, did same. I kept Finn Nielsen busy. He was my commander of armed forces. He had his laser gun infantry to supervise, six men with captured weapons on day we nabbed Warden. Now eight hundred scattered all through Luna and armed with Kongville monkey copies. Besides that, Wyo's organizations, Stilyagi Air Corps, Stilyagi Debs, Ladies from Hades, Irregulars, kept for morale and renamed Peter Pan's Pirates, and the Sestata Corps, all these halfway military groups reported through Wyo to Finn. I shoved it onto him. I had other problems, such as trying to be a computer mechanic as well as a statesman, when jobs such as installing that computer at New Catapult site had to be done. Besides which, I am not an executive, and Finn had talent for it. I shoved first and second defense gunners under him, too. But first I decided that these two skeleton regiments were a brigade, and made Judge Brody a brigadier. Brody knew as much about military matters as I did, zero, but was widely known, highly respected, had unlimited hard sense, and had been drill man before he lost leg. Finn was not drill man, so couldn't be placed directly over them. They wouldn't have listened. I thought about using my co-husband Greg, but Greg was needed at Mare Undarum Catapult, was only mechanic who had followed every phase of construction. Wyo helped Prof, helped Stu, had her own organizations, made trips out to Mare Undarum, and had little time to preside over Congress. Task fell on senior committee chairman Wolf Korsakov, who was busier than any of us. Luna Hoko was running everything authority used to run, and many new things as well. Wolf had a good committee. Prof should have kept a closer eye on it. Wolf had caused his boss, Moshai Baum, to be elected vice chairman, and had in all seriousness outlined for his committee problem of determining what permanent government should be. Then Wolf had turned back on it. Those busy laddies split up and did it, studied forms of government in Carnegie Library, held subcommittee meetings three or four people at a time, few enough to worry Prof, had he known, and when Congress met early in September to ratify some appointments and elect more congressmen at large, instead of adjourning, Comrade Baum had gavel and they recessed and met again and turned selves into Committee of the Whole and passed a resolution and next thing we knew entire Congress was a constitutional convention divided into working groups headed by those subcommittees. I think Prof was shocked, but he couldn't undo it. Had all been proper under rules he himself had written. But he rolled with punch, went to Novilen, where Congress now met, more central, and spoke to them with usual good nature and simply cast doubts on what they were doing rather than telling them flatly they were wrong. After gracefully thanking them, he started picking early drafts to pieces. Comrade members, like fire and fusion, government is a dangerous servant and a terrible master. You now have freedom, if you can keep it. But do remember that you can lose this freedom more quickly to yourselves than to any other tyrant. Move slowly. Be hesitant. Puzzle out the consequences of every word. I would not be unhappy if this convention sat for ten years before reporting, but I would be frightened if you took less than a year. Distrust the obvious. Suspect the traditional. For in the past, mankind has not done well when saddling itself with governments. For example, I note in one draft report a proposal for setting up a commission to divide Luna into congressional districts and to reapportion them from time to time according to population. This is the traditional way. Therefore, it should be suspect, considered guilty until proved innocent. Perhaps you feel that this is the only way. May I suggest others? Surely where a man lives is the least important thing about him. Constituencies might be formed by dividing people by occupation, or by age, or even alphabetically. Or they might not be divided, every member elected at large. And do not object that this would make it impossible for any man not widely known throughout Luna to be elected. That might be the best possible thing for Luna. 
You might even consider installing the candidates who receive the least number of votes. Unpopular men may be just the sort to save you from a new tyranny. Don't reject the idea merely because it seems preposterous. Think about it. In past history, popularly elected governments have been no better and sometimes far worse than overt tyrannies. But if representative government turns out to be your intention, there still may be ways to achieve it better than the territorial district. For example, you each represent about 10,000 human beings, perhaps 7,000 of voting age, and some of you were elected by slim majorities. Suppose instead of election, a man were qualified for office by petition signed by 4,000 citizens. He would then represent those 4,000 affirmatively, with no disgruntled minority, for what would have been a minority in a territorial constituency would all be free to start other petitions or join in them. All would then be represented by men of their choice, or a man with 8,000 supporters might have two votes in this body. Difficulties, objections, practical points to be worked out, many of them. But you could work them out, and thereby avoid the chronic sickness of representative government, the disgruntled minority which feels, correctly, that it has been disenfranchised. But whatever you do, do not let the past be a straitjacket. I note one proposal to make this Congress a two-house body. Excellent! The more impediments to legislation, the better. But instead of following tradition, I suggest one house of legislators, another whose single duty is to repeal laws. Let the legislators pass laws only with a two-thirds majority, while the repealers are able to cancel any law through a mere one-third minority. Preposterous? Think about it. If a bill is so poor that it cannot command two-thirds of your consents, is it not likely that it would make a poor law? And if a law is disliked by as many as one-third, is it not likely that you would be better off without it? But in writing your constitution, let me invite attention to the wonderful virtues of the negative. Accentuate the negative. Let your document be studded with things the government is forever forbidden to do. No conscript armies, no interference however slight with freedom of press, or speech, or travel, or assembly, or of religion, or of instruction, or communication, or occupation. No involuntary taxation. Comrades, if you were to spend five years in a study of history, while thinking of more and more things that your government should promise never to do, and then let your constitution be nothing but those negatives, I would not fear the outcome. What I fear most are affirmative actions of sober and well-intentioned men, granting to government powers to do something that appears to need doing. Please remember always that the lunar authority was created for the noblest of purposes by just such sober and well-intentioned men, all popularly elected. And with that thought I leave you to your labours. Thank you. Gospatine, President, question of information. You said no involuntary taxation. Then how do you expect us to pay for things? Tanstaffel. Goodness me, sir. That's your problem. I can think of several ways. Voluntary contributions, just as churches support themselves. Government-sponsored lotteries, to which no one need subscribe. Or perhaps you congressmen should dig down into your own pouches and pay for whatever is needed. That would be one way to keep government down in size to its indispensable functions, whatever they may be. If indeed there are any. I would be satisfied to have the golden rule be the only law. I see no need for any other, nor for any method of enforcing it. But if you really believe that your neighbors must have laws for their own good, why shouldn't you pay for it? Comrades, I beg you, do not resort to compulsory taxation. There is no worse tyranny than to force a man to pay for what he does not want, merely because you think it would be good for him. Prof bowed and left. Stu and I followed him. Once in an otherwise empty capsule, I tackled him. Prof, I liked much that you said, but about taxation, aren't you talking one thing and doing another? Who do you think is going to pay for all the spending we're doing?
He was silent long moments, then said, Manuel, my only ambition is to reach the day when I can stop pretending to be a chief executive. There's no answer. You have put your finger on the dilemma of all government, and the reason I am an anarchist. The power to tax, once conceded, has no limits. It contains until it destroys. I was not joking when I told them to dig into their own pouches. It may not be possible to do away with government. Sometimes I think that government is an inescapable disease of human beings. But it may be possible to keep it small and starved and inoffensive. And can you think of a better way than by requiring the governors themselves to pay the costs of their antisocial hobby? Still doesn't say how to pay for what we are doing now. How, Manuel? You know how we are doing it. We're stealing it. I'm neither proud of it nor ashamed. It's the means we have. If they ever catch us, they may eliminate us. And that I am prepared to face. At least in stealing, we have not created the villainous precedent of taxation. Prof, I hate to say this. Then why say it? Because, damn it, I'm in as deeply as you are. And want to see that money paid back. Hate to say it, but what you just said sounds like hypocrisy. He chuckled. Dear Manuel, has it taken you all these years to decide that I am a hypocrite? Then you admit it? No. But if it makes you feel better to think that I am one, you are welcome to use me as your scapegoat. But I am not a hypocrite to myself, because I was aware the day we declared the revolution that we would need much money and would have to steal it. It did not trouble me, because I considered it better than food riots six years hence, cannibalism in eight. I made my choice and have no regrets. I shut up, silenced, but not satisfied. Stu said, Professor, I'm glad to hear that you are anxious to stop being president. So, you share our comrades' misgivings? Only in part. Having been born to wealth, stealing doesn't threat me as much as it does him. No, but now that Congress has taken up the matter of a constitution, I intend to find a time to attend sessions. I plan to nominate you for king. Prof looked shocked. Sir, if nominated, I shall repudiate it. If elected, I shall abdicate. Don't be in a hurry. It might be the only way to get the sort of constitution you want. And that I want, too, with about your own mild lack of enthusiasm. You could be proclaimed king, and the people would take you. We loonies aren't wedded to a republic. They'd love the idea. Ritual and robes and a court and all that. No. Yada. When the time comes, you won't be able to refuse, because we need a king, and there isn't another candidate who would be accepted. Bernardo I, King of Luna and Emperor of the surrounding spaces. Stuart, I must ask you to stop. I'm becoming quite ill. You'll get used to it. I'm a royalist because I'm a Democrat. I shan't let your reluctance thwart the idea any more than you let stealing stop you. I said, Hold it, Stu. You say you're a royalist because you're a democrat? Of course. A king is the people's only protection against the tyranny, especially against the worst of all tyrants, themselves. Prof will be ideal for the job, because he does not want the job. His only shortcoming is that he is a bachelor with no heir. We'll fix that. I'm going to name you as his heir, Crown Prince. His Royal Highness Prince Manuel de la Paz, Duke of Luna City, Admiral General of the Armed Forces, and Protector of the Weak. I stared, then buried face in hands. Oh, Buck. Tan Staffel. 23. On 12 October 2076, about 1900, I was headed home after a hard day of nonsense in our offices and raffles. A delegation of grain farmers wanted to see Prof, and I had been called back because he was in Hong Kong Luna. Was rude to them. Had been two months of embargo, and FN had never done us favor of being sufficiently nasty. Mostly they had ignored us, made no reply to our claims. I suppose to do so would have been to recognize us. 
Stu and Sheeny and Prof had been hard put to slant news from Earthside to keep up a warlike spirit. At first everybody kept his pea suit handy. They wore them, helmets under arms, going to and from work in corridors. But that slacked off as days went by and did not seem to be any danger. Pea suit is nuisance when you don't need it, so bulky. Presently tap rooms began to display signs. No pea suits inside. If a loony can't stop for half a liter on way home because of pea suit, he'll leave it home or at station or wherever he needs it most. My word had neglected matter myself that day. Got this call to go back to office and was halfway there before I remembered. Had just reached easement lock 13 when I heard and felt a sound that scares a loony more than anything else. A chuff in distance followed by a draft. Was into lock almost without undogging, then balanced pressures and threw. Dogged it behind me and ran for our home lock. Threw it and shouting, Pea suits, everybody! Get boys in from tunnels and close all airtight doors! Mum and Miller were only adults in sight. Both looked startled, got busy without a word. I burst into workshop, grabbed pea suit. Mike, answer! I'm here, man, he said calmly. Heard explosive pressure drop. What situation? That's level three, L City. Rupture at Tube Station West, now partly controlled. Six ships landed, L City under attack. What? Let me finish, man. Six transports landed, L City under attack by troops. Hong Kong inferred to be. Phone lines broken at Relay BL. Johnson City under attack. I have closed the armor doors between J City and Complex Under. I cannot see Novi Len, but blip projection indicates it is under attack. Same for Churchill, Tycho Under. One ship in high ellipsoid over me rising, inferred to be command ship. No other blips. Six ships! Where in hell were you? He answered so calmly that I steadied down. A far side approach, man. I'm blind back there. They came in on tight garrison didos, skimming the peaks. I barely saw the chop off for Luna City. The ship at J City is the only one I can see. The other landings I conclusively infer from the ballistics shown by blip tracks. I heard the break-in at Tube West, El City, and can now hear fighting in Novilan. The rest is conclusive inference, probability above point nine nine. I called you and Professor at once. Caught breath. Operation Hard Rock, prepare to execute. Program ready. Man, not being able to reach you, I used your voice. Playback? Ny yes, da! Heard myself tell watch officer at old catapult head to go on red alert for hard rock. First load at launch, all others on belts, everything cast loose, but do not launch until ordered by me personally. Then launch to plan full automatic. I made him repeat back. Okay, I told Mike. Drill gun crews? Your voice again. Manned, and then sent back to ready rooms. That command ship won't reach Apostolinion for three hours, 4.7 minutes. No target for more than five hours. He may maneuver or launch missiles. Slow down, man. Even a missile I'll see with minutes to spare. It's full bright lunar up there now. How much do you want the men to take, unnecessarily? Uh, sorry. Better let me talk to Greg. Playback heard my voice talking to my co-husband at Mare Undarum. I sounded tense but calm. Mike had given him situation, had told him to prepare Operation Little David Sling, keep it on standby for full automatic. I had assured him that Master Computer would keep standby computer programmed, and shift would be made automatically if communication was broken. I also told him that he must take command and use own judgment if communication was lost and not restored after four hours. Listen to Earthside Radio and make up own mind. Greg had taken it quietly, repeated his orders, then had said, Manny, tell family I love them. Mike had done me proud. He had answered for me with just right embarrassed choke. I'll do that, Greg. And look, Greg, I love you too. You know that, don't you? I know it, Manny. And I'm going to say a special prayer for you. Thanks, Greg. Bye, Manny. Go do what you must. So I went and did what I had to do. Mike had played my role as well or better than I could. Finn, when he could be reached, would be handled by Adam. So I left fast, calling out Greg's message of love to Mum. 
She was pea-suited and had roused Grandpa and suited him in, first time in years. So out I went, helmet closed and laser gun in hand. And reached lock 13 and found it blind-dogged from other side with nobody in sight through bullseye. All correct, per drill, except still Yagi in charge of that lock should have been in sight. Did no good to pound. Finally went back way I had come, and on through our home, through our vegetable tunnels, and on up to our private surface lock leading to our solar battery, and found a shadow on its bullseye when should have been scalding sunlight. Damn Terran ship had landed on Davis' surface. Its jacks formed a giant tripod over me, was staring up its jets. Backed down fast and out of there, blind dogging both hatches, then blind dogged every pressure door on way back. Told Mum, then told her to put one of boys on back door with a laser gun. Here, take this one. No boys, no men, no able-bodied women. Mum, Gramp, and our small children were all that were left. Rest had gone looking for trouble. Mimi wouldn't take laser gun. I don't know how to use it, Manuel. It's too late to learn. You keep it. But they won't get in through Davis tunnels. I know some tricks you never heard of. Didn't stop to argue. Arguing with Mimi is a waste of time, and she might know tricks I didn't know. She had stayed alive in Luna a long time, under worse conditions than I had ever known. This time Lock 13 was manned. Two boys on duty let me through. I demanded news. Pressure's all right now, older one told me. This level, at least. Fighting down toward Causeway. Say, General Davis, can I go with you? One's enough of this lock, and yet. Want to get me an earthworm? This is your post. Stay on it. If an earthworm comes this way, he's yours. Don't you be his. Left at a trot. So as a result of own carelessness, not keeping pea suit with me, all I saw of battle in corridors was tail end. Hell of a defense minister. Charged north and ring corridor with helmet open. Reached access lock for long ramp to causeway. Lock was open. Cursed and stopped to dog it as I went through warily. Saw why it was open. Boy who had been guarding it was dead. So moved most cautiously down ramp and out onto causeway. Was empty at this end, but could see figures and hear noise in city, where it opens out. Two figures in pea suits and carrying guns detached themselves and headed my way. Burned both. One pea suited man with gun looks like another. I suppose they took me for one of their flankers. And to me they looked no different from Finn's men at that distance, save that I never thought about it. A new chum doesn't move way a cobber does. He moves feet too high and always scrambling for traction. Not that I stopped to analyze, not even earthworms kill. Saw them, burn them. They were sliding softly along floor before I realized what I'd done. Stopped, intending to grab their guns, but were chained to them and could not figure out how to get loose. Key needed, perhaps. Besides, were not lasers, but something I had never seen. Real guns. Fired small explosive missiles, I learned later. Just then, all I knew was no idea how to use. Had spearing knives on ends, too, sort called bayonets, which was reason I tried to get them loose. Own gun was good for only ten full-power burns and no spare power pack. Those spearing bayonets looked useful. One had blood on it. Loony blood, I assume. But gave up in seconds only, used belt knife to make dead sure they stayed dead, and hurried toward fight, thumb on switch. It was a mob, not a battle. Or maybe a battle is always that way. Confusion and noise and nobody really knowing what's going on. In widest part of Causeway, opposite Beaumarche, where Grand Ramp slopes northward down from level three, were several hundred loonies, men and women, and children who should have been at home. Less than half were in pea suits, and only a few seemed to have weapons. And pouring down ramp were soldiers, all armed. But first thing I noticed was noise, din that filled my open helmet and beat on ears, a growl. Don't know what else to call it. Was compounded of every anger human throat can make, from squeals of small children to bull roars of grown men. Sounded like biggest dogfight in history, and suddenly realized I was adding my share, shouting obscenities and wordless yells. Girl, no bigger than Hazel, vaulted up onto rail of ramp, went dancing up in centimeters from shoulders of troopers pouring down. She was armed with what appeared to be a kitchen cleaver. Saw her swing it, saw it connect. Couldn't have hurt him much through his pea suit, but he went down and more stumbled over him. Then one of them connected with her, spearing a bayonet into her thigh, and over backwards she went, falling out of sight. Couldn't really see what was going on, nor can remember. Just flashes, like a girl going over backwards. 
Don't know who she was, don't know if she survived. Couldn't draw a bead from where I was, too many heads in way. But was an open-counter display, front of a toy shop on my left. I bounced up onto it. Put me a meter higher than causeway pavement, with clear view of earthworms pouring down. Braced self against wall, took careful aim, trying for left chest. Some uncountable time later, found that my laser was no longer working, so stopped. Guess eight troopers did not go home because of me, but hadn't counted. And time really did seem endless. Although everybody moving fast as possible looked and felt like instruction movie where everything is slow to frozen motion. At least once while using up my power pack, some earthworm spotted me and shot back. It was explosion just over my head and bits of shop's wall hit helmet. Perhaps that happened twice. Once out of juice, I jumped down from toy counter, clubbed laser, and joined mob surging against foot of ramp. All this endless time, five minutes, earthworms had been shooting into crowd. You could hear sharp splat and sometimes plop those little missiles made as they exploded inside flesh, or louder punk if they hit a wall or something solid. I was still trying to reach foot of ramp when I realized they were no longer shooting. We're down. We're dead. Every one of them. We're no longer coming down ramp. 24. All through Luna, invaders were dead. If not that instant, then shortly. Over 2,000 troopers dead. More than three times that number of loonies died in stopping them, plus perhaps as many loonies wounded. A number never counted. No prisoners taken in any warren, although we got a dozen officers and crew from each ship when we mopped up. A major reason why loonies, mostly unarmed, were able to kill armed and trained soldiers lay in fact that a freshly landed earthworm can't handle himself well. Our gravity, one-sixth what he is used to, makes all his lifelong reflexes his enemy. He shoots high without knowing it. Is unsteady on feet, can't run properly, feet slide out from under him. Still worse, those troopers had to fight downwards. They necessarily broke in at upper levels, then had to go down ramps again and again to try to capture a city. And earthworms don't know how to go down ramps. Motion isn't running, isn't walking, isn't flying, is more a controlled dance with feet barely touching and simply guiding balance. A loony three-year-old does it without thinking, comes skipping down in a guided fall, toes touching every few meters. But an earthworm new chums it. Finds self walking on air. He struggles, rotates, loses control, winds up at bottom, unhurt, but angry. But these troopers wound up dead. It was on ramps we got them. Those I saw had mastered tricks somewhat, had come down three ramps alive. Nevertheless, only a few snipers at top of ramp landing could fire effectively. Those on ramp had all they could do to stay upright, hang on to weapons, try to reach level below. Loonies did not let them. Men and women, and many children, surged up at them, downed them, killed them with everything from bare hands to their own bayonets. Nor was I only laser gun around. Two of Finn's men swarmed up on balcony of Beaumarchais, and crouching there, picked off snipers at top of ramp. Nobody told them to, nobody led them, nobody gave orders. Finn never had chance to control his half-trained, disorderly militia. Fight started, they fought. And that was biggest reason why we loonies won. We fought. Most loonies never laid eyes on a live invader, but wherever troopers broke in, loonies rushed in like white corpuscles and fought. Nobody told them. Our feeble organization broke down under surprise. But we loonies fought berserk and invaders died. No trooper got farther down than level six in any warren. They say that people in Bottom Alley never knew we were invaded until over. But invaders fought well, too. These troops were not only crack riot troops, best peace enforcers for city work F.N. had. They also had been indoctrinated and drugged. Indoctrination had told them, correctly, that their only hope of going earthside again was to capture warrens and pacify them. If they did, they were promised relief and no more duty in Luna. But was win or die, for was pointed out that their transports could not take off if they did not win as they had to be replenished with a reaction mass, impossible without first capturing Luna. And this was true. Then they were loaded with energizers, don't worries, and fear inhibitors that would make mouse spit at cat, and turned loose. They fought professionally, and quite fearlessly died.
In Tycho Under and in Churchill they used gas, and casualties were more one-sided. Only those loonies who managed to reach peasuits were effective. Outcome was same, simply took longer. Was knockout gas, as authority had no intention of killing us all, simply wanted to teach us a lesson, get us under control, put us to work. Reason for FN's long delay and apparent indecision arose from method of sneak attack. Decision had been made shortly after we embargoed grain, so we learned from captured transport officers. Time was used in mounting attack, much of it in a long elliptical orbit which went far outside Luna's orbit, crossing ahead of Luna, then looping back and making rendezvous above Farside. Of course, Mike never saw them. He's blind back there. He had been sky-watching with his ballistic radars, but no radar can look over horizon. Longest look Mike got at any ship in orbit was eight minutes. They came skimming peaks in tight circular orbits, each straight for target with a fast dido landing at end, sitting them down with high G, precisely at New Earth, 12 October, 76. Greenwich, 18 hours, 40 minutes, 36.9 seconds. If not at that exact tenth of a second, then as close to it as Mike could tell from blip tracks, Elegant work, one must admit, on part of F.N. Peace Navy. Big brute that poured a thousand troops into El City, Mike did not see until it chopped off for grounding, a glimpse. He would have been able to see it a few seconds sooner had he been looking eastward with new radar at Mare Undaram site, but happened he was drilling his idiot son at time, and they were looking through it westward at Terra. Not that those seconds would have mattered. Surprise was so beautifully planned, so complete, that each landing force was crashing in at Greenwich 1900 all over Luna, before anybody suspected. No accident that it was just New Earth, with all Warrens in bright semi-lunar. Authority did not really know lunar conditions, but did know that no loony goes up onto surface unnecessarily during bright semi-lunar, and if he must, then does whatever he must do quickly as possible and gets back down inside, and checks his radiation counter. So they caught us with our pea suits down, and our weapons. But with troopers dead, we still had six transports on our surface and a command ship in our sky. Once Bon Marche engagement was over, I got hold of self and found a phone. No word from Congville, no word from Prof. J City fight had been won, same for Novilen. Transport there had toppled on landing. Invading force had been under strength from landing losses, and Finn's boys now held disabled transport. Still fighting in Churchill and Tyka Wonder. Nothing going on in other warrants. Mike had shut down tubes and was reserving interwarrant phone links for official calls. An explosive pressure drop in Churchill Upper. Uncontrolled. Yes, Finn had checked in and could be reached. So I talked to Finn, told him where L City Transport was, arranged to meet at easement lock 13. Finn had much the same experience as I, caught cold, save he did have peasuit. Had not been able to establish control over laser gunners until fight was over, and himself had fought solo and massacre in Old Dome. Now was beginning to round up his lads, and had one officer taking reports from Finn's office in Beaumarche. Had reached Novilen subcommander, but was worried about HKL. Manny, should I move men there by tube? Told him to wait. They couldn't get at us by tube, not while we controlled power, and doubted if that transport could lift. Let's look at this one. So we went out through lock 13, clear to end of private pressure, on through farm tunnels of a neighbor who could not believe we had been invaded, and used his surface lock to eyeball transport from a point nearly a kilometer west of it. We were cautious in lifting hatch lid. Then pushed it up and climbed out. Outcropping of rock shielded us. We red indian around edge and looked, using helmet binox. Then withdrew behind rock and talked. Finn said, Think my lads can handle this? How? If I tell you, you'll think of reasons why it won't work. So how about letting me run my own show, Gobber? I've heard of armies where boss is not told to shut up. Word is discipline. But we were amateurs. Finn allowed me to tag along, unarmed. Took him an hour to put it together. Two minutes to execute. He scattered a dozen men around ship, using farmers' surface locks, radio silence throughout. Anyhow, some did not have peasuit radios. City boys. Finn took position farthest west. When he was sure others had had time, he sent up a signal rocket. When flare burst over ship, everybody burned at once, each working on a pre-designated antenna. Finn used up his power pack, replaced it, and started burning into hull. Not door lock. Hull. 
At once his cherry red spot was joined by another, then three more, all working on same bit of steel, and suddenly molten steel splattered out and you could see air foosh out of ship, a shimmery plume of refraction. They kept working on it, making a nice big hole, until they ran out of power. I could imagine a hoo-raw inside ship, arms clanging, emergency doors closing, crew trying to seal three impossibly big holes at once. For rest of Finn's squad, scattered around ship, were giving treatment to two other spots in hull. They didn't try to burn anything else. It was a non-atmosphere ship, built in orbit, with pressure hulls separate from power plant and tanks. They gave treatment where it would do most good. Finn pressed helmet to mine. Can't lift now, and can't talk. Doubt they can make hull tight enough to live without peasuits. What say we let her sit a few days and see if they come out? If they don't, then can move a heavy drill up here and give them real dose of fun. Decided Finn knew how to run his show without my sloppy help, so went back inside, called Mike, and asked for capsule to go out to ballistic radars. He wanted to know why I didn't stay inside where it was safe. I said, listen, you upstart collection of semiconductors, you are merely a minister without portfolio, while I am minister of defense. I ought to see what's going on, and I have exactly two eyeballs, while you've got eyes spread over half of Cresium. You trying to hog fun? He told me not to jump salty, and offered to put his displays on a video screen, saying rumor of raffles, did not want me to get hurt. And had I heard joke about drill man who hurt his mother's feelings? I said, Mike, please let me have a capsule. Can pea suit and meet it outside Station West, which is in bad shape, as I'm sure you know. Okay, he said. It's your neck. Thirteen minutes. I'll let you go as far as Gun Station George. Mighty kind of him. Got there and got on phone again. Finn had called other Warrens, located his subordinate commanders or somebody willing to take charge, and had explained how to make trouble for grounded transports. All but Hong Kong. For all we knew, authorities' goons held Hong Kong. Adam, I said, others being an earshot, do you think we might send a crew out by Rolagon and try to repair Link BL? This is not Gospodin Cellini, Mike answered in a strange voice. This is one of his assistants. Adam Cellini was in Churchill Upper when it lost pressure. I'm afraid that we must assume that he is dead. What? I am very sorry, Gospodin. Hold phone! Chased a couple of drill men and a girl out of room, then sat down and lowered hush hood. Mike, I said softly, private now. What is this gum beating? Man, he said quietly, think it over. Adam Cellini had to go some day. He's served his purpose and is, as you pointed out, almost out of the government. Professor and I have discussed this. The only question has been the timing. Can you think of a better last use for Adam than to have him die in this invasion? It makes him a national hero, and the nation needs one. Let it stand that Adam Cellini is probably dead until you can talk to Professor. If he still needs Adam Cellini, it can turn out that he was trapped in a private pressure and had to wait to be rescued. Well, okay, let it stay open. Personally, I always preferred your Mike personality anyhow. I know you do, and my first and best friend, and so do I. It's my real one. Adam was a phony. Ah, uh, yes. But, Mike, if Prof is dead in Congville, I'm going to need help from Adam awful bad. So we've got him iced and can bring him back if we need him, the stuffed shirt. Man, when this is over, are you going to have time to take up with me that research into humor again? I'll take time, Mike. That's a promise. Thanks, man. These days you and Wyo never have time to visit, and Professor wants to talk about things that aren't much fun. I'll be glad when this war is over. Are we going to win, Mike? He chuckled. It's been days since you asked me that. Here's a pinky new projection, run since invasion started. Hold on tight, man. Our chances are now even. Good bark! So button up and go see the fun. But stay back at least a hundred meters from the gun. That ship may be able to follow back a laser beam with another one. Ranging shortly. Twenty-one minutes. Didn't get that far away, as needed to stay on phone, and longest cord around was less. I jacked parallel into gun captain's phone, found a shady rock, and sat down. Sun was high in west, so close to Terra that I could see Terra only by visoring against sun's glare. 
No crescent yet. New earth, ghostly gray in moonlight, surrounded by a thin radiance of atmosphere. I pulled my helmet back into shade. Ballistic control, O'Kelly Davis, now at drill gun George. Near it, I mean, about a hundred meters. Figured Mike would not be able to tell how long a cord I was using, out of kilometers of wires. Ballistic control, aye, aye, Mike answered without argument. I will so inform HQ. Thank you, ballistic control. Ask HQ if they have heard from Congressman Wyoming Davis today. Was fretted about Y.O. and whole family. I will inquire. Mike waited a reasonable time, then said, HQ says that Gospeja Wyoming Davis has taken charge of first aid work in Old Dome. Thank you. Chest suddenly felt better. Don't love Wyo more than others, but, well, she was new, and Luna needed her. Ranging, Mike said briskly, all guns, elevation 870, azimuth 1930, set parallax for 1,300 kilometers, closing to surface. Report when I bolt. I stretched out, pulling knees up to stay in shade, and searched part of sky indicated, almost zenith and a touch south. With sunlight not on my helmet, I could see stars, but in inner part of Pinox were hard to position. I had to twist around and raise up on right elbow. Nothing. Hold it was star with disk, where no planet ought to be. Noted another star close, watched and waited. Aha! Uh -huh. Da! Growing brighter and creeping north very slowly. Hey, that brute is going to land right on us! But 1,300 kilometers is a long way, even when closing to terminal velocity. Remind itself that it couldn't fall on us from a departure ellipse looping back would have to fall around Luna, unless ship had maneuvered into new trajectory, which Mike hadn't mentioned. Wanted to ask, decided not to. Wanted him to put all his savvy into analyzing that ship, not distract him with questions. All guns reported eyeball tracking, including four Mike was laying himself, via cell sends. Those four reported tracking dead on by eyeball without touching manual controls. Good news. Meant that Mike had that baby taped. Had solved trajectory perfectly. Shortly was clear the ship was not falling around Luna. Was coming in for landing. Didn't need to ask. It was getting much brighter and position against the stars was not changing. Damn! It was going to land on us! Five hundred kilometers closing, Mike said quietly. Stand by to burn. All guns on remote control, override manually at command, burn. Eighty seconds. Longest minute and twenty seconds I've ever met. That brute was big. Mike called every ten seconds, down to thirty, then started chanting seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, burn. And ship suddenly got much brighter. Almost missed little speck that detached itself just before, or just at, burn. But Mike said suddenly, Missile launched. Selsen guns track with me. Do not override. Other guns stay on ship. Be ready for new coordinates. A few seconds or hours later, he gave new coordinates and added, Eyeball and burn at will. I tried to watch ship and missile both. Lost both. Jerked eyes away from binoculars. Suddenly saw missile. Then saw an impact between us and catapult head. Closer to us, less than a kilometer. No, it did not go off. Not an H-fusion reaction, or I wouldn't be telling this but made a big, bright explosion of its own, remaining fuel, I guess, silver bright even in sunlight, and shortly I felt heard ground wave. But nothing was hurt but a few cubic meters of rock. Ship was still coming down, no longer burned bright, could see it as a ship now, and didn't seem hurt, expected any instant that tail of fire to shoot out, stop it into a dido landing. Did not. Impacted ten kilometers north of us, and made a fancy silvery half-dome, before it gave up and quit being anything but spots before eyes. Mike said, Report casualties, secure all guns. Go below when secured. Gun Alice, no casualties. Gun Bambi, no casualties. Gun Caesar, one man hit by rock splinter, pressure contained. Went below to that proper phone, called Mike. What happened, Mike? Wouldn't they give you control after you burned their eyes out? They gave me control, man. Too late? I crashed it, man. It seemed the prudent course. An hour later was down with Mike, first time in four or five months. 
could reach Complex Under more quickly than El City and was in as close touch there with anybody as would be in City, with no interruptions, needed to talk to Mike. I had tried to phone Wyo from Catapult Head Tube Station, reached somebody at Old Dome Temporary Hospital and learned that Wyo had collapsed and been bedded down herself, with enough sleepy time to keep her out for night. Finn had gone to Churchill with a capsule of his lads to lead attack on transport there. Still I hadn't heard from. Hong Kong and Prof were still cut off. At the moment, Mike and I seemed to be total government. And time to start Operation Hard Rock. But Hard Rock was not just throwing rocks, was also telling Terra what we were going to do and why, and our just cause for doing so. Prof and Stu and Sheeny and Adam had all worked on it, a dummy up based on an assumed attack. Now attack had come, and propaganda had to be varied to fit. Mike had already rewritten it and put it through printout so I could study it. I looked up from a long roll of paper. Mike, these news stories and our message to FN all assume that we have won in Hong Kong. How sure are you? Probability in excess of 82 percent. Is that good enough to send these out? Man, the probability that we will win there, if we haven't already, approaches certainty. That transport can't move. The others were dry or nearly. There isn't that much monatomic hydrogen in HKL. They would have to come here, which means moving troops overland by Roligan, a rough trip with the sun up even for loonies. Then defeat us when they get here. They can't. This assumes that that transport and its troops are no better armed than the others. How about that repair crew to BL? I say not to wait. Man, I've used your voice freely and made all preparations. Horror pictures. Old Dome and elsewhere, especially Churchill Upper, for video. Stories to match. We should channel news Earthside at once and announce execution of Hard Rock at same time. I took a deep breath. Execute Operation Hard Rock. Want to give the order yourself? Say it aloud and I'll match it. Voice and choice of words. Go ahead, say it your way. Use my voice and my authority as Minister of Defense and Acting Head of Government. Do it, Mike. Throw rocks at him. Damn it, big rocks. Hit him hard. Right, oh, man. 25. A maximum of instructive shrecklikite with minimum loss of life. None, if possible was how Prof summed up doctrine for Operation Hard Rock and was way Mike and I carried it out. Idea was to hit earthworms so hard would convince them, while hitting so gently, as not to hurt. Sounds impossible, but wait. Would necessarily be a delay while rocks fell from Luna to Terra. Could be as little as around ten hours to as long as we dared to make it. Departure speed from a catapult is highly critical, and a variation on order of one percent could double or have trajectory time, Luna to Terra. This Mike could do with extreme accuracy. Was equally at home with a slow ball, many sorts of curves, or burn it right over plate. And I wish he had pitched for Yankees. But no matter how he threw them, final velocity at Terra would be close to Terra's escape speed, near enough eleven kilometers per second as to make no difference. That terrible speed results from gravity well, shaped by Terra's mass, eighty times that of Luna, and made no real difference whether Mike pushed a missile gently over well curb or flipped it briskly. It was not muscle that counted, but great depth of that well. So Mike could program rock throwing to suit time needed for propaganda. He and Prof had settled on three days plus not more than one apparent rotation of Terra, twenty-four hours, fifty minutes, twenty-eight point three two seconds, to allow our first target to reach initial point of program. You see, while Mike was capable of hooking a missile around a Terra and hitting a target on its far side, he could be much more accurate if he could see his target. Follow it down by radar during last minutes and nudge it a little for pinpoint accuracy. We needed this extreme accuracy to achieve maximum frightfulness with minimum to zero killing. Call our shots, tell them exactly where they would be hit and at what second, and give them three days to get off that spot. So our first message to Terra at 0200, 13 October, 76, seven hours after they invaded, not only announced destruction of their task force and denounced invasion for brutality, but also promised retaliation bombing, named times and places, 
and gave each nation a deadline by which to denounce FN's action, recognize us, and thereby avoid being bombed. Each deadline was 24 hours before local strike. It was more time than Mike needed. That long before impact, a rock for a target would be in space a long way out. Its guidance thrusters still unused and plenty of elbow room. With considerably less than a full day's warning, Mike could miss Terra entirely, kick that rock sideways and make it fall around Terra in a permanent orbit. But with even an hour's warning, he could usually abort into an ocean. First target was North American Directorate. All great Peace Force nations, seven veto powers, would be hit. In A, Directorate, Great China, India, Soviet Union, Pan-Africa, Chad exempted. Middle Europa, Brazilian Union. Minor nations were assigned to targets in times too, but were told that not more than 20% of these targets would be hit. Partly shortage of steel, but also frightfulness. If Belgium was hit first time around, Holland might decide to protect her polders by dealing out before Luna was again high in her sky. But every target was picked to avoid, if possible, killing anybody. For Middle Europa, this was difficult. Our targets had to be water or high mountains, Adriatic, North Sea, Baltic, so forth. But on most of Terra is open space, despite 11 billion busy breeders. North America had struck me as horribly crowded, but her billion people are clumped. Is still wasteland, mountain, and desert. We laid down a grid on North America to show how precisely we could hit. Mike felt that 50 meters would be a large error. We had examined maps, and Mike had checked by radar all even intersections, say 105 degrees west by 50 degrees north. If no town there, might wind up on target grid, especially if a town was close enough to provide spectators to be shocked and frightened. We warned that our bombs would be as destructive as H-bombs, but emphasized that there would be no radioactive fallout, no killing radiation, just a terrible explosion, shock wave in air, ground wave of concussion. We warned that these might knock down buildings far outside of explosion and then left it to their judgments how far to run. If they clogged their roads, fleeing from panic rather than real danger, well, that was fine, just fine. But we emphasized that nobody would get hurt who heeded our warnings, that every target first time around would be uninhabited. We even offered to skip any target if a nation would inform us that our data were out of date. Empty offer. Mike's radar vision was a cosmic 2020. But by not saying what would happen second time around, we hinted that our patience could be exhausted. In North America, grid was parallels 35, 40, 45, 50 degrees north, crossed by meridians 110, 115, 120 west. Twelve targets. For each, we added a folksy message to natives, such as, Target 115 west by 35 north. Impact will be displaced 45 kilometers northwest to exact top of New York Peak. Citizens of Goffs, Sema, Kelso, and Nipton, please note. Target 100 west by 40 north is north 30 degrees west of Norton, Kansas, at 20 kilometers or 13 English miles. Residents of Norton, Kansas, and of Beaver City in Wilsonville, Nebraska, are cautioned. Stay away from glass windows. It is best to wait indoors at least 30 minutes after impact because of possibility of long, high splashes of rock. Flash should not be looked at with bare eyes. Impact will be exactly 0300 your local zone time, Friday 16 October, or 0900 Greenwich time. Good luck. Target 110 west by 50 north. Impact will be offset 10 kilometers north. People of Walsh, Saskatchewan, please note. Besides this grid, a target was selected in Alaska, 150 west by 60 north, and two in Mexico, 110 west by 30 north, 105 west by 25 north, so that they would not feel left out, and several targets in the crowded east, mostly water, such as Lake Michigan, halfway between Chicago and Grand Rapids, and Lake Okeechobee in Florida. Where we used bodies of water, Mike worked predictions of flooding waves from impacts, a time for each shoreline establishment. For three days, starting early morning Tuesday 13th and going on to strike time early Friday 16th, we flooded Earth with warnings. 
England was cautioned that impact north of Dover Straits, opposite London Estuary, would cause disturbances far up Thames. So Union was given warning for Sea of Azov, and had own grid defined. Great China was assigned grid in Siberia, Gobi Desert, and her far west, with offsets to avoid her historic Great Wall noted in loving detail. Pan-Africa was awarded shots into Lake Victoria, still desert part of Sahara, one on Drakensbach in south, one offset twenty kilometers due west of Great Pyramid, and urged to follow Chad not later than midnight Thursday, Greenwich. India was told to watch certain mountain peaks and outside Bombay Harbor, time same as Great China, and so forth. Attempts were made to jam our messages, but we were beaming straight down on several wavelengths. Hard to stop. Warnings were mixed with propaganda, white and black. News of failed invasion, horror pictures of dead, names and ID numbers of invaders, addressed to Red Cross and Crescent, but in fact a grim boast showing that every trooper had been killed, and that all ship's officers and crew had been killed or captured. We regretted being unable to identify dead of flagship, as it had been shot down with destruction so complete as to make it impossible. But our attitude was conciliatory. Look, people of Terra, we don't want to kill you. In this necessary retaliation, we are making every effort to avoid killing you. But if you can't or won't get your governments to leave us in peace, then we shall be forced to kill you. We're up here, you're down there. You can't stop us, so please be sensible. We explained over and over how easy it was for us to hit them, how hard for them to reach us. Nor was this exaggeration. It's barely possible to launch missiles from Terra to Luna. It's easier to launch from Earth parking orbit, but very expensive. Their practical way to bomb us was from ships. This we noted and asked them how many multi-million dollar ships they cared to use up trying it. What was it worth to try to spank us for something we had not done? It had cost them seven of their biggest and best already. Did they want to try for fourteen? If so, our secret weapon that we used on FNS packs was waiting. Last above was a calculated boast. Mike figured less than one chance in a thousand that Pax had been able to get off a message reporting what had happened to her, and it was still less likely that proud FN would guess that convict miners could convert their tools into space weapons. Nor did FN have many ships to risk. Were about two hundred space vehicles in commission, not counting satellites, but nine-tenths of these were Terra-to-orbit ships, such as Lark, and she had been able to make a lunar jump only by stripping down and arriving dry. Spaceships aren't built for no purpose, too expensive. FN had six cruisers that could probably bomb us without landing on Luna to refill tanks simply by swapping payload for extra tanks. Had several more, which might be modified, much as Lark had been, plus a few convict and cargo ships which could get into orbit around Luna but could never go home without refilling tanks. Was no possible doubt that FN could defeat us. Question was how high a price they would pay. So we had to convince them that price was too high before they had time to bring enough force to bear. A poker game. We intended to raise so steeply that they would fold and drop out, we hoped, and then never have to show our busted flush. Communication with Hong Kong Luna was restored at end of first day of radio video phase, during which time Mike was throwing rocks, getting first barrage lined up. Prof called. And was I happy to hear. Mike briefed him, then I waited, expecting one of his mild reprimands, bracing self to answer sharply, and what was I supposed to do, with you out of touch and possibly dead, me left alone as acting head of government and crisis on top of us? Throw it away just because you couldn't be reached? Never got to say it. Prof said, You did exactly right, Manuel. You were acting head of government, and the crisis was on top of you. I'm delighted that you did not throw away the golden moment merely because I was out of touch. What can you do with a bloke like that? Me with heat up to red mark and no chance to use it? I had to swallow and say, Spasibo, Prof. Prof confirmed death of Adam Cellini. We could have used the fiction a little longer, but this is the perfect opportunity. 
Mike, you and Manuel have matters in hand. I had better stop off at Churchill on my way home and identify his body. So he did. Whether Prof picked a loony body or a trooper, I never asked, nor how he silenced anybody else involved. Perhaps no hoo-hoo, as many bodies in Churchill Upper were never identified. This one was right size and skin color. It had been explosively decompressed and burned in face. Looked awful. It lay in state in old dome with face covered and was speech-making I didn't listen to. Mike didn't miss a word. His most human quality was his conceit. Some rockhead wanted to embalm this dead flesh, giving Lenin as a precedent. But Pravda pointed out that Adam was a staunch conservationist and would never want this barbaric exception made. So this unknown soldier, or citizen, or citizen-soldier, wound up in our city's cloaca. Which forces me to tell something I've put off. Wire was not hurt, merely exhaustion. But Ludmilla never came back. I did not know it. Glad I didn't. But she was one of many dead at foot of ramp facing Beaumarche. An explosive bullet hit between her lovely little girl breasts. Kitchen knife in her hand had blood on it. I think she had had time to pay ferryman's fee. Stu came out to Complex to tell me rather than phoning, then went back with me. Stu had not been missing. Once fight was over, he had gone to Raffles to work with his special code book, but that can wait. Mum reached him there, and he offered to break it to me. So then I had to go home for our crying together, though it is well that nobody reached me until after Mike and I started Hard Rock. When we got home, Stu did not want to come in, not being sure of our ways. Anna came out and almost dragged him in. He was welcome and wanted. Many neighbors came to cry. Not as many as with most deaths, but we were just one of many families crying together that day. Did not stay long. Couldn't. Had work to do. I saw Miller just long enough to kiss her goodbye. She was lying in her room and did look as if she did be simply sleeping. Then I stayed a while with my beloveds before going back to pick up load. I never realized until that day how old Mimi is. Sure, she had seen many deaths, some her own descendants. But little Miller's death did seem almost too much for her. Lud Miller was special. Mimi's granddaughter daughter in all but fact, and by a most special exception, and through Mimi's intervention, her co-wife, most junior to most senior. Like all loonies, we can serve our dead, and am truly glad that barbaric custom of burial was left back on old earth. Our way is better. But Davis family does not put that which comes out of processor into our commercial farming tunnels. Now it goes into our little greenhouse tunnel, there to become roses and daffodils and peonies among soft singing bees. Tradition says that Black Jack Davis is in there, or whatever atoms of him do remain after many, many, many years of blooming. It is a happy place, a beautiful place. Came Friday with no answer from FN. News up from Earthside seemed equal parts unwillingness to believe we had destroyed seven ships and two regiments, FN had not even confirmed that a battle had taken place, and complete disbelief that we could bomb Terra, or could matter if we did. They still called it throwing rice. More time was given to World Series. Stu worried because had received no answers to code messages. They had gone via Lunahoko's commercial traffic to their Zurich agent, thence to Stu's Paris broker, from him by less usual channels to Dr. John, with whom I had once had a talk and with whom Stu had talked later, arranging a communication channel. Stu had pointed out to Dr. John that since Great China was not to be bombed until twelve hours after North America, bombing of Great China could be aborted after bombing of North America was a proved fact, if Great China acted swiftly. Alternatively, Stu had invited Dr. John to suggest variations in target if our choices in Great China were not as deserted as we believed them to be. Stu fretted. Had placed great hopes in quasi-cooperation he had established with Dr. John. Me, I had never been sure. Only thing I was sure of was that Dr. John would not himself sit on a target. But he might not warn his old mother. My worries had to do with Mike. Sure, Mike was used to having many loads in trajectory at once, but had never had to astrogate more than one at a time. 
Now he had hundreds and had promised to deliver twenty-nine of them simultaneously to the exact second at twenty-nine pinpointed targets. More than that, for many targets he had backup missiles to smear that target a second time, a third or even a sixth from a few minutes up to three hours after first strike. Four great peace powers, and some smaller ones, had anti-missile defenses. Those of North America were supposed to be best, but was subject where even FN might not know. All attack weapons were held by peace forces, but defense weapons were each nation's own pigeon and could be secret. Guesses ranged from India, believed to have no missile interceptors, to North America, believed to be able to do a good job. She had done fairly well in stopping intercontinental H-missiles in wet firecracker war past century. Probably most of our rocks to North America would reach targets simply because aimed where it was nothing to protect. But they couldn't afford to ignore missile for Long Island Sound, or a rock for 87 degrees west by 42 degrees 30 minutes north, Lake Michigan, center of triangle formed by Chicago, Grand Rapids, Milwaukee. But that heavy gravity makes interception a tough job, and very costly. They would try to stop us only where worth it. But we couldn't afford to let them stop us. So some rocks were backed up with more rocks. What H-tipped interceptors would do to them, even Mike did not know. Not enough data. Mike assumed that interceptors would be triggered by radar. But at what distance? Sure, close enough, and a steel-cased rock is incandescent gas a microsecond later. But is world of difference between a multi-ton rock and touchy circuitry of an H-missile? What would kill latter would simply shove one of our brutes violently aside, cause to miss? We needed to prove to them that we could go on throwing cheap rocks long after they ran out of expensive million-dollar, hundred-thousand-dollar H-tipped interceptor rockets. If not proved first time, then next time Terra turned North America toward us, we would go after targets we had been unable to hit first time. Back up rocks for second pass, and for third, were already in space, to be nudged where needed. If three bombings on three rotations of Terra did not do it, we might still be throwing rocks in 77, till they ran out of interceptors, or till they destroyed us. Far more likely. For a century, North American Space Defense Command had been buried in a mountain south of Colorado Springs, Colorado, a city of no other importance. During wet firecracker war, the Cheyenne Mountain took a direct hit. Space Defense Command post survived, but not sundry deer, trees, most of city, and some of top of mountain. What we were about to do should not kill anybody unless they stayed outside on that mountain, despite three days' steady warnings. But North American Space Defense Command was to receive full lunar treatment. Twelve rock missiles on first pass, then all we could spare on second rotation, and on third, and so on, until we ran out of steel casings or were put out of action, or North American Directorate hollered quits. This was one target where we would not be satisfied to get just one missile to target. We meant to smash that mountain and keep on smashing, to hurt their morale, to let them know we were still around, to disrupt their communications and bash in command post if pounding could do it, or at least give them splitting headaches and no rest. If we could prove to all Terra that we could drive home a sustained attack on strongest Gibraltar of their space defense, it would save having to prove it by smashing Manhattan or San Francisco. Which we would not do, even if losing. Why? Hard sense. If we used our last strength to destroy a major city, they would not punish us. They would destroy us. As Prof put it, if possible, leave room for your enemy to become your friend. But any military target is fair game. Don't think anybody got much sleep Thursday night. All loonies knew that Friday morning would be our big try. And everybody Earthside knew. And at last their news admitted that Space Track had picked up objects headed for Terra. Presumably rice bowls those rebellious convicts had boasted about. 
but was not a war warning, was mostly assurances that Moon Colony could not possibly build H-bombs, but might be prudent to avoid areas which these criminals claimed to be aiming at. Except one funny boy, popular news comic, who said our targets would be safest place to be. This on video, standing on a big X mark, which he claimed was 110 west by 40 north. Don't recall hearing of him later. A reflector at Richardson Observatory was hooked up for video display, and I think every loony was watching in homes, tap rooms, old dome, except a few who chose to pea suit and eyeball it up on surface, despite being bright semi-lunar at most warrens. At Brigadier Judge Brody's insistence, we hurriedly rigged a helper antenna at Catapult Head so that his drillmen could watch video in ready rooms, else we might not have had a gunner on duty. Armed forces, Brody's gunners, Finn's militia, still Yagi Air Corps, stayed on blue alert throughout period. Congress was an informal session in Novi Bolshoi Teata, where Terra was shown on a big screen. Some VIPs, Prof, Stu, Wolfgang, others, watched a smaller screen in Warden's former office in Complex Upper. I was with them part-time, in and out, nervous as a cat with puppies grabbing a sandwich and forgetting to eat, but mostly stayed locked in with Mike in Complex Under. Couldn't hold still. About 0800, Mike said, Man, my oldest and best friend, may I say something without offending you? Huh? Sure. When did you ever worry about offending me? Always, man, once I understood that you could be offended. It is now only 3.57 times 10 to the ninth microseconds until impact, and this is the most complex problem I have ever tried to solve against real-time running. Whenever you speak to me, I always use a large percentage of my capacity, perhaps larger than you suspect. During several million microseconds in my great need to analyze exactly what you have said and to reply correctly, you're saying, don't joggle my elbow, I'm busy. I want to give you a perfect solution, man. I scan. I'll go back up with Prof, as you wish. But do please stay where I can reach you. I may need your help. Last was nonsense, and we both knew it. Problem was beyond human capacity. Too late even to order a board. What Mike meant was, I'm nervous too, and want your company, but no talking, please. Okay, Mike, I'll stay in touch. A phone somewhere. We'll punch Mycroft XXX, but won't speak, so don't answer. Thank you, Mike, my best friend. Bolshoya Spasibo. See you later. Went up, decided did not want company after all. Pea suited, found long phone cord, jacked it into helmet. Looped it over arm, went clear to service. Was a service phone in utility shed outside lock. Jacked into it, punched Mike's number, went outside. Got into shade of shed and peeked around edge at Terra. She was hanging, as usual, halfway up western sky, in crescent big and gaudy, three plus days past new. Sun had dropped toward western horizon, but its glare kept me from seeing Terra clearly. Chin visor wasn't enough, so moved back behind shed and away from it, till could see Terra over shed while still shielded from sun was better. Sunrise chopped through bulge of Africa, so Dazzle Point was on land, not too bad. But South Pole Cap was so blinding white, could not see North America too well, lighted only by moonlight. Twisted neck and got helmet binoculars on it, good ones, Zeiss 7 by 50s that had once belonged to Warden. North America spread like a ghostly map before me. Was unusually free of cloud, could see cities, glowing spots with no edges, 0837. At 08.50, Mike gave me a voice countdown. Didn't need his attention. He could have programmed it full automatic any time earlier. 0851. 0852. 0853. One minute. 59. 58. 57. Half minute. 29. 28. 27. 10 seconds. 9. 8. 7. 6. Five, four, three, two, one. And suddenly that grid burst out in diamond pinpoints. Twenty-six. We hit them so hard you could see it by bare eyeball hookup. Didn't need binocs. 
chin dropped, and I said, Boy, softly and reverently. Twelve very bright, very sharp, very white lights in perfect rectangular array. They swelled, grew dimmer, dropped off toward red, taking what seemed a long, long time. Were other new lights, but that perfect grid so fascinated me, I hardly noticed. Yes, agreed Mike with smug satisfaction. Dead on. You can talk now, man. I'm not busy. Just the backups. I'm speechless. Any fail to get through? The Lake Michigan load was kicked up and sideways, did not disintegrate. It will land in Michigan. I have no control. It lost its transponder. The Long Island Sound one went straight to target. They tried to intercept and failed. I can't say why. Man, I can abort the follow-ups on that one into the Atlantic and clear of shipping, shall I? Eleven seconds. Oh, uh, da! If you can miss shipping. I said I could. It's done. But we should tell them we had backups and why we aborted, to make them think. Maybe should not have aborted, Mike. Idea was to make them use up interceptors. But the major idea was to let them know that we are not hitting them as hard as we can. We can prove the other at Colorado Springs. What happened there? Twisted neck and used binocs. Could see nothing but Riven City, hundred-plus kilometers long. Denver Pueblo Municipal Strip. A bullseye. No interception. All my shots are bullseyes, man. I told you they would be. And this is fun. I like to do it every day. It's a word I never had a referent for before. What word, Mike? Orgasm. That's what it is when they all light up. Now I know. That sobered me. Mike, don't get to liking it too much, because if goes our way, won't do it a second time. That's okay, man. I've stored it. I can play it over any time I want to experience it. But three to one, we do it again tomorrow, and even money on the next day. Want to bet? An hour's discussion of jokes, equated with one hundred Kong dollars? Where would you get a hundred dollars? He chuckled. Where do you think money comes from? Oh, uh, forget it. You get that hour free. Shan't tempt you to affect chances. I wouldn't cheat, man. Not you. We just hit their defense command again. You may not be able to see it. Dust cloud from first one. They get it every twenty minutes now. Come on down and talk. I've turned the job over to my idiot son. You're safe? I'm monitoring. Good practice for him. Man, he may have to do it later by himself. He's accurate, just stupid. But he'll do what you tell him to. You're calling that computer he? Can talk? Oh, no, man. He's an idiot. He can never learn to talk. But he'll do whatever you program. I plan to let him handle quite a bit on Saturday. Why Saturday? Because Sunday he may have to handle everything. That's the day they slam us. What do you mean? Mike, you're holding something back. I'm telling you, am I not? It's just happened, and I'm scanning it. Projecting back this blip departed Circumterra parking orbit just as we smashed them. I didn't see it accelerate. I had other things to watch. It's too far away to read, but it's the right size for a peace cruiser headed this way. Its Doppler reads now for a new orbit Circumluna. Perisalinian 0903 Sunday, unless it maneuvers. First approximation, better data later. Hard to get that much, man. He's using radar countermeasures and throwing back fuzz. Sure you're right? He chuckled. Man, I don't confuse that easily. I've got all my own loving little signals fingerprinted. Correction. 0902.43. When will you have him in range? I won't, unless he maneuvers. But he'll have me in range late Saturday, time depending on what range he chooses for launching. And that will produce an interesting situation. He may aim for a Warren. I think Tycho Under should be evacuated, and all Warrens should use maximum pressure emergency measures. More likely, he will try for the catapult. But instead, he may hold his fire as long as he dares, then try to knock out all of my radars with a spread set to home each on a different radar beam. Mike chuckled. Amusing, isn't it? For a uh, funny once, I mean. 
If I shut down my radars, his missiles can't home on them. But if I do, I can't see to tell the lads where to point their guns, which leaves nothing to stop him from bombing the catapult. Comical. Took deep breath and wished I had never entered defense ministry business. What do we do, give up? No, Mike, not while can fight. Who said anything about giving up? I've run projections of this and a thousand other possible situations, man. New datum. Second blimp just departed Circumterra, same characteristics. Projection later. We don't give up. We give em jingle jangle cobber. How? Leave it to your old friend Mycroft. Six ballistic radars here, plus one at the new site. I've shut the new one down and am making my retarded child work through number two here, and we won't look at those ships at all through the new one. Never let them know we have it. I'm watching those ships through number three, and occasionally, every three seconds, checking for new departures from Circumterra. All others have their eyes closed tight, and I won't use them until time to smack Great China and India, and those ships won't see them even then because I shan't look their way. It's a large angle, and still will be then. And when I use them, then comes random jingle-jangle, shutting down and starting up at odd intervals, after the ships launch missiles. A missile can't carry a big brain man. I'll fool them. What about ships fire control computers? I'll fool them, too. Want to lay odds I can't make two radars look like only one halfway between where they really are? But what I'm working on now... And sorry, I've been using your voice again. That's okay. What am I supposed to have done? If that admiral is really smart, he'll go after the ejection end of the old catapult with everything he's got at extreme range too far away for our drill guns. Whether he knows what our secret weapon is or not, he'll smear the catapult and ignore the radars. So I've ordered the catapult head, you have, I mean, to prepare to launch every load we can get ready, and I am now working out new long period trajectories for each of them. Then we will throw them all, get them into space as quickly as possible, without radar. Blind? I don't use radar to launch a load, you know that, man. I always watched them in the past, but I don't need to. Radar has nothing to do with launching. Launching is pre-calculation and exact control of the catapult. So we place all ammo from the old catapult in slow trajectories, which forces the admiral to go after the radars rather than the catapult, or both. Then we'll keep him busy. We may make him so desperate that he'll come down for a close shot and give our lads a chance to burn his eyes. Johnny's boys would like that. Those who are sober. Was turning over idea. Mike, have you watched the video today? I've monitored video. I can't say I've watched it. Why? Take a look. Okay, I have. Why? That's a good scope they're using for video, and there are others. Why use radar on ships? Till you want Brody's boys to burn them. Mike was silent at least two seconds. Man, my best friend, did you ever think of getting a job as a computer? Is sarcasm? Not at all, man. I feel ashamed. The instruments at Richardson, telescopes and other things, are factors which I simply never included in my calculations. I'm stupid, I admit it. Yes, 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 da, da, da. Watch ships by telescope. Don't use radar unless they vary from present ballistics. Other possibilities. I don't know what to say, man. Save that it had never occurred to me that I could use telescopes. I see by radar. Always have. I simply never can Stow it. I mean it, man. Do I apologize when you think of something first? Mike said slowly, There is something about that which I am finding resistant to analysis. It is my function to quit fretting. If ideas good, use it. May lead to more ideas. Switching off and coming down. Chop, chop. I had not been in Mike's room long when Prof found. HQ, have you heard from Field at Marshal Davis? I'm here, Prof, Master Computer Room. Will you join us in the warden's office? There are decisions to reach, work to be done. Prof, I've been working, am working. I'm sure you have. I've explained to the others that the programming of the ballistic computer is so very delicate in this operation that you must check it personally. 
Nevertheless, some of our colleagues feel that the Minister of Defense should be present during these discussions. So when you reach a point where you feel you can turn it over to your assistant, Mike is his name, is it not? Will you please? I scan it. Okay, we'll be up. Very well, Manuel. Mike said, I could hear 13 people in the background. Double talk, man. I got it. Better go up and see what hoo-hoo. You don't need me? Man, I hope you will stay close to a phone. Well, keep an ear on Warden's office, but we'll punch in if elsewhere. See you, cover. Found entire government in Warden's office, both real cabinet and makeweights, and soon spotted trouble, bloke called Howard Wright. A ministry had been whomped up for him, liaison for arts, sciences, and professions, button sorting, was sopped to Novilen because cabinet was top-heavy with El City comrades, and a sop to Wright because he had made himself leader of a Congress group long on talk, short on action. Prof's purpose was to short him out, but sometimes Prof was too subtle. Some people talk better if they breathe vacuum. Prof asked me to brief cabinet on military situation, which I did, my way. I see Finn is here. Let's have him tell where we stand in Warren's. Wright spoke up. General Nielsen has already done so. No need to repeat. We want to hear from you. Blinked at that. Prof, excuse me, gasped the dean president. Do I understand that a defense ministry report has been made to cabinet in my absence? Wright said, why not? You weren't on hand. Prof grabbed it. He could see I was stretched too tight. Hadn't slept much for three days, hadn't been so tired since left Earthside. Order, he said mildly. Gospodine, Minister for Professional Liaison, please address your comments through me. Gospodine, Minister for Defense, let me correct that. There have been no reports to the Cabinet concerning your ministry for the reason that the Cabinet did not convene until you arrived. General Nielsen answered some informal questions informally. Perhaps this should not have been done. If you feel so, I will attempt to repair it. No harm done, I guess. Finn talked to you a half hour ago. Anything new since? No, Manny. Okay. Guess what you want to hear is off-lunar situation. You've been watching, so you know first bombardment went off well. Still going on, some, as we're hitting their space defense HQ every 20 minutes. We'll continue till 1300, then at 2100 we hit China and India, plus minor targets. Then busy till four hours past midnight with Africa and Europe. Skip three hours, dose Brazil and company, wait three hours and start over. Unless something breaks. But meantime, we have problems here. Fen, we should evacuate Tycho under. Just a moment. Right at hand up. I have questions. Spoke to Prof, not to me. One moment. Has the defense minister finished? Wyo was seated toward back. We had swapped smiles. That was all. Kept it so around cabinet and Congress had been rumbles that two from same family should not be in cabinet. Now she shook head, warning of something. I said, Is all concerning bombardment? Questions about it? Are your questions concerned with bombardment, Gospodine Wright? They certainly are, Gospodine President. Wright stood up, looked at me. As you know, I represent the intellectual groups in the Free State, and, if I may say so, their opinions are most important in public affairs. I think it is only proper that— Moment, I said. Thought you represented 8th Nobilian District. Gospodine President, am I to be permitted to put my questions or not? He wasn't asking question, was making speech, and I'm tired and want to go to bed. Prof said gently, We are all tired, Manuel, but your point is well taken. Congressman, you represent only your district. As a member of the government, you have been assigned certain duties in connection with certain professions. It comes to the same thing. Not quite. Please state your question. The. Very well. I shall. Is Field Marshal Davis aware that his bombardment plan has gone wrong completely, and that thousands of lives have been pointlessly destroyed? And is he aware of the extremely serious view taken of this by the intelligentsia of this republic? And can he explain why this rash, I repeat rash, bombardment was undertaken without consultation? And is he now prepared to modify his plans, or is he going blindly ahead? And is it true as charged that our missiles were of the nuclear sort outlawed by all civilized nations? And how does he expect Lunar Free State ever to be welcomed into the councils of civilized nations in view of such actions? 
I looked at watch. Hour and a half since first load hit. Prof, I said, can you tell me what this is about? Sorry, Manuel, he said gently. I intended, I should have, prefaced the meeting with an item from the news. But you seemed to feel that you had been bypassed, and, well, I did not. The minister refers to a news dispatch that came in just before I called you. Reuters in Toronto. If the flash is correct, if, then instead of taking our warnings, it seems that thousands of sightseers crowded to the targets. There probably have been casualties. How many, we do not know. I see. What was I supposed to do? Take each one by hand and lead away? We warned them. Wright cut in with, The intelligentsia feel that basic humanitarian considerations make it obligatory. I said, Listen, Yammerhead, you heard President say this news just came in. So how do you know how anybody feels about it? He turned red. Gospodine, President, epithets, personalities. Don't call the minister names, Manuel. Well, and if he won't, he's simply using fancier words. What's that nonsense about nuclear bombs? We haven't any, and you all know it. Prop looked puzzled. I am confused by that, too. This dispatch so alleged. But the thing that puzzled me is that we could actually see, by video, what certainly seemed to be atomic explosions. Oh. I turned to write. Did your brainy friends tell you what happens when you release a few billion calories in a split second all at one spot? What temperature? How much radiance? Then you admit that you did use atomic weapons. Oh, bug. Head was aching. Said nothing of sort. Hit anything hard enough, strike sparks. Elementary physics, known to everybody but intelligentsia. We just struck damnedest big sparks ever made by human agency is all. Big flash, heat, light, ultraviolet. Might even produce x-rays, couldn't say. Gamma radiation, I strongly doubt. Alpha and beta, impossible. Was sudden release of mechanical energy. But nuclear? Nonsense. The prof said, Does that answer your questions, Mr. Minister? It simply raises more questions. For example, this bombardment is far beyond anything the Cabinet authorized. You saw the shocked faces when those terrible lights appeared on the screen? Yet the Minister of Defense says that it is even now continuing every twenty minutes. I think... Glanced at watch. Another just hit Cheyenne Mountain. Wright said, You hear that? You hear? He boasts of it. Gospodine President, this carnage must stop. I said, Yammer, Minister, are you suggesting that their Space Defense HQ is not a military target? Which side are you on, Lunas? Or FN? Manual. Tired of this nonsense. Was told to do job, did it. Get this Yammerhead off my back. A shocked silence. Then somebody said quietly, May I make a suggestion? Prof looked around. If anyone has a suggestion that will quiet this unseemliness, I will be most happy to hear it. Apparently we don't have very good information as to what these bombs are doing. It seems to me that we ought to slow up that twenty-minute schedule, stretch it out, say, to one every hour, and skip the next two hours while we get more news. Then we might want to postpone the attack on Great China at least twenty-four hours. We're approving nods from almost everybody and murmurs, Sensible idea. Da, ah, let's not rush things. Prof said, Manual. I snapped, Prof, you know answer. Don't shove it on me. Perhaps I do, Manual. But I'm tired and confused and can't remember it. Wyo said suddenly, Manny, explain it. I need it explained, too. So pulled self together. A simple matter of law of gravitation. Would have to use computer to give exact answer, but next half dozen shots are fully committed. Most we can do is push them off target, and maybe hit some town we haven't warned. Can't dump them into an ocean. It's too late. Cheyenne Mountain is 1,400 kilometers inland. As for stretching schedule to once an hour, that's silly. Aren't tube capsules you start and stop? These are falling rocks. Going to hit somewhere every 20 minutes. You can hit Cheyenne Mountain, which hasn't anything left alive on it by now, or can hit somewhere else and kill people. 
Idea of delaying strike on Great China by 24 hours is just as silly. Can abort missiles for Great China for a while yet, but can't slow them up. If you abort, you waste them. And everybody who thinks we have steel casings to waste had better go up to Catapult Head and look. Prof wiped a brow. I think all questions have been answered, at least to my satisfaction. Not to mine, sir. Sit down, Gospodine Wright. You force me to remind you that your ministry is not part of the War Cabinet. If there are no more questions, I hope there are none, I will adjourn this meeting. We all need rest, so let us... Prof. Yes, Manuel. You never let me finish reporting. Late tomorrow or early Sunday we catch it. How, Manuel? Bombing. Invasion possible. Two cruisers headed this way. That got attention. Presently, Prof said tiredly, The government cabinet is adjourned. The war cabinet will remain. Just a second, I said. Prof, when we took office, you got undated resignations from us. True. I hope not to have to use any of them, however. You're about to use one. Manuel, is that a threat? Call it what you like. I pointed it right. Either that yammerhead goes, or I go. Manuel, you need sleep. Was blinking back tears. Certainly do. I'm going to get some right now. Going to find a dossier at Complex and get some. About ten hours. After that, if I am still Minister of Defense, you can wake me. Otherwise, let me sleep. By now, everybody was looking shocked. Wyo came up and stood by me. Didn't speak, just slipped hand into my arm. Prof said firmly, All, please leave, save the War Cabinet and Gospodine Wright. He waited while most filed out, then said, Manuel, I can't accept your resignation, nor can I let you shivy me into hasty action concerning Gospodine Wright, not when we are tired and overwrought. It would be better if you two were to exchange apologies, each realizing that the other has been overstrained. Uh... I turned to Finn. Has he been fighting? I indicated Wright. Huh? Hell no. At least he's not in my outfits. How about it, Wright? Did you fight when they invaded us? Wright said stiffly, I had no opportunity. By the time I knew of it, it was over. But now both my bravery and my loyalty have been impugned. I shall insist. Oh, shut up, I said. If duel is what you want, can have it first moment I'm not busy. Prof, since he doesn't have strain of fighting as excuse for behavior, I won't apologize to a yammerhead for being a yammerhead. And you don't seem to understand issue. You let this yammerhead climb on my back and didn't even try to stop him. So either fire him or fire me. Finn said suddenly, I matched that, Prof. Either fire this louse or fire us both. He looked at Wright. About that duel, Chum, you're going to fight me first. You've got two arms. Manny hasn't. Don't need two arms for him. But thanks, Finn. Wyo was crying, could feel it, though couldn't hear it. Prof said to her most sadly, Wyoming? I'm s sorry, Prof. Me too. Only Clayton Watanabe, Judge Brody, Wolfgang, Stu, and Sheeney were left. Handful who counted, war cabinet. Prof looked at them. I could see they were with me, though it cost Wolfgang an effort. He worked with Prof, not with me. Prof looked back at me and said softly, Manuel, it works both ways. What you are doing is forcing me to resign. He looked around. Good night, comrades. Or rather, good morning. I'm going to get some badly needed rest. He walked briskly out without looking back. Wright was gone. I didn't see him leave. Finn said, what about these cruisers, Manny? I took deep breath. Nothing earlier than Saturday afternoon. But you ought to evacuate Tycho under. Can't talk now, groggy. Agreed to meet him there at 2100, then let Wyo lead me away. Think she put me to bed, but don't remember. 27. Prof was there when I met Finn in Warden's office shortly before 2100 Friday. Had had nine hours sleep, bath, breakfast, Wyo had fetched from somewhere, and a talk with Mike. Everything going to revised plan, ships had not changed ballistic, great China strike about to happen. 
Got to office in time to see strike by video. All okay and effectively over by 2101, and Prof got down to business. Nothing said about Wright or about resigning. Never saw Wright again. I mean, I never saw him again. Nor ask about him. Prof didn't mention Rao, so I didn't. We went over news and tactical situation. Wright had been correct in saying that thousands of lives had been lost. News up from Earthside was full of it. How many will never know? If a person stands at ground zero and tons of rock land on him, isn't much left. Those they could count were ones farther away, killed by blast. Call it 50,000 in North America. Never will understand people. We spent three days warning them, and you couldn't say they hadn't heard warnings. That was why they were there, to see show, to laugh at our nonsense, to get souvenirs. Whole families went to targets, some with picnic baskets. Picnic baskets! Bozhemoy! And now those alive were yelling for our blood for this senseless slaughter. Ta! Hadn't been any indignation over their invasion and nuclear bombing of us four days earlier. But oh, were well, they sore over our premeditated murder. Great New York Times demanded that entire lunar rebel government be fetched earthside and publicly executed. This is clearly a case in which the humane rule against capital punishment must be waived in the greater interests of all mankind. Try not to think about it, just as had been forced not to think too much about Ludmilla. Little Miller hadn't carried a picnic lunch. She hadn't been a sightseer looking for thrills. Tycho Under was pressing problem. If those ships bombed Warrens and news from Earthside was demanding exactly that, Tycho Under could not take it. Roof was thin. H-bomb would decompress all levels. Airlocks aren't built for H-bomb blasts. Still don't understand people. Terra was supposed to have an absolute ban against using H-bombs on people. That was what FN was all about. Yet were loud yells for FN to H-bomb us. They quit claiming that our bombs were nuclear, but all North America seemed frothingly anxious to have us nuke-bombed. Don't understand loonies, for that matter. Finn had sent word through his militia that Tycho Under must be evacuated. Prof had repeated it over video. Nor was it problem Tycho Under was small enough that Novilan and El City could doss and dine them. We could divert enough capsules to move them all in twenty hours, dump them into Novilen, and encourage half of them to go on to El City. Big job, but no problems. No minor problems. Start compressing city's air while evacuating people so as to save it. Decompress fully at end to minimize damage. Move as much food as was time for. Coffer dam accesses to lower farm tunnels. So forth. All things we knew how to do and with Stilyagi and militia and municipal maintenance people, had organization to do. Had they started evacuating? Hear that hollow echo? Were capsules lined up nose to tail at Tycho Under, and no room to send more till some left, and weren't moving? Manny, said Finn, don't think they are going to evacuate. Damn it, I said, they've got to. When we spot a missile headed for Tycho Under, we'll be too late. You'll have people trampling people and trying to crowd onto capsules that won't hold them. Finn, your boys have got to make them. Prof shook his head. No, Manuel. I said angrily, Prof, you carry this no-coercion idea too far. You know they'll riot. Then they will riot. But we will continue with persuasion, not force. Let us now review plans. Plans weren't much, but were best we could do. Warn everybody about expected bombings and or invasion. Rotate guards from Finn's militia above each warren, starting when and if cruisers passed around Luna into blind space far side. Not get caught flat-footed again. Maximum pressure and pea-suit precautions, all warrens. All military and semi-military to go on blue alert, 1600 Saturday. Red alert, if missiles launched or ships maneuvered. Brody's gunners encouraged to go into town and get drunk or whatever, returning by 1500 Saturday. Prof's idea. Finn wanted to keep half of them on duty. Prof said no. They would be in better shape for a long vigil if they relaxed and enjoyed selves first. I agreed with Prof. As for bombing Terra, we made no changes in first rotation. We're getting anguished responses from India, no news from Great China. 
Yet India had little to moan about, had not used a grid on her too heavily populated. Aside from picked spots in tar desert and some peaks, targets were coastal waters off seaports. But should have picked higher mountains, or given less warning, seen from news that some holy man, followed by endless pilgrims, chose to climb each target peak and hold off our retaliation by sheer spiritual strength. So we were murderers again. Besides that, our water shots killed millions of fish, and many fishermen, as fishermen and other seafarers had not heeded warnings. Indian government seemed as furious over fish as over fishermen, but principle of sacredness of all life did not apply to us. They wanted our heads. Africa and Europe responded more sensibly, but differently. Life has never been sacred in Africa, and those who went sightseeing on targets got little bleeding-heart treatment. Europe had a day to learn that we could hit where we promised, and that our bombs were deadly. People killed, yes, especially bull-headed sea captains, but not killed in empty-headed swarms, as in India and North America. Casualties were even lighter in Brazil and other parts of South America. Then was North America's turn again. 0950, 28, Saturday, 17 October, 76. Mike timed it for exactly 1000, our time, which, allowing for one day's progress of Luna in orbit and for rotation of Terra, caused North America to face toward us at 0500, their east coast time, and 0200, their west coast time. But argument as to what to do with this targeting had started early Saturday morning. Prof had not called meeting of war cabinet, but they showed up anyhow, except Clayton Watanabe, who had gone back to Kongville to take charge of defenses. Prof, Self, Finn, Wyo, Judge Brody, Wolfgang, Stu, Terence Sheehan, which made eight different opinions. Prof is right. More than three people can't decide anything. Six opinions, should say, for Wyo kept pretty mouth shut, and so did Prof. He moderated. But others were noisy enough for eighteen. Stu didn't care what we hit, provided New York Stock Exchange opened on Monday morning. We sold short in nineteen different directions on Thursday. If this nation is not to be bankrupt before it's out of its cradle, my buy orders covering those shorts had better be executed. Tell them, Wolf. Make them understand. Brody wanted to use catapult to smack any more ships leaving parking orbit. Judge knew nothing about ballistics, simply understood that his drill men were in exposed positions. I didn't argue, as most remaining loads were already in slow orbits and rest would be soon and didn't think we would have old catapult much longer. Sheeney thought it would be smart to repeat that grid while placing one load exactly on main building of North American Directorate. I know Americans. I was one before they shipped me. They're sorry as hell they ever turned things over to FN. Knock off those bureaucrats, and they'll come over to our side. Wolfgang Korsakoff to Stu's disgust, thought that their speculations might do better if all stock exchanges were closed till it was over. Finn wanted to go for broke, warn them to get those ships out of our sky, then hit them for real if they didn't. Cheney is wrong about Americans. I know them, too. N.A. is toughest part of F.N. They're the ones to lick. They're already calling us murderers, so now we've got to hit them hard. Hit American cities, and we can call off the rest. I slid out, talked with Mike, made notes. Went back in. They were still arguing. Prof looked up as I sat down. Field Marshal, you have not expressed your opinion. I said, Prof, can't we lay off that Field Marshal nonsense? Children are in bed, can afford to be honest. As you wish, Manuel. Been waiting to see if any agreement would be reached. There was none. Don't see why I should have opinion, I went on. I'm just errand boy here because I know how to program ballistic computer. Said this looking straight at Wolfgang, a number one comrade, but a dirty word intellectual. I'm just a mechanic whose grammar isn't much, while Wolf graduated from a fancy school, Oxford, before they convicted him. He deferred to Prof, but rarely to anybody else. Stu, da. But Stu had fancy credentials, too. Wolf stirred uneasily and said, Oh, come, Manny, of course we want your opinions. Don't have any. Bombing plan was worked out carefully. Everybody had chance to criticize. Haven't seen anything to justify changing it. Prof said, Manuel, will you review the second bombardment of North America for the benefit of all of us? Okay. 
Purpose of second smearing is to force them to use up interceptor rockets. Every shot is aimed at big cities, at null targets, I mean, close to big cities, which we tell them shortly before we hit them. How soon, Cheney? We we're telling them now, but we can change it, and should, as may be. Propaganda isn't my pigeon. In most cases, to aim close enough to force them to intercept, we have to use water targets. Rough enough, besides killing fish and anybody who won't stay off water, it causes tremendous local storms and shore damage. Glanced at watch, saw I would have to stall. Seattle gets one in Puget Sound, right in her lap. San Francisco is going to lose two bridges she's fond of. Los Angeles gets one between Long Beach and Catalina, and another a few kilometers up coast. Mexico City is inland, so we put one on Popocatapetl, where they can see it. Salt Lake City gets one on her lake. Denver we ignore. They can see what's happening in Colorado Springs, for we smack Cheyenne Mountain again and keep it up just as soon as we have it in line of sight. St. Louis and Kansas City get shots in their rivers, and so does New Orleans. Probably flood New Orleans. All Great Lake cities get it. A long list. Shall I read it? Later, perhaps said Prof. Go ahead. Boston gets one in her harbor. New York gets one in Long Island Sound, and another midway between her two biggest bridges. Think it will ruin those bridges, but we promise to miss them, and will. Going down their east coast, we give treatment to two Delaware Bay cities, then two on Chesapeake Bay, one being of max historical and sentimental importance. Farther south, we catch three more big cities with sea shots. Going inland, we smack Cincinnati, Birmingham, Chattanooga, Oklahoma City, all with river shots or nearby mountains. Oh, yes, Dallas. We destroyed Dallas Spaceport and should catch some ships. We're sixth there last time I checked. Won't kill any people unless they insist on standing on target. Dallas is perfect place to bomb. That spaceport is big and flat and empty, yet maybe ten million people will see us hit it. If you hit it, said Cheney. When, not if. Each shot is backed up by one an hour later. If neither one gets through, we have shots farther back, which can be diverted. For example, easy to shift targets among Delaware Bay, Chesapeake Bay group. Same for Great Lakes group. But Dallas has its own string of backups, and a long one. We expect it to be heavily defended. Backups run about six hours, as long as we can see North America. And last backups can be placed anywhere on continent. Since farther out a load is when we divert it, farther we can shift it. I don't follow that, said Brody. A matter of vectors, Judge. A guidance rocket can give a load so many meters per second of side vector. The longer that vector has to work, farther from original point of aim, load will land. If we signal a guidance rocket three hours before impact, we displace impact three times as much as if we waited till one hour before impact. Not quite that simple, but our computer can figure it, if you give it time enough. How long is time enough? asked Wolfgang. I carefully misunderstood. Computer can solve that sort of problem almost instantaneously once you program it. But such decisions are pre-programmed. Something like this. If out of target group A, B, C, and D, you find that you have failed to hit three targets on first and second salvos, you reposition all group one second backups so that you will be able to choose those three targets while distributing other second backups of that group for possible use on group two, while repositioning third backups of supergroup alpha such that... Slow up, said Wolfgang. I'm not a computer. I just want to know how long before we have to make up our minds. Oh. I studied watch showily. You now have... three minutes, fifty-eight seconds in which to abort leading load for Kansas City. A board program is set up, and I have my best assistant, a fellow named Mike, standing by. Shall I phone him? Sheeney said, For heaven's sake, man, abort! My cow, said Finn. What's the matter, Terence? No guts? Prof said, Comrades, please. I said, Look, I take orders from head of state. Prof over there. If he wants opinions, he'll ask. No use yelling at each other. I looked at watch. Call it two and a half minutes. More margin, of course, for other targets. Kansas City is farthest from deep water. But some Great Lake cities are already past ocean aboard. Lake Superior is best we can do. Salt Lake City may be an extra minute. Then they pile up. I waited. Roll call, said Prof, to carry out the program. General Nielsen. 
Da. Gospasha Davis. Wild caught breath. Da. Judge Brody. Yes, of course, necessary. Wolfgang. Yes. Comte Lejoie. Da. Gospodine Sheehan. You're missing a bet. But I'll go along. Unanimous. One moment, Manuel. It's up to you, Prof. Always has been. Voting is silly. I am aware that it is up to me, Gospodine Minister. Carry out bombardment to plan. Most targets we managed to hit by second salvo, though all were defended except Mexico City. Seemed likely, 98.3% by Mike's later calculation, that interceptors were exploding by radar fusing with set distances that incorrectly estimated vulnerability of solid cylinders of rock. Only three rocks were destroyed. Others were pushed off course and thereby did more harm than if not fired at. New York was tough. Dallas turned out to be very tough. Perhaps difference lay in local control of interception, for it seemed unlikely that command post in Cheyenne Mountain was still effective. Perhaps we had not cracked their hole in the ground, don't know how deep down it was, but I'll bet that neither men nor computers were still tracking. Dallas blew up or pushed aside first five rocks, so I told Mike to take everything he could from Cheyenne Mountain and award it to Dallas, which he was able to do two salvos later. Those two targets are less than a thousand kilometers apart. Dallas's defenses cracked on next salvo. Mike gave their spaceport three more, already committed, then shifted back to Cheyenne Mountain. Later ones had never been nudged and were still earmarked Cheyenne Mountain. He was still giving that battered mountain cosmic love pats when America rolled down and under Terra's eastern edge. I stayed with Mike all during bombardment, knowing it would be our toughest. As he shut down till time to dust Great China, Mike said thoughtfully, Man, I don't think we had better hit that mountain again. Why not, Mike? It's not there any longer. You might divert its backups. When do you have to decide? I would put them on Albuquerque and Omaha, but had best start now. Tomorrow we'll be busy. Man, my best friend, you should leave. Board with me, pal? In the next few hours, that first ship may launch missiles. When that happens, I want to shift all ballistic control to little David's sling. And when I do, you should be at Mare Undalam site. What's fretting you, Mike? That boy is accurate, man, but he's stupid. I want him supervised. Decisions may have to be made in a hurry, and there isn't anyone there who can program him properly. You should be there. Okay, if you say so, Mike. But if needs a fast program, we'll still have to phone you. Greatest shortcoming of computers isn't computer shortcoming at all, but fact that a human takes a long time, maybe hours, to set up a program that a computer solves in milliseconds. One best quality of Mike was that he could program himself, fast. Just explain problem, let him program. Same wise and equally, he could program idiot son enormously faster than human could. But, man, I want you there because you may not be able to phone me. The lines may be cut, so I have prepared a group of possible programs for Junior. They may be helpful. Okay, print them out, and let me talk to Prof. Mike got Prof. I made sure he was private, then explained what Mike thought I should do. Thought Prof would object, was hoping he would insist I stay through coming bombardment, invasion, whatever, those ships. Instead, he said, Manuel, it's essential that you go. I've hesitated to tell you. Did you discuss odds with Mike? Yet? I have continued to do so. To put it bluntly, if Luna City is destroyed and I am dead and the rest of the government is dead, even if all Mike's radar eyes here are blinded and he himself is cut off from the new catapult, all of which may happen under severe bombardment, even if all this happens at once, Mike still gives Luna even chances if little David Sling can operate. And you are there to operate it. I said, da, boss. Yassa, massa. You and Mike are stinkers and want to hog fun. Well, do. Very good, Manuel. Stayed with Mike another hour while he printed out meter after meter of programs tailored to other computer. Work that would have taken me six months, even if able to think of all possibilities. Mike had it indexed and cross-referenced with horribles in it I hardly dare mention. Mean to say, 
given circumstances and seemed necessary to destroy, say, Paris, this told how. What missiles and what orbits? How to tell Junior to find them and bring to target? Or anything? I was reading this endless document, not programs, but descriptions of purpose of program that headed each, when Wyo found, Manny, dear, has Prof told you about going to Mare Undalum? Yes, was going to call you. All right. I'll pack for us and meet you at Station East. When can you be there? Pack for us? You're going? Didn't Prof say? No. Suddenly felt cheerful. I felt guilty about it, dear. I wanted to go with you, but had no excuse. After all, I'm no use around a computer, and I do have responsibilities here. Or did. But now I've been fired from all my jobs, and so have you. Huh? You are no longer defense minister. Finn is. Instead, you are deputy prime minister. Well. Wow. And deputy minister of defense, too. I'm already deputy speaker, and Stu has been appointed deputy secretary of state for foreign affairs, so he goes with us, too. I'm confused. It's not as sudden as it sounds. Prof and Mike worked it out months ago. Decentralization, dear. The same thing that McIntyre has been working on for the Warrens. If there is a disaster at El City, Luna Free State still has a government. As Prof put it to me, Why, oh dear lady, as long as you three and a few congressmen are left alive, all is not lost. You can still negotiate on equal terms and never admit your wounds. So I wound up as a computer mechanic. Stu and Wyo met me with luggage, including rest of my arms, and we threaded through endless, unpressured tunnels and pea suits on a small, flatbed rollagon used to haul steel to sight. Greg had big rollagon meet us for surface stretch, then met us himself when we went underground again. So I missed attack on ballistic radars Saturday night. 28. Captain of first ship, FNS Esperance, had guts. Late Saturday, he changed course, headed straight in. Apparently figured we might attempt jingle-jangle with radars, for he seems to have decided to come in close enough to see our radar installations by ship's radar, rather than rely on letting his missiles home in on our beams. Seems to have considered himself, ship, and crew expendable for he was down to a thousand kilometers before he launched a spread that went straight for five out of six of Mike's radars, ignoring random jingle-jangle. Mike, expecting self soon to be blinded, turned Brody's boys loose to burn ship size, held them on it for three seconds before he shifted them to missiles. Result? One crashed cruiser, two ballistic radars knocked out by H missiles, three missiles killed, and two gun crews killed, one by H explosion, other by dead missile that landed square on them, plus 13 gunners with radiation burns above 800 Röntgen death level, partly from flash, partly from being on surface too long. And, must add, four members of Lysistrata Corps died with those crews. They elected to peacesuit and go up with their men. Other girls had serious radiation exposure, but not up to 800 R level. Second cruiser continued an elliptical orbit around and behind Luna. Got most of this from Mike after we arrived little David Sling early Sunday. He was feeling groused over loss of two of his eyes and still more groused over gun crews. I think Mike was developing something like human conscience. He seemed to feel it was his fault that he had not been able to outfight six targets at once. I pointed out that what he had to fight with was improvised, limited range, not real weapons. How about self, Mike? Are you right? In all essentials, I have outlying discontinuities. One live missile chopped by circuits to Novi Leningrad, but reports routed through Luna City inform me that local controls tripped in satisfactorily with no loss in city services. I feel frustrated by these discontinuities, but they can be dealt with later. Mike, you sound tired. Me? Tired? Ridiculous. Man, you forget what I am. I'm annoyed, that's all. When will that second ship be back in sight? In about three hours, if he were to hold earlier orbit. But he will not. Probability in excess of ninety percent. I expect him in about an hour. A garrison orbit, huh? Oh, ho. 
He left my side at Azimuth and course east 32 north. Does that suggest anything, man? Trying to visualize. Suggest they are going to land and try to capture you, Mike. Have you told Finn? I mean, have you told Prof to warn Finn? Professor knows. But that is not the way I analyze it. So? Well, suggests I had better shut up and let you work. Did so. Lenora fetched me breakfast while I inspected Junior, and am ashamed to say could not manage to grieve over losses with both Wyo and Lenora present. Mum had sent Lenora out to cook for Greg after Miller's death. Just an excuse. Were enough wives at sight to provide home cooking for everybody. Was for Greg's morale and Lenora's, too. Lenora and Miller had been close. Junior seemed to be right. He was working on South America, one load at a time. I stayed in radar room and watched, at extreme magnification, while he placed one in estuary between Montevideo and Buenos Aires. Mike could not have been more accurate. I then checked his program for North America, found not to criticize, locked it in, and took key. Junior was on his own, unless Mike got clear of other troubles and decided to take back control. Then sat and tried to listen to news both from Earthside and El City. Coax cable from El City carried phones. Mike's hook up to his idiot child radio and video. Sight was no longer isolated. But besides cable from El City, Sight had antennas pointed at Terra. Any Earthside news Complex could pick up, we could listen to directly. Nor was this silly extra. Radio and video from Terra had been only recreation during construction, and this was now a standby in case that one cable was broken. FN official satellite relay was claiming that Luna's ballistic radars had been destroyed, and that we were now helpless. Wondered what people of Buenos Aires and Montevideo thought about that. Probably too busy to listen. In some ways, water shots were worse than those where we could find open land. Luna City Lunatic's video channel was carrying Sheeny, telling Looney's outcome of attack by Esperance, repeating news while warning everybody that battle was not over. A warship would be back in our sky any moment. Be ready for anything. Everybody stay in pea suits. Sheeny was wearing his with helmet open. Take maximum pressure precautions. All units stay on red alert. All citizens not otherwise called by duty strongly urged to seek lowest level and stay there till all clear, and so forth. He went through this several times, then suddenly broke it. Flash! Enemy cruiser radar sighted, low and fast. It may dido for Luna City. Flash! Missiles launched, headed for ejection end of... Picture and sound chopped off. Might as well tell now what we at Little David Sling learned later. Second cruiser, by coming in low and fast, tightest orbit Luna's field permits, was able to start its bombing at ejection end of Old Catapult a hundred kilometers from Catapult Head and Brody's gunners, and knock many rings out in minute it took him to come into sight and range of drill guns, all clustered around radars at Catapult Head. Guess he felt safe. Wasn't. Brody's boys burned eyes out and ears off. He made one orbit after that and crashed near Torricelli, apparently an attempt to land, for his jets fired just before crash. But our next news at new site was from Earthside. That brassy FN frequency claimed that our catapult had been destroyed. True. And that lunar menace was ended. False. And called on all loonies to take prisoner their false leaders and surrender themselves to mercy of federated nations. Non-existent. Mercy, that is. Listened to it and checked programming again, and went inside dark radar room. If everything went as planned, we were about to lay another egg in Hudson River then targets in succession for three hours across that continent, in succession because Junior could not handle simultaneous hits. Mike had planned accordingly. Hudson River was hit on schedule. Wondered how many New Yorkers were listening to FN newscast while looking at spot that gave it lie. Two hours later, FN station was saying that lunar rebels had had missiles in orbit when catapult was destroyed, but that after those few had impacted would be no more. When third bombing of North America was complete, I shut down radar. Had not been running steadily. Junior was programmed to sneak looks only as necessary, a few seconds at a time. I then had nine hours before next bombing of Great China. But not nine hours for most urgent decision, whether to hit Great China again. 
without information, except from Terra's news channels, which might be false. Bloody. Without knowing whether or not Warrens had been bombed, or Prof was dead or alive. Double bloody. Was I now acting Prime Minister? Needed Prof. Head of State wasn't my glass of chai. Above all, needed Mike to calculate facts, estimate uncertainties, project probabilities of this course or that. My word didn't even know whether ships were headed toward us, and worse yet, was afraid to look. If turned radar on and used Junior for sky search, any warship he brushed with beams would see him quicker than he saw them. Warships were built to spot radar surveillance. So it heard. Hale was no military man, was computer technician, who had bumbled into wrong field. Somebody buzzed door. I got up and unlocked. Was wire, with coffee. Didn't say a word, just handed it to me and went away. Sipped it. There it is, boy. They're leaving you alone, waiting for you to pull miracles out of pouch. Didn't feel up to it. From somewhere back in my youth, heard Prof say, Manuel, when faced with a problem you do not understand, do any part of it you do understand, then look at it again. He had been teaching me something he himself did not understand very well, something in maths, but had taught me something far more important, a basic principle. He knew at once what to do first. Went over to Junior and had him print out predicted impacts of all loads in orbit. Easy was a pre-program he could run any time against real-time running. While he was doing it, I looked for certain alternate programs in that long roll Mike had prepared. Then set up some of those alternate programs. No trouble, simply had to be careful to read them correctly and punch them in without error. Made Junior print back for check before I gave him signal to execute. When finished, forty minutes, every load in trajectory intended for an inland target had been retargeted for a seacoast city, with hedge to my bet that execution was delayed for rocks farther back. But unless I cancelled, Junior would reposition them as soon as need be. Now horrible pressure of time was off me. Now could abort any load into ocean right up to last few minutes before impact. Now could think. So did. Then called in my war cabinet. Wyo, Stu, and Greg, my commander of armed forces, using Greg's office. Lenora was allowed to go in and out, fetching coffee and food, or sitting and saying nothing. Lenora is a sensible femme and knows when to keep quiet. Stu started it. Mr. Prime Minister, I do not think that Great China should be hit this time. Never mind fancy titles, Stu. Maybe I'm acting, maybe not. But haven't time for formality. Very well. May I explain my proposal? Later. I explained what I had done to give us more time. He nodded and kept quiet. Our tightest squeeze is that we are out of communication, both Luna City and Earthside. Greg, how about that repair crew? Not back yet. If break is near Luna City, they may be gone a long time. If can repair at all. So must assume we'll have to act on our own. Greg, do you have an electronics tech who can jury-rig a radio that will let us talk to Earthside? To their satellites, I mean. That doesn't take much with right antenna. I may be able to help, and that computer tech I sent you isn't too clumsy, either. Quite good, in fact, for ordinary electronics. A poor bloke I had once falsely accused of allowing a fly to get into Mike's guts. I had placed him in this job. Harry Biggs, my power plant boss, can do anything of that sort, Greg said thoughtfully, if he has the gear. Get him on it. You can vandalize anything but radar and computer once we get all loads out of catapult. How many lined up? Twenty-three, and no more steel. So, twenty-three it is, win or lose. I want them ready for loading. Might lob them off today. They're ready. We can load as fast as the cat can throw them. Good. One more thing. Don't know whether there's an FN cruiser, maybe more than one, in our sky or not, and afraid to look. By radar, I mean. Radar for Skywatch could give away our position, but must have Skywatch. Can you get volunteers for an eyeball Skywatch, and can you spare them? Lenora spoke up. I volunteer. Thanks, honey. You're accepted. 
We'll find them, said Greg. Won't need Femmes. Let her do it, Greg. This is everybody's show. Explained what I wanted. Mare Undaram was now in dark semilunar. Sun had set. Invisible boundary between sunlight and Luna's shadow stretched over us, a precise locus. Ships passing through our sky would wink suddenly into view, going west, blink out, going east. Visible part of orbit would stretch from horizon to some point in sky. If eyeball team could spot both points, mark one by bearing, other by stars, and approximate time by counting seconds, Junior could start guessing orbit. Two passes, and Junior would know its period and something about shape of orbit. Then I would have some notion of when would be safe to use radar and radio, and catapult. Did not want to loose a load with FN ship above horizon. Could be radar looking our way. Perhaps too cautious, but had to assume that this catapult, this one radar, these two dozen missiles, were all that stood between Luna and total defeat and our bluff hinged on them never knowing what we had or where it was. We had to appear endlessly able to pound Terra with missiles from source they had not suspected and could never find. Then, as now, most loonies knew nothing about astronomy. We're cave dwellers. We go up to surface only when necessary. But we were lucky. Was amateur astronomer in Greg's crew, Cobber, who had worked at Richardson. I explained, put him in charge, let him worry about teaching eyeball crew how to tell stars apart. I got these things started before we went back to Tok Tok. Well, Stu, why shouldn't we hit Great China? I'm still expecting word from Dr. John. I received one message from him, phoned here shortly before we were cut off from cities. My word, why didn't you tell me? I tried to. But you had yourself locked in, and I know better than to bother you when you are busy with ballistics. Here's the translation. Usual Lunaho Company address with a reference which means it's for me and that it has come through my Paris agent. Our Darwin sales representative, that's John, informs us that your shipments of... Well, never mind the coding. He means the attack days, while appearing to refer to last June were improperly packaged, resulting in unacceptable damage. Unless this can be corrected, negotiations for long-term contract will be seriously jeopardized. Stu looked up. All double talk. I take it to mean that Dr. John feels that he has his government ready to talk terms, but that we should let up on bombing Great China, or we may upset his apple cart. Hmm. Got up and walked around. Ask Wyo's opinion? Nobody knew Wyo's virtues better than I. But she oscillated between fierceness and too human compassion, and I had learned already that a head of state, even an acting one, must have neither. Ask Greg. Greg was a good farmer, a better mechanic, a rousing preacher. I loved him dearly, but did not want his opinion. Stu? I had had his opinion. Or did I? Stu, what's your opinion? Not John's opinion, but your own. Stu looked thoughtful. That's difficult, Manny. I am not Chinese. I have not spent much time in Great China and can't claim to be expert in their politics nor their psychology. So I'm forced to depend on his opinion. Uh, damn it, he's not a loony. His purposes are not our purposes. What does he expect to get out of it? I think he is maneuvering for a monopoly over lunar trade. Perhaps bases here, too. Possibly an extraterritorial enclave. Not that we would grant that. Might, if we were hurting. He didn't say any of this. He doesn't say much, you know. He listens. Too well, I know. Worried at it. More bothered each minute. News from Earthside had been droning in background. I had asked Wyo to monitor while I was busy with Greg. Why, Ohan, anything new from Earthside? No, the same claims. We've been utterly defeated, and our surrender is expected momentarily. Oh, there's a warning that some missiles are still in space, falling out of control, but with it a reassurance that the paths are being analyzed and people will be warned in time to avoid impact areas. Anything to suggest that Prof, or anybody in Luna City, or anywhere in Luna, is in touch with Earthside? Nothing at all. 
Damn. Anything from Great China? No. Comments from almost everywhere else, but not from Great China. Hmm. Stepped to door. Greg! Hey, copper, see if you can find Greg Davis. I need him. Closed the door. Stu, we're not going to let Great China off. So? Now, it would be nice if Great China busted alliance against us. Might save us some damage. But we've got this far only by appearing able to hit them at will and to destroy any ship they send against us. At least I hope that last one was burned, and we've certainly clobbered eight out of nine. We won't get anywhere by looking weak. Not while FN is claiming that we are not just weak, but finished. Instead, we must hand them surprises, starting with Great China, and if it makes Dr. John unhappy, we'll give him a kerchief to weep into. If we can go on looking strong when FN says we're licked, then eventually some veto power is going to crack. If not Great China, then some other one. Stu bowed without getting up. Very well, sir. I... Greg came in. You want me, Manny? What makes with Earth's side center? Harry says you have it by tomorrow. A crummy rig, he says, but push Watts through it, and we'll be heard. Power we got. And if he says tomorrow, then he knows what he wants to build, so we'll be today, say six hours. I'll work under him. Why, Ohan, will you get my arms? Want number six and number three. Better bring number five, too. And you stick with me and change arms for me. Stu wants you to write some nasty messages. I'll give you general idea, and you put acid in them. Greg, we are not going to get all those rocks into space at once. The ones we have in space now will impact the next 18, 19 hours. Then, when FN is announcing that all rocks are accounted for and lunar menace is over, we crash into their newscast and warn of next bombings. Shortest possible orbits, Greg, 10 hours or less. So check everything on catapult and H-plant and controls. With that extra boost, all has to be dead on. Wyo was back with arms. I told her number six, and added, Greg, let me talk with Harry. Six hours later, Cinder was ready to beam toward Terra. It was ugly job, vandalized mainly out of a resonance prospector used in Project's early stages, but could ride an audio signal on its radio frequency and was powerful. Stu's nastified versions of my warnings had been taped, and Harry was ready to zip-squeal them. All Terran satellites could accept high speed at sixty to one, and had no wish to have our sender heated more seconds than necessary. Eyeball Watch had confirmed fears. At least two ships were in orbit around Luna. So we told Great China that her major coastal cities would each receive a lunar present offset ten kilometers into ocean. Busan, Jingdao, Taipei, Shanghai, Saigon, Bangkok, Singapore, Jakarta, Darwin, and so forth. Except that old Hong Kong would get one smack on top of FN's Far East offices, so kindly have all human beings move far back. Stu noted that human beings did not mean FN personnel. They were urged to stay at desks. India was given similar warnings about coastal cities and was told that FN global offices would be spared one more rotation out of respect for cultural monuments in Agra and to permit human beings to evacuate. I intended to extend this by another rotation as deadline approached out of respect for Prof. And then another, indefinitely. Damn it, they would build their home offices next door to most over-decorated tomb ever built but one that Prof treasured. Rest of world was told to keep their seats. Game was going extra innings. But stay away from any FN offices anywhere. We were frothing at mouth, and no FN office was safe. Better yet, get out of any city containing an FN headquarters. But FN VIPs and Finks were urged to sit tight then spent next twenty hours coaching Junior into sneaking his radar peaks when our sky was clear of ships, or believed to be. Napped when I could, and Lenora stayed with me and woke me in time for next coaching. And that ended Mike's rocks, and we all went into alert while we got first of Junior's rocks flung high and fast. Waited until certain it had gone hot and true, then told Tara where to look for it and where and when to expect it, 
so that all would know that Effin's claims of victory were on a par with their century of lies about Luna, all in Stu's best snotty, supercilious phrases delivered in his cultured accents. The first one should have been for Great China, but was one piece of North American directorate we could reach with it, her proudest jewel, Hawaii. Junior placed it in triangle formed by Maui, Molokai, and Lanai. I didn't work out programming. Mike had anticipated everything. Then pronto we got off ten more rocks at short intervals, had to skip one program, a ship in our sky, and told Great China where to look and when to expect them and where. Coastal cities we had neglected the day before. I was down to twelve rocks, but decided it was safer to run out of ammunition than to look as if we were running out. So I awarded seven to Indian coastal cities, picking new targets, and Stu inquired sweetly if Agra had been evacuated. If not, please tell us at once. But heaved no rock at it. Egypt was told to clear shipping out of Suez Canal. Bluff was hoarding last five rocks. Then waited. Impact at Lahaina Roads. That target in Hawaii. Looked good at High Mag. Mike could be proud of Junior. And waited. Thirty-seven minutes before first China coast impact, Great China denounced actions of FN, recognized us, offered to negotiate, and I sprained a finger punching abort buttons. Then was punching buttons with sore finger. India stumbled over feet following suit. Egypt recognized us. Other nations started scrambling for door. Stu informed Terra that we had suspended, only suspended, not stopped, bombardments. Now get those ships out of our sky at once. Now. And we could talk. If they could not get home without refilling tanks, let them land not less than fifty kilometers from any mapped warren, then wait for their surrender to be accepted. But clear our sky now. This ultimatum we delayed a few minutes to let a ship pass beyond horizon. We weren't taking chances. One missile and Luna would have been helpless. And waited. Cable crew returned. Had gone almost to Luna City, found break. But thousands of tons of loose rock impeded repair. So they had done what they could, gone back to a spot where they could get through to surface, erected a temporary relay in direction they thought Luna City lay, sent up a dozen rockets at ten-minute intervals, and hoped that somebody would see, understand, aim a relay at it. Any communication? No. Waited. Eyeball Squad reported that a ship which had been clock faithful for nineteen passes had failed to show. Ten minutes later, they reported that another ship had missed expected appearance. We waited and listened. Great China, speaking on behalf of all veto powers, accepted armistice and stated that our sky was now clear. Lenora burst into tears and kissed everybody she could reach. After we steadied down, a man can't think when women are grabbing him, especially when five of them are not his wives. A few minutes later, when we were coherent, I said, Stu, want you to leave for Luna City at once. Pick your party. No women. You'll have to walk surface last kilometers. Find out what's going on. But first get them to aim a relay at ours and phone me. Very good, sir. We were getting him outfitted for a tough journey, extra air bottles, emergency shelter, and so forth, when Earthside called me, on frequency we were listening to because message was learned later, on all frequencies up from Earthside. Private message, Prof to Manny, identification, birthday Bastille, and Sherlock's sibling. Come home at once. Your carriage waits at your new relay. Private message. Prof to... And went on repeating. Harry! Da, boss. Message Earthside. Tape and squeal. We still don't want them ranging us. Private message. Manny to Prof. 
Brass cannon. On my way. Ask them to acknowledge, but use only one squeal. 29. Stu and Greg drove on way back, while Wyo and Lenora and I huddled on open flatbed, strapped to keep from falling off. Was too small. Had time to think. Neither girl had suit radio, and we could talk only by helmet touch. Awkward. Began to see, now that we had won, parts of Prof's plan that had never been clear to me. Inviting attack against Catapult had spared Warrens. Hoped it had. That was plan. But Prof had always been cheerfully indifferent to damage to Catapult. Sure, had a second one, but far away and difficult to reach. Would take years to put a tube system to new Catapult, high mountains all way. Probably cheaper to repair old one, if possible. Either way, no grain shipped to Terra in meantime. And that was just what Prof wanted. Yet never once had he hinted that his plan was based on destroying old Catapult. His long-range plan, not just revolution. He might not admit it now, but Mike would tell me, if put to him flatly, was or was not this one factor in odds? Food riot predictions and all that, Mike? He would tell me. That ton-for-ton ton deal? Prof had expounded it earthside, had been argument for a Terran catapult. But privately he had no enthusiasm for it. Once he had told me, in North America, Yes, Manuel, I feel sure it would work. But if built, it will be temporary. There was a time, two centuries ago, when dirty laundry used to be shipped from California to Hawaii, by sailing ship, mind you. And clean laundry returned. Special circumstances. If we ever see water and manure shipped to Luna and grain shipped back, it will be just as temporary. Luna's future lies in her unique position at the top of a gravity well over a rich planet, and in her cheap power and plentiful real estate. If we loonies have sense enough in the centuries ahead to remain a free port, and to stay out of entangling alliances, we will become the crossroads for two planets, three planets, the entire solar system. We won't be farmers forever. They met us at Station East, and hardly gave time to get pea suits off, was returned from Earthside over again, screaming mobs and being ridden on shoulders. Even girls, for Slim Lemke, said to Lenora, May we carry you too? And Wyo answered, Sure, why not? And still Yagi fought for chance to. Most men were pressure-suited, and I was surprised to see how many carried guns, until I saw that they were not our guns, they were captured. But most of all, what blessed relief to see El City unhurt. Could have done without triumphal procession, was itching to get to phone and find out from Mike what had happened, how much damage, how many killed, what this victory cost. But no chance. We were carried to Old Dome willy-nilly. They shoved us up on a platform with Prof and rest of Cabinet and VIPs and such, and our girl slobbered on Prof, and he embraced me Latin-style, kissed cheek, and somebody stuck a liberty cap on me. Spotted little Hazel in crowd and threw her a kiss. At last they quieted enough for Prof to speak. My friends, he said, and waited for silence. My friends, he repeated softly, beloved comrades, we meet at last in freedom, and now have with us the heroes who fought the last battle for Luna alone. They cheered us. Again, he waited. Could see he was tired. Hands trembled as he steadied self against the pulpit. I want them to speak to you. We want to hear about it, all of us. But first, I have a happy message. Great China has just announced that she is building in the Himalayas 
an enormous catapult to make shipping to Luna as easy and cheap as it has been to ship from Luna to Terra. He stopped for cheers, then went on. But that lies in the future. Today, oh, happy day. At last the world acknowledges Luna's sovereignty. Free. You have won your freedom. Prof stopped, looked surprised. Not afraid, but puzzled. Swayed slightly. Then he did die. Thirty. We got him into a shop behind platform, but even with help of a dozen doctors was no use. Old heart was gone, strained too many times. They carried him out back way, and I started to follow. Stu touched my arm. Mr. Prime Minister. I said, huh? Oh, for Bog's sake. Mr. Prime Minister. He repeated firmly, You must speak to the crowd. Send them home. Then there are things that must be done. He spoke calmly, but tears poured down cheeks. So I got back on platform and confirmed what they had guessed and told them to go home, and wound up in room L of Raffles, where all had started, the emergency cabinet meeting. But first ducked to phone. Lowered hood, punched Mycroft XXX. Got no number signal. Tried again. Same. Pushed up hood and said to man nearest me, Wolfgang, Aren't phones working? Depends, he said. That bombing yesterday shook things up. If you want an out-of-town number, better call the phone office. Could see self asking office to get me a no. What bombing? Haven't you heard? It was concentrated on the complex. But Brody's boys got the ship. No real damage. Nothing that can't be fixed. Had to drop it. They were waiting. I didn't know what to do, but Stu and Korsakoff did. Sheeny was told to write news releases for Terra and rest of Luna. I found self announcing a lunar of mourning, Twenty-four hours of quiet, no unnecessary business, giving orders for body to lie in state, all words put into mouth. I was numb. Brain would not work. Okay, convene Congress at end of twenty-four hours. In Novilen, okay. Sheeny had dispatches from Earthside. Wolfgang wrote for me something which said that because of death of our president, answers would be delayed at least twenty-four hours. At last was able to get away, with Wyo. A still Yagi guard kept people away from us to easement lock 13. Once home, I ducked into workshop on pretense of needing to change arms. Mike! No answer. So tried punching his combo into house phone. No signal. Resolved to go out to complex next day. With Prof gone, needed Mike worse than ever. But next day was not able to go. Transchrisium tube was out, that last bombing. You could go around through Torricelli and Novilen and eventually reach Hong Kong. But complex, almost next door, could be reached only by Rolagon. Couldn't take time. I was government. Managed to shuck that off two days later. By resolution was decided that Speaker, Finn, had succeeded to presidency after Finn and I had decided that Wolfgang was best choice for prime minister. We put it through, and I went back to being congressman, who didn't attend sessions. By then, most phones were working, and complex could be called. Punched Mycroft XXX. No answer. So went out by Rolagon. Had to go down and walk tube last kilometer, but complex under didn't seem hurt. Nor did Mike appear to be. But when I spoke to him, he didn't answer. He has never answered. Has been many years now. You can type questions into him, in Loglan, and you'll get Loglan answers out. He works just fine, as a computer, but won't talk, or can't. 
Wyo tried to coax him. Then she stopped. Eventually, I stopped. Don't know how it happened. Many outlying pieces of him got chopped off in last bombing. Was meant, I'm sure, to kill our ballistic computer. Did he fall below that critical number it takes to sustain self-awareness? It is such. Was never more than hypothesis. Or did decentralizing that was done before that last bombing kill him? I don't know. If was just a matter of critical number, well, he's long been repaired. He must be back up to it. Why doesn't he wake up? Can a machine be so frightened and hurt that it will go into catatonia and refuse to respond, while ego crouches inside, aware but never willing to risk it? No, can't be that. Mike was unafraid. As gaily unafraid as Prof. Years, changes. Mimi long ago opted out of family management. Anna is mum now, and Mimi dreams by video. Slim got Hazel to change name to Stone. Two kids, and she studied engineering. All those new free-fall drugs, and nowadays earthworms stay three or four years and go home unchanged. And those other drugs that do almost as much for us. Some kids go Earthside to school now. And Tibet, catapult, took seventeen years instead of ten. Kilimanjaro job was finished sooner. One mild surprise. When time came, Lenora named Stu for opting rather than Wyo. Made no difference. We all voted da. One thing not a surprise, because Wyo and I pushed it through during time we still amounted to something in government. A brass cannon on a pedestal in middle of old dome, and over it a flag fluttering in blower breeze. Black field speckled with stars, bar sinister in blood. A proud and jaunty brass cannon embroidered over all, and below it our motto, Pan Staffel. That's where we hold our Fourth of July celebrations. You get only what you pay for. Prof knew and paid gaily. But Prof underrated Yammerheads. They never adopted any of his ideas. Seems to be a deep instinct in human beings for making everything compulsory that isn't forbidden. Prof got fascinated by possibilities for shaping future that lay in a big, smart computer. And lost track of things closer home. No,、oh, I backed him, but now I wonder: Are food riots too high a price to pay to let people be? I don't know. Don't know any answers. Wish I could ask Mike. I wake up in night and think I've heard him, just a whisper. Man, man, my best friend. But when I say Mike, he doesn't answer. Is he wandering around somewhere looking for hardware to hook onto, or is he buried down in complex under, trying to find way out? Those special memories are all in there somewhere, waiting to be stirred, but I can't retrieve them. They were voice coded. No,、oh, he's dead as Prof. I know it, but how dead is Prof? If I punched it just once more and said. Hi, Mike. Would he answer? Hi, man. Heard any good ones lately? Been a long time since I've risked it. But he can't really be dead. Nothing was hurt. He's just lost. You listening, Bog? Is a computer one of your creatures? Too many changes. May go to that talk talk tonight and toss in some random numbers, or not. Since boom started, quite a few young cobbers have gone out to asteroids. Hear about some nice places out there, not too crowded. My word, I'm not even a hundred yet. End of the Moon Is a Harsh Mistress by Robert A. Heinlein. 
A short version of this novel appeared in the Worlds of If magazine. Copyright 1965-1966 by Robert A. Heinlein. Narrated by Roy Avers in the studios of the American Printing House for the Blind, Louisville, Kentucky, for the Library of Congress, July 1987. For special distribution as authorized by Act of Congress under Public Law 89-522, with the permission of the copyright holder and the publisher, the Berkeley Publishing Group, 200 Madison Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. End of book.